Section 16 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1, by Thomas Stevens. Chapter 7. Part Two, Through Slavonia and Servia. It is but thirty kilometers from India to Semlin, on the river bank opposite Belgrade, and since leaving the Fruscagora Mountains, the country has been a level plain, and the roads fairly smooth. But Igali has naturally become doubly cautious since his succession of misadventures this morning and as while waiting for him to overtake me i reclined beneath the mulberry trees near the village of batanitz and surveyed the blue mountains of servia looming up to the southward through the evening haze he rides up and proposes batanitz as our halting place for the night adding persuasively there will be no ferry boat across to belgrade to-night and we can easily catch the first boat in the morning i reluctantly agree though advocating going on to Semlin this evening. While our supper is being prepared, we are taken in hand by the leading merchant of the village and turned loose in an orchard of small fruits and early pears, and from thence conducted to a large gypsy encampment in the outskirts of the village, where, in acknowledgment of the honor of our visit and a few cruisers by way of supplement, the flower of the camp, a blooming damsel, about the shade of a total eclipse, kisses the backs of our hands, and the men play a strumming monotone with sticks and an inverted wooden trough, while the women dance in a most lively and not ungraceful manner. These gypsy bands are a happy crowd of vagabonds, looking as though they had never a single care in all the world. The men wear long, flowing hair, and to the ordinary costume of the peasant is added many a gewgaw, worn with a careless, jaunty grace that fails not to carry with it a certain charm in spite of unkempt locks and dirty faces. The women wear a minimum of clothes, and a profusion of beads and trinkets, and the children go stark naked or partly dressed. Unmistakable evidence that one is approaching the Orient appears to the semi-Oriental costumes of the peasantry and roving gypsy bands, as we gradually near the Servian capital. An Oriental costume in Ezek is sufficiently exceptional to be a novelty, and so it is until one gets south of Peter Wardine, when the national costumes of Slovenia and Croatia are gradually merged into the tasseled fez, the many-folded waistband, and the loose, flowing pantaloons of eastern lands. Here, at Batanitz, the feet are encased in rude, rawhide moccasins, bound on with leathern thongs and the ankle and calf are bandaged with many folds of heavy red material also similarly bound the scene around our guest house after our arrival resembles a popular meeting for although a few of the villagers have been to belgrade and seen a bicycle it is only within the last six months that belgrade itself has boasted one and the great majority of the Batanitz people have simply heard enough about them to whet their curiosity for a closer acquaintance Moreover, from the interest taken in my tour at Belgrade on account of the bicycle's recent introduction in that capital, these villagers, but a dozen kilometers away, have heard more of my journey than people in villages farther north, and their curiosity is roused in proportion. We are astir by five o'clock next morning, but the same curious crowd is making the stone corridors of the rambling old guest house impassable and filling the space in front gazing curiously at us and commenting on our appearance whenever we happen to become visible while waiting with commendable patience to obtain a glimpse of our wonderful machines they are a motley and withal a ragged assembly old women devoutly cross themselves as after a slight repast of bread and milk we sally forth with our wheels prepared to start and the spontaneous murmur of admiration which breaks forth as we mount becomes louder and more pronounced as i turn in the saddle and doff my helmet in deference to the homage paid us by hearts which are none the less warm because hidden beneath the rags of honest poverty and semi-civilization 
It takes but little to win the hearts of these rude, unsophisticated people. A two hours' ride from Betainitz over level and reasonably smooth roads brings us into Semlin, quite an important Slavonian city on the Danube, nearly opposite Belgrade, which is on the same side, but separated from it by a large tributary called the Save. Ferry boats ply regularly between the two cities, and, after an hour spent in hunting up different officials to gain permission for Igali to cross over into Serbian territory without having a regular traveler's passport, we escape from the madding crowds of Semlinites by boarding the ferry boat, and, ten minutes later, are exchanging signals with three Serbian wheelmen, who have come down to the landing in full uniform to meet and welcome us to Belgrade. Many readers will doubtless be as surprised as I was to learn that at Belgrade, the capital of the little kingdom of Servia, independent only since the Treaty of Berlin, a bicycle club was organized in January 1885, and that now, in June of that same year, they have a promising club of 30 members, 12 of whom are riders owning their own wheels. Their club is named, in French, La Société Velocipédique Serbe. In the Serbian language, it is unpronounceable to an Anglo-Saxon, and printable only with Slav type. The president, Milorad M. Nikolic Terzibakic, is the cyclist's touring club council for Serbia, and is the southeastern picket of that organization, their club being the extreme cycle outpost in this direction. Our approach has been announced beforehand, and the club has thoughtfully seen the Serbian authorities, and so far smoothed the way for our entrance into their country that the officials do not even make a pretense of examining my passport or packages, an almost unprecedented occurrence, I should say, since they are more particular about passports here than perhaps in any other European country, save Russia and Turkey. Here at Belgrade, I am to part company with Egali, who, by the way, has applied for, and just received, his certificate of appointment to the Cyclists' Touring Club Consulship of Duna Zekeso and Mohacs, an honor of which he feels quite proud. True, there is no other cycler in his whole district, and hardly likely to be for some time to come but i can heartily recommend him to any wandering wheelman happening down the danube valley on a tour he knows the best wine cellars in all the country round and besides being an agreeable and accommodating road companion will prove a salutary check upon the headlong career of any one disposed to overexertion i am not yet to be abandoned entirely to my own resources however these hospitable serbian wheelmen couldn't think of such a thing I am to remain over as their guest till tomorrow afternoon, when Mr. Dukhan Popovitz, the best rider in Belgrade, is delegated to escort me through Serbia to the Bulgarian frontier. When I get there, I shall not be much astonished to see a Bulgarian wheelman offer to escort me to Romelia, and so on clear to Constantinople for i certainly never expected to find so jolly and enthusiastic a company of cyclers in this corner of the world the good fellowship and hospitality of this servian club knows no bounds igali and i are banqueted and driven about in carriages all day belgrade is a strongly fortified city occupying a commanding hill overlooking the danube it is a rare old town battle-scarred and rugged having been a frontier position of importance in a country that has been debatable ground between Turk and Christian for centuries, it has been a coveted prize to be won and lost on the diplomatic chessboard, or, worse still, the football of contending armies and wrangling monarchs. Long before the Ottoman Turks first appeared, like a small dark cloud, no bigger than a man's hand, upon the southeastern horizon of Europe, to extend and overwhelm the budding flower of Christianity and civilization in these fairest portions of the continent, Belgrade was an important Roman fortress. And today, its national museum and antiquarian stores are particularly rich in the treasure trove of Byzantine antiquities unearthed from time to time in the fortress itself, and the region around about that came under its protection. So plentiful, indeed, are old coins and relics of all sorts at Belgrade. 
that, as I am standing looking at the collection in the window of an antiquary shop, the proprietor steps out and presents me a small handful of copper coins of Byzantium as a sort of bait that might perchance tempt one to enter and make a closer inspection of his stock. By the famous Treaty of Berlin, the Servians gained their complete independence, and their country, from a principality paying tribute to the Sultan, changed to an independent kingdom with the Servian on the throne, owing allegiance to nobody, and the people have not yet ceased to show, in a thousand little ways, their thorough appreciation of the change. Besides filling the picture galleries of their museum with portraits of Servian heroes, battle flags, and other gentle reminders of their past history, they have, among other practical methods of manifesting how they feel about the departure of the dominating crescent from among them, turned the leading Turkish mosque into a gas house. One of the most interesting relics in the Servian capital is an old Roman well, dug from the brow of the fortress hill to below the level of the Danube, for furnishing water to the city when cut off from the river by a besieging army. It is an enormous affair, a tubular brick wall about forty feet in circumference and two hundred and fifty feet deep, outside of which a stone stairway, winding round and round the shaft, leads from top to bottom. Openings to the wall, six feet high and three feet wide, occur at regular intervals all the way down, and as we follow our ragged guide down, down into the damp and darkness, by the feeble light of a tallow candle and a broken lantern, I cannot help thinking that these or handy openings leading into the dark, watery depths have, in the tragic history of Belgrade, doubtless been responsible for the mysterious disappearance of more than one objectionable person. It is not without certain involuntary misgivings that I take the lantern from the guide, whose general appearance is, by the way, hardly calculated to be reassuring, and, standing in one of the openings, peer down into the darksome depths, with him hanging on to my coat as an act of precaution. The view from the ramparts of Belgrade Fortress is a magnificent panorama, extending over the broad valley of the Danube, which here winds about as though trying to bestow its favors with impartiality upon Hungary, Servia, and Slavonia, and of the Save. The Servian soldiers are camped in small tents in various parts of the fortress grounds and its environments, or lolling under the shade of a few scantily vendored trees, for the sun is today broiling hot. With a population not exceeding one and a half million, I am told that Servia supports a standing army of a hundred thousand men, and, when required, every man in Servia becomes a soldier. As one lands from the ferry boat and looks about him, he needs no interpreter to inform him that he has left the Occident on the other side of the Save, and to the observant stranger the streets of Belgrade furnish many a novel and interesting sight in the way of fanciful costumes and faces of Oriental life here encountered for the first time. In the afternoon we visit the National Museum of Old Coins, Arms, and Eoman and Servian Antiquities. A banquet in a wine garden, where Servian national music is dispensed by a band of female musicians, is given us in the evening by the club, and royal quarters are assigned us for the night at the hospitable mansion of Mr. Terzibakic's father, who is the merchant prince of Servia and purveyor of the court. Wednesday morning we take a general ramble over the city, besides visiting the club's headquarters, where we find a handsome new album has been purchased for receiving our autographs. The Belgrade wheelmen have names painted on their bicycles, as names are painted on steamboats or yachts. Fairy, Good Luck, and Servian Queen being fair specimens. The cyclers here are sons of leading citizens and businessmen of Belgrade and while they dress and conduct themselves as becomes thorough gentlemen one fancies detecting a certain wild expression of the eye as though their civilization were scarcely yet established in fact this peculiar expression is more noticeable at belgrade and is apparently more general here than at any other place i visit in europe I apprehend it to be a peculiarity that has become hereditary with the citizens, from their city having been so often and for so long the theater of uncertain fate and distracting political disturbances. 
It is the half-startled expression of people with the ever-present knowledge of insecurity. But they are a warm-hearted, impulsive set of fellows, and when, while looking through the museum, we happen across Her Britannic Majesty's representative at the Servian court, who is doing the same thing, one of them unhesitatingly approaches that gentleman, cap in hand, and, with considerable enthusiasm of manner, announces that they have with them a countryman of his who is riding around the world on a bicycle. This cooler-blooded and dignified gentleman is not near so demonstrative in his acknowledgment as they doubtless anticipated he would be, whereat they appear quite puzzled and mystified. Three carriages with cyclers and their friends accompany us a dozen kilometers out to a wayside mahana, the oriental name hereabouts for hotels, wayside inns, etc. Duhan Popovitz and Hugo Tichy, the captain of the club, will ride 45 kilometers with me to Semendria, and at 4 o'clock we mount our wheels and ride away southward into Servia. Arriving at the Mahana, wine is brought, and then the two Servians accompanying me and those returning kiss each other after the manner and custom of their country then a general handshaking and well wishes all around and the carriages turn toward belgrade while we wheelmen alternately ride and trundle over a muddy for it has rained since noon and mountainous road till seven thirty when relatives of dukhan popovitz in the village of gratska kindly offer us the hospitality of their house till morning which we hesitate not to avail ourselves of when about to part at the Mahana, the immortal Igali unwinds from around his waist that long blue girdle, the arranging and rearranging of which has been a familiar feature of the last week's experiences, and presents it to me for a souvenir of himself, a courtesy which I return by presenting him with several of the Byzantine coins given to me by the Belgrade antiquary, as before mentioned. Beyond Symmendria, where the captain leaves us for the return journey, we leave the course of the Danube, which I have been following in a general way for over two weeks, and strike due southward up the smaller, but not less beautiful, valley of the Morava River, where we have the intense satisfaction of finding roads that are both dry and level, enabling us, in spite of the broiling heat, to bowl along at a sixteen-kilometer pace to the village where we halt for dinner and the usual three hours noontide siesta. Seeing me jotting down my notes with a short piece of lead pencil, the proprietor of the Mahana at Symmendria, where we take a parting glass of wine with the captain, and who admires America and the Americans, steps indoors for a minute, and returns with a telescopic pencil case, attached to a silken cord of the Servian national colors, which he places around my neck requesting me to wear it around the world, and when I arrive at my journey's end, sometimes to think of Servia. With the Gali's sky-blue girdle encompassing my waist, and the Servian national colors fondly encircling my neck, I begin to feel quite a heraldic tremor creeping over me, and actually surprise myself casting wistful glances at the huge, antiquated horse pistol stuck in yonder bullwhacker's ample waistband, Moreover, I really think that a pair of these Servian moccasins would not be bad footgear for riding the bicycle. All up the Morava Valley, the roads continue far better than I have expected to find in Servia, and we wheel merrily along. The Risara Mountains, covered with dark pine forests, skirting the valley on the right, sometimes rising into peaks of quite respectable proportions. The sun sinks behind the receding hills. It grows dusk and finally dark, save the feeble light vouchsafed by the new moon, and our destination still lies several kilometers ahead. But at about nine we roll safely into Jagodina, well satisfied with the consciousness of having covered one hundred and forty-five kilometers today, in spite of delaying our start in the morning until eight o'clock, and the twenty kilometers of indifferent road between Grotska and Semendria. There has been no reclining under roadside mulberry trees for my companion to catch up today. However, the Servian wheelman is altogether a speedier man than Igali, and whether the road is rough or smooth, level or hilly, he is found close behind my rear wheel, 
My own shadow follows not more faithfully than does the best rider in Servia. We start for Jagodina at 5.30 next morning, finding the roads a little heavy with sand in places. But, otherwise, all that a wheelman could wish. Crossing a bridge over the Morava River into Chupria, we are required not only to foot it across, but to pay a toll for the bicycles, like any other wheeled vehicle. At Chupria, it seems as though the whole town must be depopulated, so great is the throng of citizens that swarm about us. Motley and picturesque, even in their rags, one's pen utterly fails to convey a correct idea of their appearance. Besides Servians, Bulgarians, and Turks, and the Greek priests, who never fail of being on hand, now appear Romanians, wearing huge sheepskin busbies with the long ragged edges of the wool dangling about eyes and ears, or in the case of a more dudish person, clipped around smooth at the brim, making the headgear look like a small, round, thatched roof. Urchins, whose daily duty is to promenade the family goat around the streets, join in the procession, tugging their bearded charges after them, and a score of dogs, overjoyed beyond measure at the general commotion, romp about and bark their joyous approval of it all. To have crowds like this following one out of town makes a sensitive person feel uncomfortably like being chased out of a community for borrowing chickens by moonlight, or on account of some irregularity concerning hotel bills. On occasions like this, Orientals seemingly have not the slightest sense of dignity. Portly, well-dressed citizens, priests, and military officers press forward among the crowds of peasants and unwashed frequenters of the streets, evidently more delighted with things about them than they have been for many a day before. At Deligrad we wheeled through the battlefield of the same name, where, in 1876, Turks and Servians were arrayed against each other. These battle-scarred hills above Deligrad command a glorious view of the lower Morava Valley, which is hereabouts most beautiful, and just broad enough for its entire beauty to be comprehended. The Servians won the Battle of Deligrad, and, as I pause to admire the glorious prospect to the southward from the hills, methinks their general showed no little sagacity in opposing the invaders at a spot where the Morava Vale, the jewel of Servia, was spread out like a panorama below his position to fan with its loveliness the patriotism of his troops. They could not do otherwise than win with the fairest portion of their well-beloved country spread out before them like a picture. A large cannon, captured from the Turks, is standing on its carriage by the roadside, a mute but eloquent witness of Servian prowess. A few miles further on we halt for dinner at Alexinats, near the old Servian boundary line, also the scene of one of the greatest battles fought during the Servian struggle for independence. The Turks were victorious this time, and 15,000 Servians and 3,000 Russian allies yielded up their lives here to superior Turkish generalship, and Alexiouats was burned to ashes. The Russians have erected a granite monument on a hill overlooking the town, in memory of their comrades who perished in this fight. The roads today average even better than yesterday, and at six o'clock we roll into Nish, 120 kilometers from our starting point this morning, and 280 from Belgrade. As we enter the city, a gang of convicts working on the fortifications forget their clanking shackles and chains and the misery of their state long enough to greet us with a boisterous howl of approval, and the guards, who are standing over them for once, at least fail to check them, for their attention, too, is wholly engrossed in the same wondrous subject. Nish appears to be a thoroughly oriental city, and here I see the first Turkish ladies with their features hidden behind their white yashmaks. At seven or eight o'clock in the morning, when it is comparatively cool and people are patronizing the market, trafficking and bartering for the day's supply of provisions, the streets present quite an animated appearance. But during the heat of the day, the scene changes to one of squalor and indolence. Respectable citizens are smoking Nargalese, Mark Twain's Hubble Bubble, or sleeping somewhere out of sight, 
business is generally suspended, and in every shady nook and corner one sees a swarthy ragamuffin stretched out at full length, perfectly happy and contented, if only he is allowed to snooze the hours away in peace. Human nature is verily the same the world over, and here, in the hotel at Nish, I meet an individual who recalls a few of the sensible questions that have been asked me from time to time at different places on both continents. This Nish interrogator is a Hebrew commercial traveler, who has a smattering of English, and who, after ascertaining during a short conversation that, when a range of mountains or any other small obstruction is encountered, I get down and push the bicycle up, airs his knowledge of English and of cycling to the extent of inquiring whether I don't take a man along to push it up the hills. End of section 16 Recording by William Tomko Section 17 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1, by Thomas Stevens. Chapter 7, Part 3, Through Slovenia and Servia. Riding out of Nish this morning, we stopped just beyond the suburbs to take a curious look at a grim monument of Turkish prowess, in the shape of a square stone structure which the Turks built in 1840 and then faced the whole exterior with grinning rows of Servian skulls partially embedded in mortar. The Servians, naturally objecting to having the skulls of their comrades thus exposed to the gaze of everybody, have since removed and buried them but the rows of indentations in the thick mortared surface still bear unmistakable evidence of the nature of their former occupants. An avenue of thrifty prune trees shades a level road leading out of Nish for several kilometers, but a heavy thunderstorm during the night has made it rather slavish wheeling, although the surface becomes harder and smoother, also hillier, as we gradually approach the Balkan Mountains. That tower well up toward Cloudland immediately ahead the morning is warm and muggy indicating rain and the long steep trundle kilometer after kilometer up the balkan slopes is anything but child's play albeit the scenery is most lovely one prospect especially reminding me of a view in the bighorn mountains of northern wyoming territory on the lower slopes we come to a mahana where, besides plenty of shade trees, we find springs of most delightfully cool water gushing out of crevices in the rocks, and, throwing our freely perspiring forms beneath the grateful shade, and letting the cold water play on our wrists, the best method in the world of cooling oneself when overheated, we both vote that it would be a most agreeable place to spend the heat of the day. But the morning is too young yet to think of thus indulging and the mountainous prospect ahead warns us that the distance covered today will be short enough at the best. The Balkans are clothed with green foliage to the topmost crags, wild pear trees being no inconspicuous feature. Charming little valleys wind about between the mountain spurs, and last night's downpour has imparted a freshness to the whole scene that perhaps it would not be one's good fortune to see every day even were he here. This region of intermingled vales and forest-clad mountains might be the natural home of brigandage, and those ferocious-looking specimens of humanity, with things like long guns in hand, running with scrambling haste down the mountainside toward our road ahead, look like veritable brigands heading us off with a view to capturing us. But they are peacefully disposed goatherds, who, alpenstocks in hand, are endeavoring to see what in the world those queer-looking things are coming up the road. Their tuneful noise, as they play on some kind of an instrument, greets our ears from a dozen mountain slopes around about us. As we put our shoulders to the wheel and gradually approach the summit, tortoises are occasionally surprised, basking in the sunbeams in the middle of the road. When molested, they hiss quite audibly in protest, but if passed peacefully by, they are seen shuffling off into the bushes as though thankful to escape. 
unhappy oxen are toiling patiently upward, literally inch by inch, dragging heavy, creaking wagons loaded with miscellaneous importations, prominent among which I notice square cans of American petroleum. Men on horseback are encountered, the long guns of the Orient slung at their backs, and knife and pistols in sash looking altogether ferocious. Not only are these people perfectly harmless, however, but I verily think it would take a good deal of aggravation to make them even think of fighting. The fellow whose horse we frightened down a rocky embankment, at the imminent risk of breaking the neck of both horse and rider, had both gun, knife, and pistols. Yet, though he probably thinks us emissaries of the evil one, he is in no sense a dangerous character, his weapons being merely gewgaws to adorn his person. Finally, the summit of this range is gained, and the long, grateful descent into the valley of the Nisava River begins. The surface during this descent, though averaging very good, is not always of the smoothest. Several dismounts are found to be necessary, and many places ridden over require a quick hand and ready eye to pass. The Servians have made a capital point in fixing their new boundary line south of this mountain range. Mountaineers are said to be always free men. One can, with equal truthfulness, add that the costumes of mountaineers, wives and daughters, are always more picturesque than those of their sisters in the valleys. In these Balkan mountains, their costumes are a truly wonderful blending of colors, to say nothing of fantastic patterns, apparently a medley of ideas borrowed from Occident and Orient. One woman we have just passed is wearing the loose, flowing pantaloons of the Orient, of a bright yellow color, a tight-fitting jacket of equally bright blue. Around her waist is folded many times a red and blue striped waistband, while both head and feet are bare. This is no holiday attire. It is plainly the ordinary, everyday costume. At the foot of the range, we halt at a wayside mahana for dinner. A daily diligence, with horses for abreast, runs over the Balkans from Nice to Sofia, Bulgaria, and one of them is halted at the mahana for refreshments and a change of horses. Refreshments at these mahanas are not always palatable to travelers, who almost invariably carry a supply of provisions along. Of bread, nothing but the coarse, black variety common in the country is forthcoming at this mahana. And a gentleman, learning from Mr. Popovitz that I have not yet been educated up to black bread, fishes a large roll of excellent milch broad out of his traps and kindly presents it to us. And obtaining from the mahana some hunahen fabrica and wine, we make a very good meal. This Hunehen Fabrica is nothing more nor less than cooked chicken. Whether Hunehen Fabrica is genuine Hungarian for cooked chicken, or whether Igali manufactured the term especially for use between us, I cannot quite understand. Be this as it may, before we started from Belgrade, Igali imparted the secret to Mr. Popovitz that I was possessed with a sort of a wild appetite, as it were, for Hunehen Fabrica and cherries, three times a day the consequence being that Mr. Popovitz thoughtfully orders those viands whenever we halt. After dinner, the mutterings of thunder over the mountains warns us that unless we wish to experience the doubtful luxuries of a roadside mahana for the night, we had better make all speed to the village of Bella Palanca, twelve kilometers distant, over rather hilly roads. In forty minutes, we arrive at the Bella Palanca mahana, some time before the rain begins. It is but twenty kilometers to Pirot, near the Bulgarian frontier, whither my companion has purposed to accompany me, but we are forced to change this program and remain at Bella Palanca. It rains hard all night, converting the unassuming Nisava into a roaring yellow torrent, and the streets of the little Balkan village into mud holes. It is still raining on Sunday morning as Mr. Popovitz is obliged to be back to his duties as foreign correspondent in the Servian National Bank at Belgrade on Tuesday, and the Balkan roads have been rendered impassable for a bicycle, he is compelled to hire a team and wagon to haul him and his wheel back over the mountains to Niche, while I have to remain over Sunday amid the dirt and squalor and discomforts, to say nothing of a second night among the fleas, of an oriental village Mahana.
We only made fifty kilometers over the mountains yesterday, but during the three days from Belgrade together the aggregate has been satisfactory, and Mr. Popovitz has proven a most agreeable and interesting companion. When but fourteen years of age, he served under the banner of the Red Cross in the war between the Turks and Servians, and is altogether an ardent patriot. My Sunday in Bella Palanca impresses me with the conviction that an Oriental village is a splendid place not to live in. In dry weather it is disagreeable enough, but today it is a disorderly aggregation of miserable-looking villagers, pigs, ducks, geese, chickens, and dogs, paddling around the muddy streets. The Oriental peasant's costume is picturesque, or otherwise, according to the fancy of the observer. The red fez, or turban, the upper garment, and the ample red sash wound round and round the waist until it is eighteen inches broad, look picturesque enough for anybody, but when it comes to having the seat of the pantaloons dangling about the calves of the legs, a person imbued with western ideas naturally thinks that if the line between picturesqueness and a two-bushed gunny sack is to be drawn anywhere, it should most assuredly be drawn here. As I notice how prevalent this ungainly style of nether garment is in the Orient, I find myself getting quite uneasy, lest, perchance, anything serious should happen to mine, and I should be compelled to ride the bicycle in a pair of natives, which would, however, be an altogether impossible feat, unless it were feasible to gather the surplus area up in a bunch and wear it like a bustle. I cannot think, however, that fate cruel as she sometimes is, has anything so outrageous as this in store for me or any other cycler. Although Turkish ladies have almost entirely disappeared from Servia since its severance from Turkey, they have left, in a certain degree, an impress upon the women of the country villages, although the Bella Palanca maidens, as I notice on the streets in their Sunday clothes today, do not wear the regulation yamak, but a headgear that partially obscures the face their whole demeanor giving one the impression that their one object in life is to appear the pink of propriety in the eyes of the whole world. They walk along the streets at a most circumspect gait, looking neither to the right nor left, neither stopping to converse with each other, by the way, nor paying any sort of attention to the men. The two proprietors of the Mahana, where I am stopping, are subjects for a student of human nature. With the wretched little pigsty of a Mahana in this poverty-stricken village, they are gradually accumulating a fortune. Whenever a luckless traveler falls into their clutches, they make the incident count for something. They stand expectantly about in their box-like public room. Their whole stock consists of a little diluted wine and mastic, and if a bit of black bread and smear lease is ordered, one is putting it down in the book while the other is ferreting it out of a little cabinet where they keep a starvation quantity of edibles. When the one acting as waiter has placed the inexpensive morsel before you, he goes over to the book to make sure that number two has been put down enough, and, although the maximum value of the provisions is perhaps not over two pence, this precious pair will actually put their heads together in consultation over the amount to be chalked down. Ere the shades of Sunday evening have settled down, I have arrived at the conclusion that if these two are average specimens of the Oriental Jew, they are financially a totally depraved people. The rain ceased soon after noon on Sunday, and although the roads are all but impassable, I pull out southward at five o'clock on Monday morning, trundling up the mountain roads through mud that frequently compels me to stop and use the scraper. After the summit of the hills between Bella Palanca and Pirot is gained, the road descending into the valley beyond becomes better, enabling me to make quite good time into Pirot, where my passport undergoes an examination and is favored with a vice by the Servian officials preparatory to crossing the Servian and Bulgarian frontier about twenty kilometers to the southward. Pirot is quite a large and important village, and my appearance is the signal for more excitement than the Perotters have experienced for many a day. While I am partaking of bread and coffee in the hotel, the main street becomes crowded as on some festive occasion, the grown-up people's faces beaming with as much joyous anticipation of what they expect to behold when I emerge from the hotel as the unwashed countenances of the ragged youngsters around them.
leading citizens who have been to paris or vienna and have learned something about what sort of a road a cycler needs have imparted the secret to many of their fellow townsmen and there is a general stampede to the highway leading out of town to the southward this road is found to be most excellent and the enterprising people who have walked ridden or driven out there in order to see me ride past to the best possible advantage are rewarded by witnessing what they never saw before a cycler speeding along past them at ten miles an hour this gives such general satisfaction that for some considerable distance i ride between a double row of lifted hats and general salutations and a swelling murmur of applause runs all along the line Two citizens, more enterprising even than the others, have determined to follow me with team and light wagon to a roadside office ten kilometers ahead, where passports have again to be examined. The road for the whole distance is level and fairly smooth. The Servian horses are, like the Indian ponies of the West, small, but wiry and tough, and although I press forward quite energetically, the whip is applied without stint, and when the passport office is reached, we pull up alongside it together. But their pony sides are white with lather. The passport officer is so delighted at the story of the race, as narrated to him by the others, that he fetches me out a piece of lump sugar and a glass of water, a common refreshment partaken of in this country yet a third time i am halted by a roadside official and required to produce my passport and again at the village of zererbrod just over the bulgarian frontier which i reach about ten o'clock to the bulgarian official i present a small stamped cardboard check which was given me for that purpose at the last servian examination but he doesn't seem to understand it and demands to see the original passport when my English passport is produced, he examines it, and straightway assures me of the Bulgarian official respect for an Englishman by grasping me warmly by the hand. The passport office is in the second story of a mud hovel, and is reached by a dilapidated flight of outdoor stairs. My bicycle is left leaning against the building, and during my brief interview with the officer, a noisy crowd of semi-civilized Bulgarians have collected about, examining it and commenting unreservedly concerning it and myself. The officer, ashamed of the rudeness of his country, and their evidently untutored minds, leans out of the window, and in a chiding voice explains to the crowd that I am a private individual and not a traveling mountebank going about the country giving exhibitions, and advises them to uphold the dignity of the Bulgarian character by scattering forthwith but the crowd doesn't scatter to any appreciable extent they don't care whether i am public or private they have never seen anything like me and the bicycle before and the one opportunity of a lifetime is not to be lightly passed over they are a wild untamed lot these bulgarians here at zarabrod little given to self-restraint when i emerge the silence of eager anticipation takes entire possession of the crowd only to break forth into a spontaneous howl of delight from three hundred bared throats when I mount into the saddle and ride away into Bulgaria. My ride through Servia, save over the Balkans, has been most enjoyable, and the roads, I am agreeably surprised to have to record, have averaged as good as any country in Europe, save England and France, though being for the most part unmacadamized with wet weather they would scarcely show to such advantage my impression of the servian peasantry is most favorable they are evidently a warm-hearted hospitable and withal a patriotic people loving their little country and appreciating their independence as only people who have but recently had their dream of self-government realized know how to appreciate it they even paint the woodwork of their bridges and public buildings with the national colors I am assured that the Servians have progressed wonderfully since acquiring their full independence. But, as one journeys down the beautiful and fertile valley of the Morava, where improvements would naturally be seen, if anywhere, one falls to wondering where they can possibly have come in. Some of their methods would, indeed, seem to indicate a most deplorable lack of practicability. One of the most ridiculous, to the writer's mind, is the erection of small, long sheds substantially built of heavy-hewn timber supports, 
and thick homemade tiles over ordinary plank fences and gates to protect them from the weather when a good coating of tar or paint would answer the purpose of preservation much better these structures give one the impression of a dollar placed over a penny to protect the latter from harm every peasant owns a few acres of land and if he produces anything above his own wants he hauls it to market in an ox wagon with roughly hewn wheels without tires and whose creaking can plainly be heard a mile away at present the servian tills his little freehold with the clumsiest of implements some his own rude handiwork and the best imperfectly fashioned and forged on native anvils his plough is chiefly the forked limb of a tree pointed with iron sufficiently to enable him to root around in the surface soil one would think the country might offer a promising field for some enterprising manufacturer of such implements as hoes scythes hay forks small strong ploughs cultivators etc these people are industrious especially the women i have entry met a servian peasant woman returning homeward in the evening from her labor in the fields carrying a fat heavy baby a clumsy hoe not much lighter than the youngster and an earthenware water pitcher and at the same time industriously spitting wool with a small hand spindle and yet some people argue about the impossibility of doing two things at once whether these poor women have been hoeing potatoes carrying the infant and spilling wool at the same time all day i am unable to say not having been an eyewitness though i really should not be much astonished if they had end of section seventeen recording by william tomko section eighteen of around the world on a bicycle volume one this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sudeshna Around the World on a Bicycle Volume 1 by Thomas Stevens Chapter 8, Part 1 Chapter 8 Bulgaria, Rumelia and into Turkey The road leading into Bulgaria from the Zari Broad Custom House is fairly good for several kilometers when mountainous and rough ways are encountered. It is a country of goats and goat herds. A rainstorm is hovering threateningly over the mountains immediately ahead. But it does not reach the vicinity I am traversing. It passes to the southward and makes the roads for a number of miles well nigh impassable. Up in the mountains I meet more than one Bulgarian National Express. Pony pack trains carrying merchandise to and fro between Sofia and Nish. Most of these animals are too heavily laden to think of objecting to the appearance of anything on the road. But some of the outfits are returning from Sofia in ballast only, and one of these doubtless overjoyed beyond measure at their unaccustomed lissomeness breaks through all restraint at my approach, and goes stampeding over the rolling hills, the wild-looking teamsters in full tear after them. Whatever of this nature happens in this part of the world, the people seem to regard with commendable complacence. Instead of wasting time in trying to quarrel about it, they set about gathering up the scattered train as though a stampede were the most natural thing going. Bulgaria, at least by the route I am crossing it, is a land of mountains and elevated plateaus, and the inhabitants I should call the ranchers of the Orient. In their general appearance and demeanour bearing the same relation to the plodding corn whore and side swinger of the Morava Valley as the Nyobrara cowboy does to the Nebraska homesteader. On the mountains are encountered herds of goats in charge of men, who wreck little for civilization, and the upland plains are dotted over with herds of ponies that require constant watching in the interest of scattered fields of grain. For lunch, I halt at an unlikely-looking mehana, near a cluster of mud hovels, which I suppose the Bulgarians consider a village, and am rewarded by the blackest of black bread, in the composition of which sand plays no inconsiderable part and the remnants of a chicken killed and stewed at some uncertain period of the past. Of all places invented in the world to disgust a hungry expectant wayfarer, the Bulgarian Mehana is the most abominable. Black bread and mastique, a composition of gum mastique and Boston rum, so I am informed, seem to be about the only things habitually kept in stock, 
and everything about the place plainly shows the proprietor to be ignorant of the crudest notions of cleanliness. A storm is observed brewing in the mountains I have lately traversed, and having swallowed my unpalatable lunch, I hasten to mount and betake myself off towards Sophia, distant thirty kilometres. The road is nothing extra, to say the least, but a howling wind blowing from the region of the gathering storm propels me rapidly in spite of undulations, ruts, and undesirable road qualities generally. The region is an elevated plateau of which but a small proportion is cultivated. On more than one of the neighboring peaks, patches of snow are still lingering, and the cool mountain breeze recall memories of the Laramie Plains. Men and women returning homeward on horseback from Sofia are frequently encountered. The women are bedecked with beads and trinkets and the gishos of semi-civilization, as might be the favorite squaws of squatting beaver or sitting bull, and furthermore imitate their copper-colored sisters of the far west by bestriding their ponies like men. But in the matter of artistic and profuse decoration of the person, the squaw is far behind the peasant women of Bulgaria. The garments of the men are a combination of sheepskin and a thick, coarse woolen material, spun by the women and fashioned after patterns their forefathers brought with them centuries ago when they first invaded Europe. The Bulgarian saddle, like everything else here, is a rudely constructed affair that answers the double purpose of a pack saddle or for riding, a homemade unwieldy thing that is a fair pony's load of itself. At 4.30 p.m. I wheeled into Sofia, the Bulgarian capital, having covered 110 kilometers today in spite of mud, mountains and roads that have been none of the best. Here again I have to patronize the money changers for a few Serbian francs which I have not current in Bulgaria and the Israelite who reserved unto himself a profit of two francs on the pound at Niche. Now seems the spirit of fairness itself alongside a hook-nosed, wizen-faced relative of his here at Sofia, who wants two Serbian francs in exchange for each Bulgarian coin of the same intrinsic value, and the best I am able to get by going to several different money changers is five francs in exchange for seven. Yet, the Serbian frontier is but sixty kilometers distant, with stages running to it daily, and the two coins are identical in intrinsic value. At the Hotel Concordia in Sofia, in lieu of plates, the meat is served on round, flat blocks of wood about the circumference of a saucer, the trenchers of the time of Henry VIII, and two respectable citizens seated opposite me are supping off black bread and a sliced cucumber, both fishing slices of the cucumber out of a wooden bowl with their fingers. Life at the Bulgarian capital evidently bears its legitimate relative comparison to the life of the country it represents. One of Prince Alexander's bodyguard, pointed out to me in the bazaar, looks quite a semi-barbarian, arrayed in a highly ornamented national costume, with immense oriental pistols in the waistband, and gold-braided turban cocked on one side of his head, and a fierce moustache. The soldiers here, even the comparatively fortunate ones standing guard at the entrance to the prince's palace, look as though they haven't had a new uniform for years, and had long since despaired of ever getting one. A war and an alliance with some wealthy nation which would rig them out in respectable uniforms would probably not be an unwelcome event to many of them. While wandering about the bazaar after supper, I observe that the streets, the palace grounds, and in fact every place that is lit up at all, save the minarets of the mosque which are always illumined with vegetable oil, are lighted with American petroleum, gas and coal being unknown in the Bulgarian capital. There is an evident want of system in everything these people do. From my own observations, I am inclined to think they pay no heed whatever to generally accepted divisions of time, but govern their actions entirely by light and darkness. There is no eight-hour nor ten-hour system of labor here, and I verily believe the industrial classes work the whole time, save when they pause to munch black bread and to take three or four hours sleep in the middle of the night. For as I trundle my way through the streets at five o'clock next morning, the same people I observed at various occupations in the bazaars are there now as busily engaged as though they had been keeping it up all night, as also are workmen building a house. They are pegging away at nine o'clock yesterday evening, by the flickering light of small petroleum lamps, and at five this morning they scarcely look like men who are just commencing for the day. The Oriental, with his primitive methods and tenacious adherence to the ways of his forefathers, probably enough has to work these extra-long hours in order to make any sort of progress. 
However this may be, I have throughout the Orient been struck by the industriousness of the real working classes. But in practicability and inventiveness, the Oriental is sadly deficient. On the way out, I pause at the bazaar to drink hot milk and eat a roll of white bread. The former being quite acceptable, for the morning is rather raw and chilly. The wind is still blowing a gale, and the company of cavalry out of exercise are encased in their heavy grey overcoats, as though it were midwinter instead of the 23rd of June. Rudely clad peasants are encountered on the road, carrying large cans of milk into Sofia from neighbouring ranches. I stop several of them with a view of sampling the quality of their milk, but invariably find it unstrained, and the vessels looking as though they had been strangers to scalding for some time. Others are carrying gunny sacks of smear case on their shoulders, the way from which is not infrequently streaming down their backs. Cleanliness is no doubt next to godliness, but the Bulgarians seem to be several degrees removed from either. They need the civilizing influence of soap quite as much as anything else, and if the missionaries cannot educate them up to Christianity, or civilization, it might not be a bad scheme to try the experiment of starting a native soap factory or two in the country. Savagery lingers in the lap of civilization on the breezy plateaus of Bulgaria. But salvation is coming this way in the shape of an extension of the Umelian railway from the south to connect with the Serbian line north of the Balkans. For years, the Fred department of this pioneer railway will have to run opposition against ox teams and creaking groaning wagons, and since railway stockholders and directors are not usually content with an exclusive diet of black bread with a wilted cucumber for a change on Sundays, as is the Bulgarian teamster, and since locomotives cannot be turned out to graze free of charge on the hillsides, the competition will not be so entirely one-sided as might be imagined. Long trains of these ox teams are met with this morning hauling freight and building lumber from the railway terminus in Umolia to Sofia. The teamsters are wearing large grey coats of thick blanketing, with floods covering the head, a heavy convenient garment that keeps out both rain and cold while on the road, and at night serves for blanket and mattress, for then the teamster turns his oxen loose on the adjacent hillside to graze, and after munching a piece of black bread, he places a small wickerwork windbreak against the windward side of the wagon, and curling himself up in his great coat, sleeps soundly. Besides the ox trains, large straggling trains of pack ponies and donkeys occasionally fill the whole roadway. They are carrying firewood and charcoal from the mountains, or wine and spirits in long slender casks from Rumelia, while others are loaded with bales and boxes of miscellaneous merchandise, out of all proportion to their own size. The road southward from Sofia is abominable. Being originally constructed of earth and large unbroken boulders, it has not been repaired for years, and the pack trains and ox wagons forever crawling along have, during the wet weather of many seasons, tramped the dirt away and left the surface a wretched waste of ruts, holes, and thickly protruding stones. It is the worst piece of road I have encountered in all Europe, and although it is rideable this morning by a cautious person, one risks and invites disaster at every turn of the wheel. Old Boreas comes howling from the mountains of the north, and hustles me briskly along over ruts, holes, and boulders, however in a most reckless fashion, furnishing all the propelling power needful, and leaving me nothing to do but keep a sharp lookout for breakneck places immediately ahead. In Serbia, the peasants, driving along the road in their wagons, upon observing me approaching them, being uncertain of the character of my vehicle and the amount of road space I require, would oft times drive entirely off the road, and sometimes, when they fail to take this precaution, and the teams would begin to show signs of restiveness as they drew near. The men would seem to lose their wits for the moment, and cry out in alarm, as though some unknown danger were hovering over them. I have seen women begin to wail quite pitifully, as though they fancied I bestrode an all devouring circular saw that was about to whirl into them and rend team, wagon and everything asunder. But the Bulgarians don't seem to care much whether I am going to saw them in twain or not. They are far less particular about yielding the road and both men and women seem to be made of altogether sterner stuff than the Servians and the Slavonians. They seem several degrees less civilized than their neighbors for the north, judging from their general appearance and demeanor. They act peaceably and are reasonably civil towards me and the bicycle, however, and personally I rather enjoy their rough, unpolished manners. Although there is a certain element of rudeness and boisterousness about them, compared with anything I have encountered elsewhere in Europe, they seem, on the whole, a good-natured people. 
We Westerners seldom hear anything of the Bulgarians, except in war times, and then it is usually in connection with atrocities that furnish excellent sensational material for the illustrated weeklies. Consequently, I rather expected to have a rough time riding through alone. But instead of coming out slashed and scarred like a Heidelberg student, I emerged from their territory with nothing more serious than a good healthy shaking up from their ill-conditioned roads and howling winds. And my prejudice against black bread with sand in it partly overcame from having had to eat it or nothing. Bulgaria is a principality under the suzerainty of the Sultan, to whom it is supposed to pay a yearly tribute. But the suzerainty sits lightly upon the people, since they do pretty much as they please, and they never worry themselves about the tribute, simply putting it down on the slate whenever it comes due. The Turks might just as well wipe out the account now as at any time, for they will eventually have to whistle for the whole indebtedness. A smart rainstorm drives me into an uninviting mehana near the Rumelian frontier for two unhappy hours at noon. A mehana where the edible accommodations would ring an ugh from an American Indian and the sole occupants are a blear-eyed Bulgarian in twenty-year-old sheepskin clothes whose appearance plainly indicates an over-fondness for mastic and an unhappy-looking black kitten. Fearful lest something perchance might occur to compel me to spend the night here. I don my gossamers as soon as the rain slacks up a little, and splurge ahead through the mud towards Ishtima, which my map informs me is just on this side of the Koja Balkans, which rise up in dark wooded ridges at no great distance ahead, to the southward. The mud and rain combine to make things as disagreeable as possible, but before three o'clock I reach Ishtima, to find that I am in the province of Umelia, and am again required to produce my passport. I am now getting well down into territory that quite recently was completely under the dominion of the unspeakable Turk, unspeakable by the way to the writer in more senses than one, and is partly so even now, but have as yet seen very little of the mysterious veiled lady. The Bulgarians are Christian when they are anything, though the great majority of them are nothing religiously. A comparatively comfortable mehana is found here at Ishtima, and the proprietor, being able to talk German, readily comprehends the meaning of Hunen f- Hen Fabrika, but I have to dispense with cherries. Mud is the principal element of the road leading out of Ishtima and over the Koja Balkans this morning. The curious crowd of Ishtimanites that follow me through the mud holes and filth of the native streets to see what is going to happen when I get clear of them are rewarded but poorly for their trouble. The best I can possibly do being to make a spasmodic run of a hundred yards through the mud, which I do purely out of consideration for their inquisitiveness, since it seems rather disagreeable to disappoint a crowd of villagers who are expectantly following and watching one's every movement, wondering in their ignorance, why you don't ride instead of walk? It is a long, wearisome trundle up the muddy slopes of the Koja Balkans, but after the descent into the Maritza Valley begins, some little rideable surface is encountered. Though many loose stones are lying about and pitch holes innumerable make riding somewhat risky considering that the road frequently leads immediately alongside precipices. Pack donkeys are met on these mountain roads, sometimes filling the way and corning doggedly and indifferently forward, even in places where I have little choice between scrambling up a rock on one side of the road or jumping down a precipice on the other. I can generally manage to pass them, however, by placing the bicycle on one side and standing guard over it, push them off one by one as they pass. Some of these Rumelian donkeys are the most diminutive creatures I ever saw, but they seem capable of toiling up these steep mountain roads with enormous loads. I met one this morning carrying bales of something far bigger than himself, and a big Rumelian, whose feet actually came in contact with the ground occasionally, perched on his rump. The man looked quite capable of carrying both the donkey and his load. The warm and fertile Maritza Valley is reached soon after noon, and I am not sorry to find it traversed by a decent macadamized road, though while it has been raining quite heavily up among the mountains, this valley has evidently been favoured with a small deluge, and frequent stretches are covered with deep mud and sand, washed down from the adjacent hills and the cultivated areas of the Bulgarian uplands. The grain fields are yet quite green but harvesting has already begun in the warmer Maritza Vale, and gangs of Rumelian peasants are in the fields, industriously plying, reaping hooks to save their crops of wheat and rye, which the storm has badly lodged. A many miles of this level valley road are ridden over, 
a dozen pointed minarets loom up ahead, and at four o'clock I dismount off the confines of the well-nigh impassable streets of Tatar Bajarjik, quite a lively little city in the sense that oriental cities are lively, which means well-stocked bazaars thronged with motley crowds. Here I am, delayed for some time by a thunderstorm, and finally wheel away southward in the face of threatening heavens. Several villages of gypsies are camped on the banks of the Maritza, just outside the limits of Tatar Bazarjik. A crowd of bronzed, half-naked youngsters wantonly favour me with a fusillade of stones as I ride past, and several gaunt, hungry-looking curs follow me for some distance, with much threatening clamour. The dogs in the Orient seem to be pretty much all of one breed, genuine mongrel, possessing nothing of the spirit and courage of the animals we are familiar with. Gypsies are more plentiful south of the Sav than even in Austria-Hungary, but since leaving Slavonia, I have never been importuned by them for arms. Travellers from other countries are seldom met with along the roads here, and I suppose that the wandering Romanis have long since learned the uselessness of asking alms of the natives. But since they religiously abstain from anything like work, how they manage to live is something of a mystery. Ere I am five kilometres from Tatar Bajarjik, the rain begins to descend, and there is neither house nor other shelter visible anywhere ahead. The peasants' villages are all on the river, and the road leads for mile after mile through fields of wheat and rye. I forge ahead in a drenching downpour that makes short work of the thin gossamer suit, which on this occasion barely prevents me getting a wet skin, ere I descry a thrice-welcome mehana ahead and repair thither, prepared to accept with becoming thankfulness whatever accommodation the place affords. It proves many degrees superior to the average Bulgarian institution of the same name, the proprietor causing my eyes fairly to bulge out with astonishment by producing a box of French sardines, and bread several shades lighter than I had, in view of previous experiences expected to find, and for a bed provides one of the huge thick overcoats before spoken of, which with the ample hood envelops the whole figure in a covering that defies both wet and cold. I am provided with this unsightly but nonetheless acceptable garment, and given the happy privilege of occupying the floor of a small outbuilding in company with several rough-looking pack-trained teamsters similarly encased, I pass a not altogether comfortless night, the pattering of rain against the one small window effectually suppressing such thankless thoughts as have a tendency to come unbidden whenever the snoring of any of my fellow lodgers gets aggravatingly harsh. In all this company I think I am the only person who doesn't snore, and when I awake from my rather fitful slumbers at four o'clock and find the rain no longer pattering against the window, I arise and take up my journey towards Philippopolis, the city I had intended reaching yesterday. It is after crossing the Koja Balkans and descending into the Maritza Valley that one finds among the people a peculiarity that until a person becomes used to it causes no little mystification and many ludicrous mistakes. A shake of the head, which with us means a negative answer, means exactly the reverse with the people of the Maritza Valley. And it puzzled me not a little more than once yesterday afternoon, when inquiring whether I was on the right road and when patronizing fruit stalls in Tatar Bazarjik. One never feels quite certain about being right when, after inquiring of a native, if this is the correct road to Mustafa Fasha or Philippopolis, he replies with a vigorous shake of the head. And although one soon gets accustomed to this peculiarity in others and accepts it as it is intended, it is not quite so easy to get into the habit yourself. This cure custom seems to prevail only among the inhabitants of this particular valley, for after leaving it at Adrianopol, I see nothing more of it. Another peculiarity all through Oriental, and indeed through a good part of Central Europe, is that instead of the whoa, which we use to a horse, the driver hisses like a goose. End of section 18. Recording by Sudeshna. Section 19 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sudeshna. Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1 by Thomas Stevens. Chapter 8, Part 2. Yesterday evening's downpour has little injured the road between the Mehana and Philippopolis, the capital of Eumelia, and I wheel to the confines of that city in something over two hours. Philippopolis is most beautifully situated, being built on and around a cluster of several rocky hills, 
a situation which, together with the plenitude of waving trees, imparts a pleasing and picturesque effect. With a score of tapering minarets pointing skyward among the green foliage, the scene is thoroughly oriental. But, like all eastern cities, distance lends enchantment to the view. All down the Meritza Valley, and in lesser numbers extending southward and eastward over the undulating plains of Adrianpol, are many prehistoric mounds, some twenty-five or thirty feet high, and of about the same diameter. Sometimes in groups, and sometimes singly, these mounds occur so frequently that one can often count a dozen at a time. In the vicinity of Philippopolis several have been excavated, and human remains discovered reclining beneath large slabs of coarse pottery, set up like an inverted V. Thus, A. Evidently intended as a watershed for the preservation of the bodies. Another feature of the landscape, and one that fails not to strike the observant traveller as a melancholy feature, are the Mohammedan cemeteries. Outside every town and near every village are broad areas of ground, thickly studded with slabs of roughly hewn rock set up on end, cities of the dead vastly more populous than the abodes of life adjacent. A person can stand on one of the Philippopolis heights and behold the hills and vales all around thickly dotted with these rude reminders of our universal fate. It is but as yesterday since the Turk occupied these lands, and was in the habit of making it particularly interesting to any dog of a Christian, who dared desecrate one of these Mussulman cemeteries with his unholy presence, but today they are unsurrounded by a protecting fence or the moral restrictions of dominant Mussulmans, and the sheep, cows and goats of the infidel Gheor graze among them. And, O shade of Mohammed, hogs also scratch their backs against the tombstones and root around at their own sweet will, sometimes unearthing skulls and bones which it is the Turkish custom not to bury at any great depth. The great number and extent of these cemeteries seem to appeal to the unaccustomed observer in eloquent evidence against a people whose rule find religion have been of the sword. While obtaining my breakfast of bread and milk in the Philippopolis bazaar, an Arab ragamuffin rushes in, and with anxious gesticulations towards the bicycle, which I have from necessity left outside, and cries of Monsieur, Monsieur, plainly announces that there is something wrong in connection with the machine. Quickly going out, I find that, although I left it standing on the narrow apology for a sidewalk, it is in imminent danger of coming to grief at the instance of a broadly laden donkey which with his load veritably takes up the whole narrow street, including the sidewalks, as he slowly picks his way along through mud holes and protruding cobblestones. And yet Philippopolis has improved wonderfully, since it has nominally changed from a Turkish to a Christian city, I am told. The cross having in Philippopolis not only triumphed over the crescent, but its influence is rapidly changing the condition and appearance of the streets. There is no doubt about the improvements, but they are at present most conspicuous in the suburbs, near the English consulate. It is threatening rain again as I am picking my way through the crooked streets of Philippopolis towards the Adranopol road. Verily, I seem these days to be fully occupied in playing hide-and-seek with the elements. But in Rumelia, at this season, it is a question of either rain or insufferable heat. And perhaps, after all, I have reason to be thankful at having the former to contend with rather than the latter. Two thunderstorms have to be endowed during the forenoon, and for lunch I reach a mehana where besides eggs roasted in the embers and fairly good bread have actually offered a napkin that has been used but a few times, an evidence of civilization that is quite refreshing. A repetition of the rain dodging of the forenoon characterizes the afternoon journey. And while halting at a small village, the inhabitants actually take me for a mountbank, and among them collect a handful of diminutive copper coins, about the size and thickness of a gold twenty-five cent piece, and of which it would take at least twenty to make an American cent, and offer them to me for a performance. What with shaking my head for no, and the villagers naturally mistaking the motion for yes, according to their own custom, I have quite an interesting time of it, making them understand that I am not a mountbank travelling from one Romelian village to another living on two cents worth of black sandy bread per diem, and giving performances for about three cents a time. 
For my halting place tonight, I reach the village of Kahem, in which I find a mehana, where although the accommodations are of the crudest nature, the proprietor is a kindly disposed and withal a thoroughly honest individual, furnishing me with a reed mat and a pillow, and making things as comfortable and agreeable as possible. Eating raw cucumbers as we eat apples or pears appears to be universal in Oriental Europe. Frequently through Bulgaria and Romania, I have noticed people, both old and young, gnawing away at a cucumber with the greatest relish, eating it rind and all without any condiments whatever. All through Romania, the gradual decay of the crescent and the corresponding elevation of the cross is everywhere evident. The Christian element is now predominant, and the Turkish authorities play but an unimportant part in the government of internal affairs. Naturally enough, it does not suit the Muslim to live among people whom his religion and time-honored custom have taught him to regard as inferiors. The consequence being that there has of late years been a general folding of tents and silently stealing away, and today it is no very infrequent occurrence for a whole Muslim village to pack up bag and baggage and move bodily to Asia Minor, where the Sultan gives them tracts of land for settlement. Between the Christian and Muslim populations of these countries, there is naturally a certain amount of the six of one and half a dozen of the other principle, and in certain regions where the Muslims have dwindled to a small minority, the Christians are ever prone to bestow upon them the same treatment that the Turks formerly gave them. There appears to be little conception of what we consider good manners among Oriental villagers, and while I am writing out a few notes this evening, the people crowding the mehana, because of my strange unaccustomed presence, stand around watching every motion of my pen, jostling carelessly against the bench and commenting on things concerning me and the bicycle with a garrulousness that makes it almost impossible for me to write. The women of these Umalian villages bang their hair and wear it in two long braids, or plait it into a streaming white headdress of some gauzy material behind. Huge silver clasps artistically engraved that are probably heirlooms fasten a belt around their waist, and as they walk along barefooted, strings of beads, bangles and necklaces of silver coins make an incessant jingling. The sky clears and the moon shines forth resplendently ere I stretch myself on my rude couch tonight, and the sun rising bright next morning would seem to indicate fair weather at last, an indication that proves illusory, however, before the day is over. At Khaskhor, some fifteen kilometers from Kohem, I am able to obtain my favorite breakfast of bread, milk and fruit, and while I am indoors eating it, a stalwart Turk considerately mounts guard over the bicycle, resolutely keeping the meddlesome crowd at bay until I get through eating. The roads this morning, though hilly, are fairly smooth, and about eleven o'clock I reach Ermuli, the last town in Rumelia, where besides being required to produce my passport, I am requested by a pompous lieutenant of German army to produce my permit for carrying a revolver, the first time I have been thus molested in Europe. Upon explaining as best I can that I have no such permit and that for a voyageur permission is not necessary, something about which I am in no way so certain, however, as my words would seem to indicate, I am politely disarmed and conducted to a guard room in the police barracks and for some twenty minutes am favoured with the exclusive society of a uniformed guard and the unhappy reflections of a probably heavy fine, if not imprisonment. I am inclined to think afterward that in arresting and detaining me, the officer was simply showing off his authority a little to his fellow Ermulites clustered about me and the bicycle, for at the expiration of half an hour my revolver and passport are handed back to me, and without further inquiries or explanations I am allowed to depart in peace. As though in willful aggravation of the case, a village of gypsies have their tents pitched, and their donkeys grazing in the last moment in cemetery, I see, are passing over the Rumelian border into Turkey proper, where, at the very first village, the general aspect of religious affairs changes, as though its proximity to the border should render rigid distinctions desirable. Instead of the crumbling walls and tottering minarets, a group of closely veiled women are observed, praying outside a well-preserved mosque, and praying sincerely too, since not even my never-before-seen presence and the attention-commanding bicycle are sufficient to win their attention for a moment from their devotions. Albeit those I meet on the road peer curiously enough from between the folds of yashmaks. I am worrying along today in the face of a most discouraging headwind, and the roads, though mostly rideable, are none of the best. 
For much of the way there is a macadamized road that in the palmy days of the Ottoman dominion was doubtless a splendid highway. But now weeds and thistles, evidences of decaying traffic and of the proximity of the Umelian railway are growing in the centre. And holes and impassable places make cycling a necessarily wide awake performance. Mustafa Pasha is the first Turkish town of any importance I come to. And here again my much required passport has to be exhibited. But the police officers of Mustafa Pasha seem to be exceptionally intelligent and quite agreeable fellows. My revolver is in plain view in its accustomed place, but they pay no sort of attention to it. Neither do they ask me a whole rigmarole of questions about my linguistic accomplishments, whither I am going, whence I came, etc. But simply glance at my passport, as though its examination were a matter of small consequence anyhow. Shake hands and smilingly request me to let them see me ride. It begins to rain soon after I leave Mustafa Pasha, forcing me to take refuge in a convenient culvert beneath the road. I have been under this shelter but a few minutes when I am favoured with the company of three swarthy Turks, who riding towards Mustafa Pasha on horseback have sought the same shelter. These people straight away express their astonishment at finding me and the bicycle under the culvert, by first commenting among themselves, then they turn a battery of Turkish interrogations upon my devoted head, nearly driving me out of my senses ere I escape. They are of course quite unintelligible to me, for if one of them asks a question, a shrug of the shoulders only causes him to repeat the same over and over again, each time a little louder and a little more deliberate. Sometimes they are all three propounding questions and emphasizing them at the same time, until I begin to think that there is a plot to talk me to death and confiscate whatever valuables I have about me. They all three have long knives in their waistbands, and instead of pointing out the mechanism of the bicycle to each other with a finger like civilized people, they use these long, wicked-looking knives for the purpose. They may be a coterie of heavy villains for anything I know, to the contrary, or am able to judge from their general appearance, and in view of the apparent disadvantage of one against three in such cramped quarters, I avoid their immediate society as much as possible, by edging off to one end of the culvert. They are probably honest enough, but as their stock of interrogation seems inexhaustible, at the end of half an hour I conclude to face the elements and take my chances of finding some other shelter farther ahead rather than endure their vociferous onslaughts any longer. They all three come out to see what is going to happen, and I am not ashamed to admit that I stand tinkering around the bicycle in the pelting rain longer than is necessary before mounting, in order to keep them out in it and get them wet through if possible in revenge for having practically ousted me from the culvert. And since I have a waterproof and they have nothing of the sort, I partially succeed in my plans. The road is the same ancient and neglected macadam. But between Mustafa Pasha and Adrianople, they either make some pretense of keeping it in repair, or else the traffic is sufficient to keep down the weeds, and I am able to mount and ride in spite of the downpour. After riding about two miles, I come to another culvert, in which I deem it advisable to take shelter. Here also I find myself honoured with company, but this time it is a lone cow herder, who is either too dull and stupid to do anything but stare alternately at me and the bicycle, or else is deaf and dumb and my recent experience makes me cautious about tempting him to use his tongue. I am forced by the rain to remain cramped up in this last narrow culvert until nearly dark, and then trundle along through an area of stones and waterholes towards Adrianople, which city lies I know not how far to the southeast. While trundling along through the darkness in the hope of reaching a village or mehana, I observe a rocket shoot skyward in the distance ahead, and surmise that it indicates the whereabout of Adrianople but it is plainly many a very mile ahead. The road cannot be ridden by the uncertain light of a cloud-veiled moon, and I have been forging ahead over rough ways leading through an undulating country, and most of the day against a strong headwind since early dawn. By ten o'clock I happily arrive at a section of country that has not been favoured by the afternoon rain, and, no mehana making its appearance, I conclude to sup off the cold, cheerless memories of the black bread and half-ripe pears, eaten for dinner at a small village, and crawl beneath some wild prune bushes for the night. A few miles wheeling over very fair roads next morning brings me into Adrianople, where, at the Hotel Constantinople, I obtain an excellent breakfast of roast lamb, this being the only well-cooked piece of meat I have eaten since leaving Niche. 
It has rained every day without exception since it delayed me over Sunday at Bela Palanka, and this morning it begins while I am eating breakfast and continues a drenching downpour for over an hour. While waiting to see what the weather is coming to, I wander around the crooked and mystifying streets, watching the animated scenes about the bazaars and try my best to pick up some knowledge of the value of the different coins. For I have had to deal with a bewildering mixture of late, and once again there is a complete change. Mejidis, Chediks, Piastres and Paris now take the place of Serb francs, Bulgar francs and a bewildering list of nickel and copper pieces down to one that I should think would scarcely purchase a wooden toothpick. The first named is a large silver coin worth four and a half francs. The Sherik might be called a quarter dollar, while Piastres and Paras are tokens. The former about five cents and the latter requiring about nine to make one cent. There are no copper coins in Turkey proper. The smaller coins being what is called metallic money, a composition of copper and silver, varying in value from a five para piece to five piastres. The Adrianopolitans, drawn to the hotel by the magnetism of the bicycle, are bound to see me ride whether or no, and in their quite natural ignorance of its character, they request me to perform in the small, roughly paved courtyard of the hotel, and all sorts of impossible places. I shake my head in disapproval and explanation of the impracticability of granting their request. But unfortunately, Adrianopol is within the circle where a shake of the head is understood to mean yes, certainly. And the happy crowd range around a ridiculously small space and smiling approvingly at what they consider my willingness to oblige, motion for me to come ahead. An explanation seems really out of the question after this, and I conclude that the quickest and simplest way of satisfying everybody is to demonstrate my willingness by mounting and wobbling along, if only for a few paces, which I accordingly do beneath a hack shed, at the imminent risk of knocking my brains out against beams and rafters. At eleven o'clock I decide to make a start, I and the bicycle being the focus of attraction for a most undignified mob as I trundle through the muddy streets toward the suburbs. Arriving at a street where it is possible to mount and ride for a short distance, I do this in the hope of satisfying the curiosity of the crowd, and being permitted to leave the city in comparative peace and privacy. But the hope proves a vain one, for only the respectable portion of the crowd disperses, leaving me, solitary and alone, among a howling mob of the rag, tag and bobtail of Adrian Paul, who follow noisily along, vociferously yelling for me to bean, bean, mount, mount, and choo, choo, ride, ride, along the really unrideable streets. This is the worst crowd I have encountered on the entire journey across two continents. And arriving at a street where the prospect ahead looks comparatively promising, I mount and wheel forward with a view of outdistancing them if possible. But a ride of over a hundred yards without dismounting would be an exceptional performance in Adrianopol after a rain, and I soon find that I have made a mistake in attempting it. For as I mount, the mob grows fairly wild and riotous with excitement, flinging their red fezes at the wheels, rushing up behind and giving the bicycle smart pushes forward in their eagerness to see it go faster, and more than one stone comes bounding along the street, wantonly flung by some young savage unable to contain himself. I quickly decide upon allaying the excitement by dismounting and trundling until the mobs get tired of following, whatever the distance. This movement scarcely meets with the approval of the unruly crowd, however, and several come forward and exhibit ten para pieces as an inducement for me to ride again, while overgrown gramins swarm around me and straddling the middle and index finger of their right hands over the left to illustrate and emphasize their meaning, they clamorously cry, Bean, bean, choo, choo, monsieur, choo, choo, as well as much other persuasive talk which if one could understand would probably be found to mean in substance that although it is the time-honoured custom and privilege of Adrianopol mobs to fling stones and similar compliments at such unbelievers from the outer world as come among them in a conspicuous manner, they will considerately forego their privileges this time, if I will only bean-bean and choo-choo. The aspect of harmless mischievousness that would characterize a crowd of occidental youths on a similar occasion is entirely wanting here their faces wearing the determined expression of people in dead earnest about grasping the only opportunity of a lifetime. Respectable Turks stand on the sidewalk and eye the bicycle curiously, but they regard my evident annoyance at being followed by a mob like this with supreme indifference, as does also a passing gendarme whom I halt and motion my disapproval of the proceedings. 
Like the civilians, he pays no sort of attention, but fixes a curious stare on the bicycle and asks something, the import of which will to me forever remain a mystery. Once well out of the city, the road is quite good for several kilometres, and I am favoured with a unanimous outburst of approval from a rough crowd at a suburban mehana, because of outdistancing a horseman who rides out from among them to overtake me. At Adrianople, my road leaves the Maritza Valley and leads across the undulating uplands of the Adrianople Plains, hilly and for most of the way of inferior surface. Reaching the village of Hafsa soon after noon, I am fairly taken possession of by a crowd of turbaned and fezzed Hafsaites, and soldiers wearing the coarse blue uniform of the Turkish regulars, and given not one moment's escape from Bean Bean, until I consent to parade my modest capabilities with the wheel by going back and forth along a rideable section of the main street. The population is delighted. Solid old Turks pat me on the back approvingly, and the proprietor of the Mehana fairly hauls me and the bicycle into his establishment. This person is quite befuddled with mastic, which makes him inclined to be tyrannical and officious, and several times within the hour, while I wait for the never-failing thunder shower to subside, he peremptorily dismisses both civilians and military out of the Mehana yard. But the crowd always filters back again in less than two minutes. Once, while eating dinner, I look out of the window and find the bicycle has disappeared. Hurrying out, I meet the boozy proprietor and another individual, making their way with alarming unsteadiness up a steep stairway, carrying the machine between them to an upstairs room, where the people will have no possible chance of seeing it. Two minutes afterward, his same whimsical and capricious disposition impels him to politely remove the eatables from before me, and with the manners of a showman, he gently leads me away from the table and requests me to ride again for the benefit of the very crowd he had, but two minutes since arbitrarily deny the privilege of even looking at the bicycle. Nothing would be more natural than to refuse to ride under these circumstances. But the crowd looks so gratified the, at the proprietor's sudden and unaccountable change of front, that I deem it advisable, in the interest of being permitted to finish my meal in peace, to take another short spin. Moreover, it is always best to swallow such little annoyances in good part. End of recording. Recording by Sudeshna Section 20 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Sudeshna Around the World on a Bicycle Volume 1 by Thomas Stevens Chapter 8 Part 3 My route today is a continuation of the abandoned macadam road, the weed-covered stones of which I have frequently found acceptable in tiding me over places where the ordinary dirt road was deep with mud. In spite of its long-neglected condition, occasional rideable stretches are encountered, but every bridge and culvert has been destroyed and an honest shepherd not far from Hafsa, who from a neighbouring knoll observes me wheeling down a long declivity toward one of those uncovered waterways, nearly shouts himself hoarse, and gesticulates most frantically in an effort to attract my attention to the danger ahead. Soon after this I am the innocent cause of two small pack-mules, heavily laden with merchandise, attempting to bolt from their driver, who is walking behind. One of them actually succeeds in escaping, and although his pack is too heavy to admit of running at any speed, he goes awkwardly jogging across the rolling plains, as though uncertain in his own mind of whether he is acting sensibly or not. But his companion in pack slavery is less fortunate, since he tumbles into a gully, bringing up flat on his broad and top-heavy pack, with his legs frantically pawing the air. Stopping to assist the driver in getting the collapsed mule on his feet again, this individual demands damages for the accident. So I judge at least from the frequency of the word Majedi as he angrily yet ruefully points to the mud-begrimed pack and unhappy, yet withal laughter-provoking, attitude of the mule. But I utterly fail to see any reasonable connection between the uncalled for scariness of his mules and the contents of my pocket-book especially since I was riding along the Sultan's ancient and deserted macadam, while he and his mules were patronising a separate and distinct dirt road alongside, 
as he seems far more concerned about obtaining a money satisfaction from me than the rescue of the mule from his topsy-turvy position, I feel perfectly justified after several times indicating my willingness to assist him in leaving him and proceeding on my way. The Adyanopol plains are a dreary expanse of undulating grazing land, traversed by small sloughs and their adjacent cultivated areas. Along this route it is without trees and the villages one comes to at intervals of eight or ten miles are shapeless clusters of mud, straw hashed hearts, out of the midst of which, perchance, arises the tapering minaret of a small mosque, this minaret being, of course, the first indication of a village in the distance. Between Adrianopol and Eskibaba, the town I reach for the night, are three villages, in one of which I approach a Turkish private house for a drink of water and surprise the women with faces unveiled. Upon seeing my countenance peering in the doorway, they one and all give utterance to little screams of dismay, and dart like frightened fawns into an adjoining room. When the men appear to see what is up, they show no signs of resentment at my abrupt intrusion, but one of them follows the women into the room, and loud angry words seem to indicate that they are being soundly berated for allowing themselves to be thus caught. This does not prevent the women from reappearing the next minute, however, with their faces veiled behind the orthodox yashmak, and through its one permissible opening satisfying the feminine curiosity, critically surveying me and my strange vehicle. Four men follow me on horseback out of this village, presumably to see what use I make of the machine. At least I cannot otherwise account for the honour of their unpleasantly close attentions close inasmuch as they keep their horses' noses almost against my back, in spite of sundry subterfuges to shake them off. When I stop they do likewise, and when I start again they deliberately follow, altogether too near to be comfortable. They are, all four, rough-looking peasants, and their object is quite unaccountable, unless they are doing it for pure cussedness, or perhaps with some vague idea of provoking me into doing something that would offer them the excuse of attacking and robbing me. The road is sufficiently lonely to invite some such attention. If they are only following me to see what I do with the bicycle, they return but little enlightened, since they see nothing but trundling and an occasional scraping off of mud. At the end of about two miles, whatever their object, they give it up. Several showers occur during the afternoon, and the distance travelled has been short and unsatisfactory, when just before dark I arrive at Eskibaba, where I am agreeably surprised to find a mehana the proprietor of which is a reasonably mannered individual. Since getting into Turkey proper, reasonably mannered people have seemed wonderfully scarce, the majority seeming to be most boisterous and headstrong. Next to the bicycle, the Turks of these interior villages seem to exercise their minds the most concerning whether I have a passport. As I enter Eskibaba, a gendarme standing at the police barrack gates shouts after me to halt and produce passport Exhibiting my passport at almost every village is getting monotonous, and as I am going to remain here at least overnight, I ignore the gendarme's challenge and wheel on to the mehana. Two gendarmes are soon on the spot, inquiring if I have a passport, but upon learning that I am going no farther today, they do not take the trouble to examine it. The average Turkish official religiously believing in never doing anything today that can be put off till tomorrow. The natives of a Turkish interior village are not over-intimate with newspapers, and are, in consequence, profoundly ignorant, having little conception of anything save what they have been familiar with and surrounded by all their lives, and the appearance of the bicycle is indeed a strange visitation, something entirely beyond their comprehension. The mehana is crowded by a wildly gesticulating and loudly commenting and arguing crowd of Turks and Christians all the evening. Although there seems to be quite a large proportion of native unbelievers in Eskibaba, there is not a single female visible on the streets this evening, and from observations next day I judge it to be a conservative Muslim village, where the Turkish women, besides keeping themselves veiled with orthodox strictness, seldom go abroad, and the women who are not Mohammedan, imbibing something of the retiring spirit of the dominant race, also keep themselves well in the background. A round score of dogs, great and small, and in all possible conditions of miserableness, congregate in the main street of Eskibaba at eventide, waiting with hungry-eyed expectancy for any morsel of food or offal that may peradventure find its way within their reach. 
The Turks, to their credit be it said, never abuse dogs, but every male Christian in Eskibaba seems to consider himself in duty bound to kick or throw a stone at one, and scarcely a minute passes during the whole evening without the yelp of some unfortunate cur. These people seem to enjoy a dog's sufferings, and one soulless peasant who in the course of the evening kicks a half-starved cur so savagely that the poor animal goes into a fit, and after staggering and rolling all over the street falls down as though really dead, is the hero of admiring comments from the crowd, who watch the creature's sufferings with delight. Seeing who can get the most telling kicks at the dogs seems to be the regular evening's pastime among the male population of Eskibaba unbelievers. And everybody seems interested and delighted when some unfortunate animal comes in for an unusually severe visitation. A rush mat on the floor of the stable is my bed tonight, with a dozen unlikely-looking natives, to avoid the close companionship, of whom I take up my position in dangerous proximity to a donkey's hind legs, and not six feet from where the same animal's progeny is stretched out with all the abandon of extreme youth. Precious little sleep is obtained, for fleas innumerable take liberties with my person. A flourishing colony of swallows inhabiting the roof keeps up an incessant twittering, and toward daylight two muezzins, one on the minaret of each of the two mosques nearby, begin calling the faithful to prayer and howling, Allah, Allah, with the voices of men bent on conscientiously doing the duty by making themselves heard by every Mussulman for at least a mile around, robbing me of even the short hour of repose that usually follows a sleepless night. It is raining heavily again on Sunday morning. In fact, the last week has been about the rainiest that I ever saw outside of England, and considering the state of the road south of Eskibaba, the prospects look favourable for a Sunday's experience in an interior Turkish village. Men are solemnly squatting around the benches of the Mehana, smoking nargiles and sipping tiny cups of thick black coffee, and they look on in wonder while I devour a substantial breakfast. But whether it is the novelty of seeing a cycler feed, or the novelty of seeing anybody eat as I am doing, thus early in the morning, I am unable to say. For no one else seems to partake of much solid food until about noontide. All the morning long people swarming around are importuning me with, Bean, 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 monsieur. The bicycle is locked up in a rear chamber, and thrice I accommodatingly fetch it out and endeavour to appease their curiosity by riding along a hundred-yard stretch of smooth road in the rear of the Mehana. But their importunities never for a moment cease. Finally, the annoyance becomes so unbearable that the proprietor takes pity on my harassed head, and after talking quite angrily to the crowd, locks me up in the same room with the bicycle. Iron bars guard the rear windows of the houses at Eskibaba, and ere I am fairly stretched out, my mat several swarthy faces appear at the bars, and several voices simultaneously join in the dread chorus of Bean, 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 monsieur, bean, bean, compelling me to close in the middle of a hot day, the rain having ceased about ten o'clock, the one small avenue of ventilation in the stuffy little room. A moment's privacy is entirely out of the question, for even with the window closed, faces are constantly peering in, eager to catch even the smallest glimpse of either me or the bicycle. Fate is also against me today plainly enough, for ere I have been imprisoned in the room an hour, the door is unlocked to admit the mulazim, lieutenant of gendarmes, and two of his subordinates with long cavalry swords dangling about the legs after the manner of the Turkish police. In addition to puzzling the sluggish brains about my passport, my strange means of locomotion, and my affairs generally, they have now, it seems, exercised their minds up to the point that they ought to interfere in the matter of my revolver. But first of all, they want to see my wonderful performance of riding a thing that cannot stand alone. After I have favoured the gendarmes and the assembled crowd by riding once again, they return the compliment by tenderly escorting me down to police headquarters, where, after spending an hour or so in examining my passport, they place that document and my revolver in their strong box, and lackadaisically wave me adieu. Upon returning to the Mehana, I find a corpulent pasha and a number of particularly influential Turks awaiting my reappearance, with the same diabolical object of asking me to be in bean. Soon afterward come the two Mohammedan priests with the same request, and certainly not less than half a dozen times during the afternoon do I bring out the bicycle and ride, 
in deference to the insatiable curiosity of the sure enough unspeakable Turk. And every separate time my audience consists not only of the people personally making the request, but of the whole gesticulating male population. The proprietor of the Mehana kindly takes upon himself the office of apprising me when my visitors are people of importance, by going through the pantomime of swelling his features and form up to a size corresponding in proportion relative to their importance. The process of inflation, in the case of the Pasha, being quite a wonderful performance for a man who is not a professional contortionist. Once during the afternoon I attempt to write, but I might as well attempt to fly for the Mehana is crowded with people who plainly have not the slightest conception of the proprieties. Finally a fez is wantonly flung by an extra enterprising youth at my ink bottle, knocking it over, and but for its being a handy contrivance out of which the ink will not spill, it would have made a mess of my notes. Seeing the uselessness of trying to write, I meander forth, and into the leading mosque, and without removing my shoes, tread its sacred floor for several minutes, and stand listening to several devout Muslims reciting the Quran aloud. For be it known, the great fast of Ramadan has begun, and fasting and prayer is now the faithful Muslims' daily lot for thirty days, his religion forbidding him either eating or drinking from early morn till close of day. After looking about the interior, I ascend the steep spiral stairway up to the minaret balcony, whence the muezzin calls the faithful to prayer five times a day. As I pop my head out through the little opening leading to the balcony, I am slightly taken aback by finding that small footway already occupied by the muezzin, and it is a fair question as to whether the muezzin's astonishment at seeing my white helmet appear through the opening is greater or mine at finding him already in possession. However, I brazen it out by joining him, and he, like a sensible man, goes about his business just the same, as if nobody were about. The people down in the streets look curiously up and call one another's attention to the unaccustomed sight of a white-helmeted cycler and a muezzin upon the minaret together. But the fact that I am not interfered with in any way goes far to prove that the Muslim fanaticism that we have all heard and read about so often has well nigh flickered out in European Turkey. Moreover, I think the Eskibabans would allow me to do anything in order to place me under obligations to be in bean whenever they ask me. At nine o'clock I begin to grow a trifle uneasy about the fate of my passport and revolver, and proceeding to the police barracks formally demand their return. Nothing has apparently been done concerning either one or the other since they were taken from me for the mulazim who is lounging on a divan smoking cigarettes produces them from the same receptacle he consigned them to this afternoon and lays them before him clearly as mystified and perplexed as ever about what he ought to do i explain to him that i wish to depart in the morning and gendarmes are dispatched to summon several leading eskibabans for consultation in the hope that some of them or all of them put together might perchance arrive at a satisfactory conclusion concerning me the great trouble appears to be that, while I got the passport wised at Sofia and Philippopolis, I overlooked Adrianople, and the Eskibaba officials, being in the vilayet of the latter city, are naturally puzzled to account for this omission. And from what I can gather of their conversation, some are advocating sending me back to Adrianople, a suggestion that I straight away announced my disapproval of by again and again calling their attention to the wise of the Turkish Consul General in London and giving them to understand, with much emphasis, that this wise answers for every part of Turkey, including the Vilayet of Adrianople. The question then arises as to whether that has anything to do with my carrying a revolver, to which I candidly reply that it has not, at the same time pointing out that I have just come through Serbia and Bulgaria, countries in which the Turks consider it quite necessary to go armed, though in fact there is quite as much, if not more, necessity for arms in Turkey, and that I have come through both Mustafa Pasha and Adrianopol without being molested on account of the revolver, all of which only seems to mystify them the more and make them more puzzled than ever about what to do. Finally, a brilliant idea occurs to one of them, being nothing less than to shift the weight of the dreadful responsibility upon the authoritative shoulders of a visiting Pasha, an important personage who arrived in Eskibaba by carriage about two hours ago, and whose arrival I remember caused quite a flurry of excitement among the natives. The Pasha is found surrounded by a number of bearded Turks, seated cross-legged on a carpet in the open air, smoking narglays and cigarettes, and sipping coffee. 
this pasha is fatter and more unwieldy if possible than the one for whose edification i rode the bicycle this afternoon noticing which all hopes of being created a pasha upon my arrival at constantinople naturally vanish for evidently one of the chief qualifications for a pasha lik is obesity a distinction to which continuous cycling in hot weather is hardly conducive the pasha seems a good-natured person after the manner of fat people generally and straight away bids me be seated on the carpet and orders coffee and cigarettes to be placed at my disposal while he examines my case in imitation of those around me i make an effort to sit cross-legged on the mat but the position is so uncomfortable that i'm quickly compelled to change it and i fancy detecting a merry twinkle in the eye of more than one silent observer at my inability to adapt my posture to the custom of the country i scarcely think the pasha knows anything more about what sort of a looking document an english passport ought to be than does the mulazim and the leading citizens of eski baba but he goes through the farce of critically examining the vice of the turkish consul general in london while another turk holds his lighted cigarette close to it and blows from it a feeble glimmer of light plainly the pasha cannot make anything more out of it than the others for many a turkish pasha is unable to sign his own name intelligibly using a seal instead but probably with a view of favorably impressing those around him he asks me first if i am an english man and then if i am a baron doubtless thinking that an english baron is a person occupying a somewhat similar position in english society to that of a pasha in turkish that is a really despotic sway over the people of his district for although there are law and lawyers in turkey today the pasha especially in country districts is still an all powerful person practically doing as he pleases to the first question i return an affirmative answer the latter i pretend not to comprehend but i cannot help smiling at the question and the manner in which it is put seeing which the pasha and his friends smile in response and look knowingly at each other as though thinking ah he is a baron but don't intend to let us know it whether this self-arrived decision influences things in my favor i hardly know but anyhow he tosses me my passport and orders the mulazim to return my revolver and as i mentally remark the rather jolly expression of the pasha's face i am inclined to think that instead of treating the matter with the ridiculous importance attached to it by the mulazim and the other people he regards the whole affair in the light of a few minutes acceptable diversion the pasha arrived too late this evening at eski baba to see the bicycle will i allow a gendarme to go to the mehana and bring it for his inspection i will go and fetch it myself i explain and in ten minutes the fat pasha and his friends are examining the perfect mechanism of an american bicycle by the light of an american kerosene lamp which has been provided in the meantime some of the onlookers who have seen me ride today suggested to the pasha that i been been and the pasha smiles approvingly at the suggestion but by pantomime i explained to him the impossibility of riding owing to the nature of the ground and the darkness and am really quite surprised at the readiness with which he comprehends and accepts the situation the pasha is very likely possessed of more intelligence than i have been giving him credit for anyhow he has in ten minutes proved himself equal to the situation which the mulazim and several prominent eski babans have puzzled their collective brains over for an hour in vain and after he has inspected the bicycle and resumed his cross-legged position on the carpet i doff my helmet to him and those about him and return to the mehana well satisfied with the turn affairs have taken end of section recording by sudeshna section 21 of around the world on a bicycle volume 1 this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1, by Thomas Stevens. Chapter 9 Part 1 Through European Turkey On Monday morning I am again awakened by the muezzin calling the Muslims to their early morning devotions and arising from my mat at five o'clock i mount and speed away southward from eski baba not less than a hundred people have collected to see the wonderful performance again all pretense of road-making seems to have been abandoned or what is more probable has never been seriously attempted 
the visible roadways from village to village being mere ox-wagon and pack-donkey tracks, crossing the wheat-fields and uncultivated tracts in any direction. The soil is a loose black loam, which the rain converts into mud, through which I have to trundle, wooden scraper in hand. I not infrequently have to carry the bicycle through the worst places. The morning is sultry, requiring good roads and a breeze-creating pace for agreeable going. Harvesting and threshing are going forward briskly, but the busy hum of the self-binder and the threshing machine is not heard. The reaping is done with rude hooks, and the threshing, by dragging round and round with horses or oxen, sleigh-runner-shaped broad boards, roughed with flints or iron points, making the surface resemble a huge rasp. Large gangs of rough-looking Armenians, Arabs, and Africans are harvesting the broad acres of land-owning pashas, the gangs sometimes counting not less than fifty men. Several donkeys are always observed picketed near them, taken wherever they go for the purpose of carrying provisions and water. Whenever I happen anywhere near one of these gangs, they all come charging across the field, reaping hooks in hand, racing with each other, and good-naturedly howling defiance to competitors. A band of Zulus charging down on a fellow and brandishing their assegais could scarcely present a more ferocious front. Many of them wear no covering of any kind on the upper part of the body, no hat, no footgear, nothing but a pair of loose, baggy trousers, while the tidiest man among them would be immediately arrested on general principles in either England or America. Rough though they are, they appear for the most part to be good-natured fellows, and although they sometimes emphasize their importunities of bin-bin by flourishing their reaping-hooks threateningly over my head, and one gang actually confiscates the bicycle, which they lay up on a shock of wheat, and with much flourishing of reaping-hooks as they return to their labors, warn me not to take it away. These are simply good-natured pranks, such as large gangs of laborers are wont to occasionally indulge in the world over. Streams have to be forded to-day for the first time in Europe, several small creeks during the afternoon, and near sundown I find my pathway into a village where I propose stopping for the night, obstructed by a creek swollen bank full by a heavy thunder-shower in the hills. A couple of lads on the opposite bank volunteer much information concerning the depth of the creek at different points. No doubt their evident mystification at not being understood is equaled only by the amazement at my answers. Four peasants come down to the creek, and one of them kindly wades in and shows that it is only waste deep. Without more ado, I ford it, with the bicycle on my shoulder, and straightway seek the accommodation of the village Mehana. The village is a miserable little cluster of mud hovels, and the best the Mehana affords is the coarsest of black bread and a small salted fish about the size of a sardine, which the natives devour without any pretense of cooking, but which are worse than nothing for me, since the farther they are away, the better I am suited. Sticking a flat loaf of black bread and a dozen of these tiny shapes of salted nothing in his broad waistband, the Turkish peasant sallies forth contentedly to toil. I have accomplished the wonderful distance of forty kilometers to-day, at which I am really quite surprised, considering everything. The usual daily weather program has been faithfully carried out. A heavy mist at morning that has prevented any drying up of roads during the night, three hours of oppressive heat from nine till twelve, during which myriads of ravenous flies squabble for the honor of drawing your blood, and then, when the mud begins to dry out sufficient to justify my dispensing with the wooden scraper, thunder-showers begin to bestow their unappreciated favor upon the roads, making them well-nigh impassable again. The following morning the climax of vexation is reached, when, after wading through the mud for two hours, I discover that I have been dragging, carrying, and trundling my laborious way along in the wrong direction for Chorlu, which is not over thirty-five kilometers from my starting point, but it takes me till four o'clock to reach there. A hundred miles on French or English roads would not have been so fatiguing, and I wisely take advantage of being in a town where comparatively decent accommodations are obtainable to make up so far as possible for this morning's breakfast of black bread and coffee, and my noontide meal of cold, cheerless reflections on the same. The same program of bin, bin, from importuning crowds, and police inquisitiveness concerning my passport, are endured and survived, but I spread myself upon my mat to-night thoroughly convinced that a month's cycling among the Turks would worry most people into premature graves. I am now approaching pretty close to the Sea of Marmora, and next morning I am agreeably surprised to find sandy roads, which the rains have rather improved than otherwise and although much is unridably heavy, it is immeasurably superior to yesterday's mud. I pass the country residence of a wealthy pasha, and see the ladies of his harem seated in the meadow hard by, enjoying the fresh morning air. 
they form a circle facing inward, and the swarthy eunuch in charge stands keeping watch at a respectful distance. I carry a pocket full of bread with me this morning, and about nine o'clock, upon coming to a ruined mosque and a few deserted buildings, I approach one at which signs of occupation are visible for some water. This place is simply a deserted Mussulman village, from which the inhabitants probably decamped in a body during the last Russo-Turkish war. The mosque is in a tumble-down condition, the few dwelling-houses remaining are in the last stages of dilapidation, and the one I call at is temporarily occupied by some shepherds, two of whom are regaling themselves with food of some kind out of an earthenware vessel. Obtaining the water, I sit down on some projecting boards to eat my frugal lunch, fully conscious of being an object of much furtive speculation on the part of the two occupants of the deserted house which however fails to strike me as anything extraordinary since these attentions have long since become an ordinary everyday affair not even the sulky and rather hang-dog expression of the men which failed not to escape my observation at my first approach awakened any shadow of suspicion in my mind of their being possibly dangerous characters although the appearance of the place itself is really sufficient to make one hesitate about venturing near and upon sober afterthought I am fully satisfied that this is a resort of a certain class of disreputable characters, half shepherds, half brigands, who are only kept from turning full-fledged freebooters by a wholesome fear of retributive justice. While I am discussing my bread and water, one of these worthies saunters with assumed carelessness up behind me and makes a grab for my revolver, the butt of which he sees protruding from the holster. Although I am not exactly anticipating this movement, travelling alone among strange people makes one's faculties of self-preservation almost mechanically on the alert, and my hand reaches the revolver before his does. Springing up, I turn round and confront him and his companion, who is standing in the doorway. A full exposition of their character is plainly stamped on their faces, and for a moment I am almost tempted to use the revolver on them. Whether they become afraid of this, or whether they have urgent business of some nature, will never be known to me, but they both disappear inside the door, and in view of my uncertainty of their future intentions, I consider it advisable to meander on toward the coast. Ere I get beyond the wastelands adjoining this village, I encounter two more of these shepherds in charge of a small flock. They are watering their sheep, and as I go over to the spring, ostensibly to obtain a drink, but really to have a look at them, they both sneak off at my approach, like criminals avoiding one whom they suspect of being a detective. Take it all in all, I am satisfied that this neighbourhood is a place that I have been unfortunate in coming through in broad daylight. By moonlight it might have furnished a far more interesting item than the above. An hour after, I am gratified at obtaining my first glimpse of the Sea of Marmora off to the right, and in another hour I am disporting in the warm, clear surf a luxury that has not been within my reach since leaving Dieppe, and which is a thrice-welcome privilege in this land, where the usual ablutions at Mahanas consist of pouring water on the hands from a tin cup. The beach is composed of sand and tiny shells, the warm surf waves are clear as crystal, and my first plunge in the Marmora after a two-month cycle tour across a continent is the most thoroughly enjoyable bath I ever had. Notwithstanding, I feel it my duty to keep a loose eye on some shepherds perched on a handy knoll, who look as if half inclined to slip down and examine my clothes. The clothes, with of course the revolver and every penny I have with me, are almost as near to them as to me, and always after ducking my head under water, my first care is to take a precautionary glance in their direction. Cursed is the mind that nurses suspicion, someone has said, but under the circumstances almost anybody would be suspicious. These shepherds along the Marmora coast favour each other a great deal, and when a person has been the recipient of undesirable attention from one of them, to look askance at the next one met with comes natural enough. Over the undulating cliffs and along the sandy beach my road now leads through the pretty little seaport of Silivria toward Constantinople, traversing a most lovely stretch of country, where waving wheat-fields hug the beach and fairly coquette with the waves and the slopes are green and beautiful with vineyards and fig-gardens, while away beyond the glassy shimmer of the sea I fancy I can trace on the southern horizon the inequalities of the hills of Asia Minor. Greek fishing-boats are plying hither and thither. One noble sailing vessel, with all sails set, is slowly ploughing her way down toward the Dodanelles, probably a grain-ship from the Black Sea, and the smoke from a couple of steamers is discernible in the distance. Flourishing Greek fishing villages and vine-growing communities occupy this beautiful strip of coast, along which the Greeks seem determined to make the cross as much more conspicuous than the crescent as possible, by rearing it on every public building under their control, and not infrequently on private ones as well. 
The people of these Greek villages seem possessed of sunny dispositions, the absence of all reserve among the women being in striking contrast to the demeanour of the Turkish fair sex. These Greek women chatter after me from the windows as I wheel past, and if I stop a minute in the street they gather around by dozens, smiling pleasantly and plying me with questions, which of course I cannot understand. Some of them are quite handsome, and nearly all have perfect white teeth, a fact that I have ample opportunity of knowing, since they seem to be all smiles. There has been much making of artificial highways leading from Constantinople, in this direction, in ages past. A roadbed of huge blocks of stone, such as some of the streets of eastern towns are made impassable with, is traceable for miles, ascending and descending the rolling hills, imperishable witnesses of the wide difference in eastern and western ideas of making a road. These are probably the work of the people who occupied this country before the Ottoman Turks, who have also tried their hands at making a macadam, which not infrequently runs close alongside the old block roadway, and sometimes crosses it, and it is matter of some wonderment that the Turks, instead of hauling material for their road from a distance, did not save expense by merely breaking the stones of the old causeway and using the same roadbed. Twice to-day I have been required to produce my passport, and when, toward evening, I pass through a small village, the lone gendarme, who is smoking a nargila in front of the Mahana, where I halt, points to my revolver and demands, Passaporte. I waive examination, so to speak, by arguing the case with him, and by the not always unhandy plan of pretending not exactly to comprehend his meaning. Passaporte, passaporte, gendarmerie me, replies the officer, authoritatively, in answer to my explanation of a voyager being privileged to carry a revolver, while several villagers who have gathered around us interpose, Bin, bin, monsieur, bin, bin. I have little notion of yielding up either revolver or passport to this village gendarme, for much of their officiousness is simply the disposition to show off their authority, and satisfy their own personal curiosity regarding me, to say nothing of the possibility of coming in for a little bakshish. The villagers are worrying me to bin bin at the same time the gendarme is worrying me about the revolver and passport, and knowing from previous experience that the gendarme would never stop me from mounting, being quite as anxious to witness the performance as the villagers, I quickly decide upon killing two birds with one stone, and accordingly mount and pick my way along the rough street out on to the Constantinople road. The gloaming settles into darkness, and the domes and minarets of Stamboul, which have been visible from the brow of every hill for several miles back, are still eight or ten miles away, and rightly judging that the Ottoman capital is a most bewildering city for a stranger to penetrate at night. I pillow my head on a sheaf of oats, within sight of the goal toward which I have been peddling for some two thousand five hundred miles since leaving Liverpool. After surveying with a good deal of satisfaction the twinkling lights that distinguish every minaret in Constantinople each night during the fast of Ramadan, I fall asleep and enjoy beneath a sky in which myriads of far-off lamps seem to be twinkling mockingly at the Ramadan illuminations, the finest night's repose I have had for a week. Nothing but the prevailing rains have prevented me from sleeping beneath the starry dome, entirely in preference to putting up at the village Mehanas. En route into Stamboul, on the following morning, I meet the first train of camels I have yet encountered. In the grey of the morning, with the scenes around so thoroughly oriental, it seems like an appropriate introduction to Asiatic life. Eight o'clock finds me inside the line of earthworks thrown up by Baker Pasha when the Russians were last knocking at the gates of Constantinople, and ere long I am trundling through the crooked streets of the Turkish capital toward the bridge which connects Stamboul with Galata and Pera. Even here my ears are assailed with the eternal importunities to bin, bin, the officers collecting the bridge toll even joining in the request. To accommodate them I mount and ride part way across the bridge and at nine o'clock on July the 2nd, just two calendar months from the start at Liverpool, I am eating my breakfast in a Constantinople restaurant. I am not long in finding English-speaking friends, to whom my journey across the two continents is not unknown, and who kindly direct me to the Chamber of Commerce Hotel, Ue Omar Galata, a home-like establishment kept by an English lady. I have been purposing of late to remain in Constantinople during the heated term of July and August, thinking to shape my course southward through Asia Minor and down the Euphrates Valley to Baghdad, and by taking a south-easterly direction as far as circumstances would permit into India, keep pace with the seasons, thus avoiding the necessity of remaining over anywhere for the winter. At the same time I have been reckoning upon meeting Englishmen in Constantinople, who, having travelled extensively in Asia, could further enlighten me regarding the best route to India. 
As I house my bicycle and am shown to my room, I take a retrospective glance across Europe and America, and feel almost as if I have arrived at the halfway house of my journey. The distance from Liverpool to Constantinople is fully 2,500 miles, which brings the wheeling distance from San Francisco up to something over 6,000. So far as the distance wheeled and to be wheeled is concerned, it is not far from halfway, but the real difficulties of the journey are still ahead, although I scarcely anticipate any that time and perseverance will not overcome. My tour across Europe has been, on the whole, a delightful journey, and although my linguistic shortcomings have made it rather awkward in interior places where no English-speaking person was to be found, I always managed to make myself understood sufficiently to get along. In the interior of Turkey a knowledge of French has been considered indispensable to a traveller, but although a full knowledge of that language would have made matters much smoother by enabling me to converse with officials and others, I have nevertheless come through all right without it, and there have doubtless been occasions when my ignorance has saved me from a certain amount of bother with the gendarmerie, who, above all things, dislike to exercise their thinking apparatus. A Turkish official is far less indisposed to act than he is to think. His mental faculties work sluggishly, but his actions are governed largely by the impulse of the moment. Someone has said that to see Constantinople is to see the entire East, and judging from the different costumes and peoples one meets on the streets and in the bazaars, the saying is certainly not far amiss. From its geographical situation, as well as from its history, Constantinople naturally takes the front rank among the cosmopolitan cities of the world, and the crowds thronging its busy thoroughfares embrace every condition of man between the kid-gloved exquisite without a wrinkle in his clothes and the representative of half-savage Central Asian states encased in sheepskin garments of rudest pattern. The great fast of Ramadan is under full headway, and all true Mussulmans neither eat nor drink a particle of anything throughout the day, until the booming of cannon at eight in the evening announces that the fast is ended, when the scene quickly changes into a general rush for eatables and drink. Between eight and nine o'clock in the evening during Ramadan, certain streets and bazaars present their liveliest appearance, and from the highest class restaurant patronized by Bey and Pasha to the vendors of eatables on the streets, all do a rushing business. Even the mjis, water vendors, who, with leather water bottles and a couple of tumblers, wait on thirsty pedestrians with pure drinking water at five paras a glass, dodge about among the crowds announcing themselves with lusty lung, fully alive to the opportunities of the moment. A few of the coffee-houses provide music of an inferior quality, Constantinople not being a very musical place. A forenoon hour spent in a neighborhood of private residences will repay a stranger for his trouble, since he will during that time see a bewildering assortment of street vendors, from a peregrinating meat market, with a complete stock dangling from a wooden framework attached to a horse's back, to a grimy individual worrying along beneath a small mountain of charcoal, and each with cries more or less musical. The sidewalks of Constantinople are ridiculously narrow, their only practical use being to keep vehicles from running into the merchandise of the shopkeepers, and to give pedestrians plenty of exercise in jostling each other, and hopping on and off the curbstone to avoid inconveniencing the ladies, who of course are not to be jostled either off the sidewalk or into a sidewalk stock of miscellaneous merchandise. The Constantinople sidewalk is anybody's territory. The merchant encumbers it with his wares, and the coffee-houses with chairs for customers to sit on, the rights of pedestrians being altogether ignored. The natural consequence is that these latter fill the streets, and the Constantinople Jehu not only has to keep his wits about him to avoid running over men and dogs, but has to use his lungs continually, shouting at them to clear the way. If a seat is taken in one of the coffee-house chairs, a watchful waiter instantly makes his appearance with a tray containing small chunks of a pasty sweetmeat, known in England as Turkish Delight, one of which you are expected to take and pay half a piaster for, this being a polite way of obtaining payment for the privilege of using the chair. The coffee is served steaming hot in tiny cups holding about two tablespoons full, the price varying from ten paras upward, according to the grade of the establishment. A favorite way of passing the evening is to sit in front of one of these establishments, watching the passing throngs, and smoke a nargile, this latter requiring a good half-hour to do it properly. I undertook to investigate the amount of enjoyment contained in a nargile one evening, and before smoking it half through, concluded that the taste has to be cultivated. One of the most inconvenient things about Constantinople is the great scarcity of small change. 
Everybody seems to be short of fractional money, save the money-changers people, who are here a genuine necessity, since one often has to patronize them before making the most trifling purchase. Oft-times the storekeeper will refuse point-blank to sell an article when change is required, solely on account of his inability or unwillingness to supply it. After drinking a cup of coffee, I have had the kahuaji refuse to take any payment rather than change a cherik. Inquiring the reason for this scarcity, I am informed that whenever there is an any new output of this money, the noble army of money-changers, by a liberal and judicious application of bakshish, manage to get a corner on the lot and compel the general public, for whose benefit it is ostensibly issued, to obtain what they require through them. However this may be, they manage to control its circulation to a great extent, for while their glass cases display an overflowing plenitude, even the fruit vendor, whose transactions are mainly of ten and twenty paras, is not infrequently compelled to lose a customer because of his inability to make change. There are not less than twenty money-changers' offices within a hundred yards of the Galata end of the principal bridge spanning the Golden Horn, and certainly not a less number on the Stambul side. The money-changer usually occupies a portion of the frontage of a cigarette and tobacco stand, and, on all the business streets, one happens at frequent intervals upon these little glass cases full of bowls and heaps of miscellaneous coins varying in value. Behind sits a business-looking person, usually a Jew, jingling a handful of mejedis, and expectantly eyeing every approaching stranger. The usual percentage charged is, for changing a lira, eighty paras, thirty paras for a mejedi, and ten for a cherik, the percentage on this latter coin being about five per cent. Some idea of the inconvenience to the public of this state of affairs can be better imagined by the American by reflecting that if this state of affairs existed in Boston, he would frequently have to walk around the block and give a money-changer five per cent for changing a dollar before venturing upon the purchase of a dish of baked beans. If one offers a coin of the larger denominations in payment of an article, even in quite imposing establishments, they look as black over it as though you were trying to palm off a counterfeit, and hand back the change with an ungraciousness and an evident reluctance that makes a sensitive person feel as though he has in some way been unwittingly guilty of a mean action. Even the principal streets of Constantinople are but indifferently lighted at night, and save for the feeble glimmer of kerosene lamps in front of stores and coffee-houses, the by-streets are in darkness. Small parties of Turkish women are encountered picking their way along the streets of Galata in charge of a male attendant, who walks a little way behind, if of the better class, or without the attendant in the case of poorer people, carrying small Japanese lanterns. Sometimes a lantern will go out, or doesn't burn satisfactorily, and the whole party halts in the middle of the perhaps crowded thoroughfare, and clusters around until the lantern is adjusted. The Turkish lady walks with a slouchy gait, her shroud-like abbas, adding not a little to the ungracefulness. Matters are likewise scarcely to be improved by wearing two pairs of shoes, the large slipper-like overshoes being required by etiquette to be left on the mat upon entering the house she is visiting and in the case of a strictly orthodox Mussulman lady, and doubtless we may also easily imagine, in case of a not over-prepossessing countenance, the yashmak hides all but the eyes. The eyes of many Turkish ladies are large and beautiful, and peep from behind the white, gauzy folds of the yashmak, with an effect upon the observant frank not unlike coquettishly ogling from behind a fan. Handsome young Turkish ladies with a leaning toward Western ideas are no doubt coming to understand this, for many are nowadays met on the street wearing yashmaks that are but a single thickness of transparent gauze that obscures never a feature, at the same time producing the decidedly interesting and taking effect above mentioned. It is readily seen that the wearing of yashmaks must be quite a charitable custom in the case of a lady not blessed with a handsome face, since it enables her to appear in public the equal of her more favored sister in commanding whatever homage is to be derived from that mystery which is said to be the woman's greatest charm, and if she has but the one redeeming feature of a beautiful pair of eyes, the advantage is obvious. In street-cars, steamboats, and all public conveyances, board or canvas partitions wall off a small compartment for the exclusive use of ladies, where, hidden from the rude gaze of the frank, the Turkish lady can remove her yashmak and smoke cigarettes. End of section Section 22 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1, by Thomas Stevens. Chapter 9, Part 2, Through European Turkey. On Sunday, July 12th, in company with an Englishman in the Turkish Artillery Service, I paid my first visit to Asian soil, taking a kike across the Bosphorus to Kadikoi, one of the many delightful seaside resorts within easy distance of Constantinople. Many objects of interest are pointed out as propelled by a couple of swarthy, half-naked kaike jees. The sharp-proud kaike gallantly rides the blue waves of this loveliest of all pieces of land environed water. More than once I have noticed that a firm belief in the supernatural has an abiding hold upon the average Turkish mind, having frequently, during my usual evening promenade through the Galata streets, noted the expression of deep and genuine earnestness upon the countenances of fez-crowned citizens giving respectful audience to Arab fortune-tellers, paying twenty para pieces for the revelations he is favouring them with, and handing over the coins with the business-like air of people satisfied that they are getting its full equivalent. Consequently, I am not much astonished when, rounding Seraglio Point, my companion calls my attention to several sections of whalebone suspended on the wall facing the water, and tells me that they are placed there by the fishermen, who believe them to be a talisman of no small efficacy in keeping the Bosphorus well supplied with fish. They, firmly adhering to the story that once, when the bones were removed, the fish nearly all disappeared. The oars used by the Kaik Jis are of quite a peculiar shape. The oar shaft immediately next the handhold swells into a bulbous affair for the next eighteen inches, which is at least four times the circumference of the remainder, and the end of the oar blade is for some reason made swallow-tailed. The object of the enlarged portion, which of course comes inside the rowlocks, appears to be the double purpose of balancing the weight of the longer portion outside, and also for preventing the oar at all times from escaping into the water. The rowlock is simply a rawhide loop, kept well greased, and as, toward the end of every stroke, the kayak G leans back to his work, the oar slips several inches, causing a considerable loss of power. The day is warm, the broiling sun shines directly down on the bare heads of the kayak G's, and causes the perspiration to roll off their swarthy faces in large beads, but they lay back to their work manfully although from early morning until cannon roar at eight p.m. neither bite nor sup nor even so much water as to moisten the end of their parched tongues will pass their lips. For, although but poor, hard-working kaik jis, they are true Mussulmans. Pointing skyward from the summit of the hill, back of Seraglio Point, are the four tapering minarets of the world-renowned St. Sophia Mosque, and a little farther to the left is the Sultana Ahmet Mosque the only mosque in all Mohammedanism with six minarets. Nearby is the old Seraglio Palace, or rather what is left of it, built by Mohammed II in 1469 out of materials from the ancient Byzantine palaces, and in a department of which the Sanjiak Sharif, holy standard, borda e sharif holy mantle, and other venerated relics of the Prophet Mohammed are preserved. To this place, on the 15th of Ramadan, the sultan and leading dignitaries of the empire repair to do homage to the holy relics, upon which it would be the highest sacrilege for Christian eyes to gaze. The hem of this holy mantle is reverently kissed by the sultan and the few leading personages present, after which the spot thus brought in contact with human lips is carefully wiped with an embroidered napkin dipped in a golden basin of water. The water used in this ceremony is then supposed to be of priceless value as a purifier of sin, and is carefully preserved and corked up in tiny phials, is distributed among the sultanas, grand dignitaries, and prominent people of the realm, who in return make valuable presents to the lucky messengers and Mussulman ecclesiastics employed in its distribution. This precious liquid is doled out drop by drop, as though it were nectar of eternal life received direct from heaven and mixed with other water, is drunk immediately upon breaking fast each evening during the remaining fifteen days of Ramadan. Arriving at Kadikoi, the opportunity presents of observing something of the high-handed manner in which Turkish pashas are wont to expect from inferiors their every whim obeyed. We meet a friend of my companion, a pasha, who for the remainder of the afternoon makes one of our company. Unfortunately for a few other persons, the pasha is in a whimsical mood to-day, and inclined to display, for our benefit, rather arbitrary authority toward others. The first individual coming under his immediate notice is a young man torturing a harp. 
Summoning the musician, the Pasha summarily orders him to play Yankee Doodle. The writer arrived in Constantinople with the full impression that it was the Mosque of St. Sophia that has the famous six minarets, having, I am quite sure, seen it thus quite frequently accredited in print, and I mention this especially in order that readers who may have been similarly misinformed may know that the above account is the correct one does not know it, and humbly begs the Pasha to name something more familiar. Yankee Doodle, replies the Pasha peremptorily. The poor man looks as though he would willingly relinquish all hopes of the future, if only some present avenue of escape would offer itself. But nothing of the kind seems at all likely. The musician appeals to my Turkish-speaking friend, and begs him to request me to favor him with the tune. I am, of course, only too glad to help him stem the rising tide of the Pasha's wrath by whistling the tune for him, and after a certain amount of preliminary twanging, he strikes up and manages to blunder through Yankee Doodle. The Pasha, after ascertaining from me that the performance is creditable, considering the circumstances, forthwith hands him more money than he would collect among the poorer patrons of the place in two hours. Soon a company of five strolling acrobats and conjurers happens along, and these, likewise, are summoned into the presence, and ordered to proceed. Many of the conjurers' tricks are quite creditable performances, but the Pasha occasionally interferes in the proceedings just in the nick of time, to prevent the prestidigitator finishing his manipulations, much to the Pasha's delight. Once, however, he cleverly manages to hoodwink the Pasha, and executes his trick in spite of the latter's interference, which so amuses the Pasha that he straightway gives him a majedi. Our return boat to Galata starts at seven o'clock, and it is a ten minutes' drive down to the landing. At fifteen minutes to seven, the Pasha calls for a public carriage to take us down to the steamer. There are no carriages, Pasha Effendi. Those three are all engaged by ladies and gentlemen in the garden, exclaims the waiter respectfully. Engaged or not engaged, I want that open carriage yonder, replies the Pasha authoritatively, and already beginning to show signs of impatience. Boxhana, hi, you there. Drive around here, addressing the driver. The driver enters a plea of being already engaged. The Pasha's temper rises to the point of threatening to throw carriage, horses, and driver into the Bosphorus if his demands are not instantly complied with. Finally the driver and everybody else interested collapse completely, and entering the carriage we are driven to our destination without another murmur. Subsequently I learned that a government officer, whether a Pasha or of lower rank, has the power of taking arbitrary possession of a public conveyance over the head of a civilian so that our pasha was, after all, only sticking up for the rights of himself and my friend of the artillery, who likewise wears the mark by which a military man is, in Turkey, always distinguishable from a civilian, a longer string to the tassel of his fez. This is the last day of Ramadan, and the following Monday ushers in the three days' feast of Biaram, which is, in substance, a kind of general carousal to compensate for the rigid self-denial of the thirty days' fasting and prayer just ended. The government offices and works are still closed, everybody is wearing new clothes, and holiday-making engrosses the public attention. A friend proposes a trip on a Bosphorus steamer up as far as the entrance to the Black Sea. The steamers are profusely decorated with gay-colored flags, and at certain hours all warships anchored in the Bosphorus as well as the forts and arsenals fire salutes, the roar and rattle of the great guns echoing among the hills of Europe and Asia, that here confront each other with but a thousand yards of dancing blue waters between them. All along either lovely shore, villages and splendid country seats of wealthy pashas and Constantinople merchants dot the verdure-clad slopes. Two white marble kiosks of the Sultan are pointed out. The old castles of Europe and Asia face each other on opposite sides of the narrow channel. They were famous fortresses in their day, but save as interesting relics of a bygone age, they are no longer of any use. At Therapia are the summer residences of the different ambassadors, the English and the French, the most conspicuous. The extensive grounds of the former are most beautifully terraced, and evidently fit for the residence of royalty itself. Happy indeed is the Constantinopolitan, whose income commands a summer villa in Therapia, or at any of the many desirable locations in plain view within this earthly paradise of blue waves and sunny slopes, and a yacht in which to wing his flight whenever and wherever fancy bids him go. In the glitter and glare of the midday sun the scene along the Bosphorus is lovely, yet its loveliness is plainly of the earth, but as we return cityward in the eventide the dusky shadows of the gloaming settle over everything. 
As we gradually approach, the city seems half hidden behind a vaporous veil, as though, in imitation of thousands of its fair occupants, it were hiding its comeliness behind the yashmak, the scores of tapering minarets and the towers, and the masts of the crowded shipping of all nations rise above the mist, and line with delicate tracery the western sky, already painted in richest colors by the setting sun. On Saturday morning, July 18th, the sound of martial music announces the arrival of the soldiers from Stamboul, to guard the streets through which the sultan will pass on his way to a certain mosque to perform some ceremony in connection with the feast just over. At the designated place I find the streets already lined with Circassian cavalry and Ethiopian zouaves, the latter in red and blue zouave costumes and immense turbans. Mounted gendarmes are driving civilians about, first in one direction and then in another, to try and get the streets cleared occasionally fetching some unlucky white in the threadbare shirt of the galata plebe, a stinging cut across the shoulders with short rawhide whips, a glaring injustice that elicits not the slightest adverse criticism from the spectators, and nothing but silent contortions of face and body from the individual receiving the attention. I finally obtain a good place, where nothing but an open plank fence and a narrow plot of ground, thinly set with shrubbery, intervenes between me and the street leading from the palace. In a few minutes the approach of the sultan is announced by the appearance of half a dozen Circassian outriders, who dash wildly down the streets, one behind the other, mounted on splendid dapple-gray chargers. Then come four close carriages containing the sultan's mother and leading ladies of the imperial harem, and a minute later appears a mounted guard, two abreast, keen-eyed fellows riding slowly, and critically eyeing everybody and everything as they proceed. Behind them comes a gorgeously arrayed individual in a perfect blaze of gold braid and decorations, and close behind him follows the sultan's carriage, surrounded by a small crowd of pedestrians and horsemen, who buzz around the imperial carriage like bees near a hive, the pedestrians especially dodging about hither and thither, hopping nimbly over fences, crossing gardens, etc., keeping pace with the carriage meanwhile as though determined upon ferreting out and destroying anything in the shape of danger that may possibly be lurking along the route. My object of seeing the sultan's face is gained, but it is only a momentary glimpse, for besides the horsemen flitting around the carriage, an officer suddenly appears in front of my position and unrolls a broad scroll of paper with something printed on it, which he holds up. Whatever the scroll is, or the object of its display may be, the sultan bows his acknowledgments either to the scroll or to the officer holding it up. Ere I am in the Ottoman capital a week, I have the opportunity of witnessing a fire, and the workings of the Constantinople Fire Department. While walking along Tramway Street, a hue and cry of Yangunvar, Yangunvar, there is fire, there is fire, is raised and three barefooted men dressed in the scantiest linen clothes come charging pell-mell through the crowded streets, flourishing long brass hose-nozzles to clear the way. Behind them comes a crowd of about twenty others similarly dressed, four of whom are bearing on their shoulders a primitive wooden pump, while others are carrying leathern water-buckets. They are trotting along at quite a lively pace, shouting and making much unnecessary commotion, and lastly comes their chief on horseback cantering close at their heels, as though to keep the men well up to their pace. The crowds of pedestrians, who refrained from following after the firemen, and who scurried for the sidewalks at their approach, now resume their place in the middle of the street, but again the wild cry of Yangunvar resounds along the narrow street, and the same scene of citizens scuttling to the sidewalks and a hurrying friar brigade followed by a noisy crowd of gamins is enacted over again, as another and yet another of these primitive organizations go scooting swiftly past. It is said that these nimble-footed firemen do almost miraculous work, considering the material they have at command, an assertion which I think is not at all unlikely. But the wonder is that the destructive fires are not much more frequent when the fire department is evidently so inefficient. In addition to the regular police force and fire department there is a system of night watchmen, called Bekjis, who walk their respective beats throughout the night, carrying staves heavily shod with iron, with which they pound the flagstones with a resounding thwack. Owing to the hilliness of the city and the roughness of the streets, much of the carrying business of the city is done by Hamals, a class of sturdy-limbed men who, I am told, are mostly Armenians. They wear a sort of pack-saddle and carry loads the mere sight of which makes the average westerner groan. For carrying such trifles as crates and hogsheads of crockery and glassware, and puncheons of rum, 
four hamels join strength at the ends of two stout poles. Scarcely less marvellous than the weights they carry is the apparent ease with which they balanced the tremendous loads, piled high up above them, it being no infrequent sight to see a stalwart hamel with a veritable Saratoga trunk for size, on his back, with several smaller trunks and valises piled above it, making his way down Step Street, which is as much as many pedestrians can do to descend without carrying anything. One of these hamals, meandering along the street with six or seven hundred pounds of merchandise on his back, has the legal right, to say nothing of the evident moral right, to knock over any unloaded citizen who too tardily yields the way. From observations made on the spot, one cannot help thinking that there is no law in any country to be compared to this one, for Simon pure justice between man and man. These are most assuredly the strongest-backed and hardest-working men I have seen anywhere. They are remarkably trustworthy and sure-footed, and their chief ambition, I am told, is to save sufficient money to return to the mountains and valleys of their native Armenia, where most of them have wives patiently awaiting their coming, and purchase a piece of land upon which to spend their declining years in ease and independence. Far different is the daily lot of another habitué of the streets of this busy capital. Large, pugnacious-looking rams, that occupy pretty much the same position in Turkish sporting circles that thoroughbred bulldogs do in England, being kept by young Turks solely on account of their combative propensities and the facilities thereby afforded for gambling on the prowess of their favorite animals. At all hours of the day and evening the Constantinople sport may be met on the streets, leading his woolly pet tenderly with a string, often carrying something in his hand to coax the ram along. The wool of these animals is frequently clipped to give them a fanciful aspect, the favorite clip being to produce a lion-like appearance, and they are always carefully guarded against the fell influence of the evil eye by a circlet of blue beads and pendant charms suspended from the neck. This latter precautionary measure is not confined to these hard-headed contestants of, for the championship of Galata, Para, and Stambul, however, but grace the necks of a goodly proportion of all animals met on the streets, notably the saddle ponies, whose services are offered on certain street corners to the public. Occasionally one notices among the busy throngs a person wearing a turban of dark green, this distinguishing mark being the sole privilege of persons who have made the pilgrimage to Mecca. All true Mussulmans are supposed to make this pilgrimage some time during their lives, either in person or by employing a substitute to go in their stead. Wealthy pashas, sometimes paying quite large sums to some imam or other holy person to go as their proxy, for the holier the substitute, the greater is supposed to be the benefit to the person sending him. Other persons are seen with turbans of a lighter shade of green than the returned Mecca pilgrims. These are people related in some way to the reigning sovereign. Constantinople has its peculiar attractions at the great centre of the Mohammedan world, as represented in the person of the Sultan, and during the five hundred years of the Ottoman dominion here, almost every Sultan and great personage has left behind some interesting reminder of the times in which he lived, and the wonderful possibilities of unlimited wealth and power. A stranger will scarcely show himself upon the streets ere he is discovered and accosted by a guide. From long experience these men can readily distinguish a new arrival, and they seldom make a mistake regarding his nationality. Their usual mode of self-introduction is to approach him, and ask if he is looking for the American consulate or the English post-office, as the case may be, and if the stranger replies in the affirmative, to offer to show the way. Nothing is mentioned about charges, and the uninitiated new arrival naturally wonders what kind of a place he has got into when upon offering what his experience in western countries has taught him to consider a most liberal recompense, the guide shrugs his shoulders and tells you that he had guided a gentleman the same distance yesterday, and the gentleman gave, usually about double what you are offering, no matter whether it be one cherik or half a dozen. An afternoon ramble with a guide through Stambul embraces the Museum of Antiquities, the St. Sophia Mosque, the Costume Museum, the Thousand and One Columns, the Tomb of Sultan Mahmud, the world-renowned Stambul Bazaar, the Pigeon Mosque, the Saraka Tower, and the tomb of Sultan Suleiman I. Passing over the Museum of Antiquities, which to the average observer is very similar to a dozen other institutions of the kind, the visitor very naturally approaches the portals of the St. Sophia Mosque, with expectations enlivened by having already read wondrous accounts of its magnificence and unapproachable grandeur. But, let one's fancy riot as it will, there is small fear of being disappointed in the finest mosque in Constantinople. At the door one either has to take off his shoes and go inside in stocking feet, or, in addition to the entrance fee of two cheriks, bakshish the attendant for the use of a pair of overslippers. 
people with holes in their socks and young men wearing boots three sizes too small are the legitimate prey of the slipper man, since the average human would yield up almost his last piaster rather than promenade around in St. Sophia with his big toe protruding through his footgear like a mud turtle's head, or run the risk of having to be hauled barefoot to his hotel in a hack, from the impossibility of putting his boots on again. Devout Mussulmans are bowing their foreheads down to the mat-covered floor in a dozen different parts of the mosque as we enter. Tired-looking pilgrims from a distance are curled up in cool corners, happy in the privilege of peacefully slumbering in the holy atmosphere of the great edifice they have perhaps travelled hundreds of miles to see. A dozen half-naked youngsters are clambering about the railings and otherwise disporting themselves after the manner of unrestrained juveniles everywhere, free to gamble about to their heart's content, providing they abstain from making a noise that would interfere with devotions. Upon the marvellous mosaic ceiling of the great dome is a figure of the Virgin Mary, which the Turks have frequently tried to cover up by painting it over, but paint as often as they will the figure will not be concealed. On one of the upper galleries are the gate of heaven and the gate of hell, the former of which the Turks once tried their best to destroy, but every arm that ventured to raise a tool against it instantly became paralyzed, when the would-be destroyers naturally gave up the job. In giving the readers these facts, I earnestly request them not to credit them to my personal account, for although earnestly believed in by a certain class of Christian natives here, I would prefer the responsibility for their truthfulness to rest on the broad shoulders of tradition rather than on mine. The Turks never call the attention of visitors to these reminders of the religion of the infidels who built the structure, at such an enormous outlay of money and labor, little dreaming that it would become one of the chief glories of the Mohammedan world but the doorkeeper who follows visitors around never neglects to point out the shape of a human hand on the wall too high up to be closely examined and volunteer the intelligence that it is the imprint of the hand of the first sultan who visited the mosque after the occupation of constantinople by the osmanlis perhaps however the mussulman in thus discriminating between the traditions of the greek residents and the alleged handmark of the first sultan is actuated by a laudable desire to be truthful so far as possible for there is nothing improbable about the story of the handmark, inasmuch as a hole chipped in the masonry, an application of cement, and a pressure of the sultan's hand against it before it hardened, give at once something for visitors to look at through future centuries, and shake their heads incredulously about. Not the least of the attractions are two monster wax candles, which, notwithstanding their lighting up at innumerable fasts and feasts, for the guide does not know how many years past, are still eight feet long by four in circumference, but more wonderful than the monster wax candles, the brass tomb of Constantine's daughter, set in the wall over one of the massive doors, the Sultan's handmark, the figure of the Virgin Mary, and the green columns brought from Baalbek. Above everything else is the wonderful mosaic work. The mighty dome and the whole vast ceiling are mosaic work in which tiny squares of blue, green, and gold crystal are made to work out patterns. The squares used are tiny particles having not over a quarter-inch surface, and the amount of labor and the expense in covering the vast ceiling of this tremendous structure with incomputable myriads of these small particles fairly stagger any attempt at comprehension. End of section 22. Section 23 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1, by Thomas Stevens. Chapter 9, Part 3, Through European Turkey. An interesting hour can be spent in the costume museum, where life-size figures represent the varied and most decidedly picturesque costumes of the different officials of the Ottoman capital in previous ages, the Janizaries, and natives of the different provinces. Some of the headgear in vogue at Constantinople before the Fez were tremendous affairs, but the Fez is certainly a step too far in the opposite direction, being several degrees more uncomfortable than nothing in the broiling sun. The Fez makes no pretense of shading the eyes, and excludes every particle of air from the scalp. The thousand and one columns are in an ancient Greek reservoir that formerly supplied all Stamboul with water. The columns number but three hundred and thirty-four in reality, but each column is in three parts, and by stretching the point we have the fanciful thousand and one. 
the reservoir is reached by descending a flight of stone steps. It is filled in with earth up to the upper half of the second tier of columns, so that the lower tier is buried altogether. This filling up was done in the days of the Janizaries, as it was found that those frisky warriors were carrying their well-known theory of the right being might and the devil take the weakest, to the extent of robbing unprotected people who ventured to pass this vicinity after dark, and then consigning them to the dark depths of the deserted reservoir. The reservoir is now occupied during the day by a number of Jewish silk weavers, who work here on account of the dampness and coolness being beneficial to the silk. The tomb of Mahmud is next visited on the way to the bazaar. The several coffins of the Sultan Mahmud and his sultana and princesses are surrounded by massive railings of pure silver. Monster wax candles are standing at the head and foot of each coffin, in curiously wrought candlesticks of solid silver that must weigh a hundred pounds each at least. Ranged around the room are silver caskets, inlaid with mother-of-pearl, in which rare illumined copies of the Koran are carefully kept, the attendant who opened one for my inspection using a silk pocket-handkerchief to turn the leaves. The Stamboul Bazaar well deserves its renown, since there is nothing else of its kind in the whole world to compare it with. Its labyrinth of little stalls and shops, if joined together in one straight line, would extend for miles, and a whole day might be spent quite profitably in wandering around, watching the busy scenes of bargaining and manufacturing. Here, in this bewildering maze of buying and selling, the peculiar life of the Orient can be seen to perfection. The mysterious veiled lady of the East is seen thronging the narrow traffic-ways and seated in every stall. Water vendors and vendors of carapuces, watermelons, and a score of different eatables are meandering through. Here, if your guide be an honest fellow, he can pilot you into stuffy little holes of full of antique articles of every description, where genuine bargains can be picked up. Or if he be dishonest, and in league with equally dishonest tricksters, whose places are antiquaries only in name, he can lead you where everything is basest imitation. In the former case, if anything is purchased, he comes in for a small and not undeserved commission from the shopkeeper, and in the latter for perhaps as much as thirty per cent. I am told that one of these guides, when escorting a party of tourists with plenty of money to spend, and no knowledge whatever of the real value or genuineness of antique articles, often makes as much as ten or fifteen pounds sterling a day commission. On the way from the bazaar we call at the Pigeon Mosque, so called, on account of being the resort of thousands of pigeons, that have become quite tame from being constantly fed by visitors and surrounded by human beings. A woman has charge of a store of seeds and grain, and visitors purchase a handful for ten paras, and throw to the pigeons, who flock around fearlessly in the general scramble for the food. At any hour of the day Muslim ladies may be seen here feeding the pigeons for the amusement of their children. From the Pigeon Mosque we ascend the Saraka Tower, the great watch-tower of Sambul, from the summit of which the news of a fire in any part of the city is signalled, by suspending huge framework balls covered with canvas from the ends of projecting poles in the day and lights at night. Constant watch and ward is kept over the city below by men snugly housed in quarters near the summit, who, in addition to their duties as watchmen, turn an honest cherik, occasionally by supplying cups of coffee to visitors. No fairer sight ever greeted human vision than the prospect from the tower of Saraka. Stamboul, Galata, Pera, and Scutari, with every suburban village and resort for many a mile around, can be seen to perfection from the commanding height of Saraka Tower. The guide can here point out every building of interest in Stamboul, the broad area of roof beneath which the busy scenes of Stamboul Bazaar are enacted from day to day, the great Persian Khan, the different mosques, the Sultan's palaces at Pera, the imperial kiosks up the Bosphorus, the old Grecian aqueduct along which the water for supplying the great reservoir of the thousand and one columns used to be conducted, the old city walls, and scores of other interesting objects too numerous to mention here. On the opposite hill, across the Golden Horn, Galata Watchtower points skyward above the mosques and houses of Galata and Pera. The two bridges, connecting Stamboul and Galata, are seen thronged with busy traffic. A forest of masts and spars is ranged all along the Golden Horn. Steamboats are plying hither and thither across the Bosphorus. The American cruiser Quinnebog rides at anchor opposite the Imperial Waterside Palace. The blue waters of the Sea of Marmora and the Gulf of Ismet are dotted here and there with snowy sails or lined with the smoke of steamships, all combined to make the most lovely panorama imaginable and to which the coastwise hills and more lofty mountains of Asia Minor in the distance form a most appropriate background. 
From this vantage point the guide will not neglect wetting the curiosity of his charge for more sightseeing by pointing out everything that he imagines would be interesting. He points out a hill above Scutari, whence, he says, a splendid view can be had of all Asia Minor, and we could walk there and back in half a day, or go quicker with horses or donkeys. He reminds you that tomorrow is the day for the howling dervishes in Scutari, and tells you that by starting at one we can walk out to the English cemetery and return to Scutari in time for the howling dervishes at four o'clock, and manages altogether to get his employer interested in a program, which, if carried out, would guarantee him employment for the next week. On the way back to Galata we visit the tomb of Suleiman I, the most magnificent tomb in Stamboul. Here, before the coffins of Suleiman I, Suleiman II, and his brother Ahmed, are monster wax candles that have stood sentry here for three hundred and fifty years, and the mosaic dome of the beautiful edifice is studded with what are popularly believed to be genuine diamonds, that twinkle down on the curiously gazing visitor like stars from a miniature heaven. The attendant tells the guide, in answer to an inquiry from me, that no one living knows whether they are genuine diamonds or not. For never since the day it was finished, over three centuries and a half ago, has any one been permitted to go up and examine them. The edifice was so perfectly and solidly built in the beginning that no repairs of any kind have ever been necessary, and it looks almost like a new building today. Not being able to spare the time for visiting all the objects of interest enumerated by the guide, I elect to see the howling dervishes as the most interesting among them. Accordingly, we take the ferry-boat across to Scutari on Thursday afternoon, in time to visit the English cemetery, before the dervishes begin their peculiar services. We pass through one of the largest Mussulman cemeteries of Constantinople, a bewildering area of tombstones beneath a grove of dark cypresses, so crowded and disorderly that the oldest gravestones seem to have been pushed down or on one side to make room for others of a later generation, and these again for still others. In happy comparison to the disordered area of crowded tombstones in the Mohammedan graveyard is the English cemetery where the soldiers who died at the Scutari hospital during the Crimean War were buried, and the English residents of Constantinople now bury their dead. The situation of the English cemetery is a charming spot on a sloping bluff washed by the waters of the Bosphorus, where the requiem of the murmuring waves is perpetually sung for the brave fellows interred there. An Englishman has charge and after being in Turkey a month it is really quite refreshing to visit this cemetery, and note the scrupulous neatness of the grounds. The keeper must be industry personified, for he scarcely permits a dead leaf to escape his notice, and the four angels beaming down upon the grounds from the national monument erected by England in memory of the Crimean heroes, were they real visitors from the better land, could doubtless give a good account of his stewardship. The howling dervishes have already begun to howl as we open the portals leading into their place of worship by the influence of a cherik placed in the open palm of a sable eunuch at the door. But it is only the overture, for it is half an hour later when the interesting part of the program begins. The first hour seems to be devoted to preliminary meditations and comparatively quiet ceremonies, but the cruel-looking instruments of self-flagellation hanging on the wall, and a choice and a complete assortment of drums and other noise-producing but unmelodious instruments, remind the visitor that he is in the presence of a peculiar people. Sheepskin mats almost cover the floor of the room, which is kept scrupulously clean, presumably to guard against the worshippers soiling their lips whenever they kiss the floor a ceremony which they perform quite frequently during the first hour, and every one who presumes to tread within that holy precinct removes his overshoes if he is wearing any, otherwise he enters in his stockings. At five o'clock the excitement begins. Thirty or forty men are ranged around one end of the room, bowing themselves about most violently, and keeping time to the movements of their bodies with shouts of Allah, Allah, and then branching off into a howling chorus of Mussulman supplications. That unintelligible as they are to the infidel ear, are not altogether devoid of melody in the expression, the Turkish language abounding in words in which there is a world of mellifluousness. A dancing dervish, who has been patiently awaiting at the inner gate, now receives a nod of permission from the priest, and after laying aside an outer garment, waltzes nimbly into the room, and straight away begins spinning round like a ballet dancer in Italian opera, his arms extended, his long skirt forming a complete circle around him as he revolves and his eyes fixed with a determined gaze into vacancy. 
Among the howlers is a negro, who is six feet three at least, not in his socks, but in the finest pair of undershoes in the room, and whether it be in the ceremony of kissing the floor, knocking foreheads against the same, kissing the hand of the priest, or in the howling in bodily contortions, this towering son of Ham performs his part with a grace that brings him conspicuously to the fore in this respect. But as the contortions gradually become more violent, and the cry of Allah Akbar, Allah Hai, degenerates into violent grunts of ho a hu hu the half-exhausted devotees fling aside everything but a white shroud, and the perspiration fairly streams off them from such violent exercise in the hot weather and close atmosphere of the small room. The exercises make rapid inroads upon the tall negro's powers of endurance, and he steps to one side and takes a breathing spell of five minutes, after which he resumes his place again, and in spite of the ever-increasing violence of both lung and muscular exercise, and the extra exertion imposed by his great height, he keeps it up heroically to the end. For twenty-five minutes by my watch, the one lone dancing dervish, who appears to be a visitor merely, but is accorded the brotherly privilege of whirling round in silence while the others howl, spins round and round like a tireless top, making not the slightest sound, spinning in a long, persevering, continuous whirl, as though determined to prove himself holier than the howlers by spinning longer than they can keep up their howling, a fair test of fanatical endurance, so to speak. One cannot help admiring the religious fervor and determination of purpose that impel this lone figure silently around on his axis for twenty-five minutes, at a speed that would upset the equilibrium of anybody but a dancing dervish in thirty seconds. And there is something really heroic in the manner in which he at last suddenly stops, and without uttering a sound or betraying any sense of dizziness whatever from the exercise, puts on his coat again and departs in silence conscious, no doubt, of being a holier person than all the howlers put together, even though they are still keeping it up. As unmistakable signals of distress are involuntarily hoisted by the violently exercising devotees, and the weaker ones quietly fall out of line, and the military precision of the twists of body and bobbing and jerking of heads begins to lose something of its regularity, the six encouragers, ranged on sheepskins before the line of howling men, like non-commissioned officers before a squad of new recruits, increase their encouraging cries of Allah, Allah Akbar, as though fearful that the din might subside on account of the several already exhausted organs of articulation, unless they chimed in more lustily and helped to swell the volume. Little children now come trooping in, seeking with eager anticipation the happy privilege of being ranged along the floor like sardines in a tin box, and having the priest walk along their bodies, stepping from one to the other along the row, and returning the same way, while two assistants steady him by holding his hands. In the case of the smaller children, the priest considerately steps on their thighs, to avoid throwing their internal apparatus out of gear. But if the recipient of his holy attentions is, in his estimation, strong enough to run the risk, he steps square on their backs. The little things jump up as sprightly as may be, kiss the priest's hand fervently, and go trooping out of the door, apparently well pleased with the novel performance. Finally, human nature can endure it no longer, and the performance terminates in a long, despairing wail of Allah, Allah. Allah. The exhausted devotees, soaked wet with perspiration, step forward and receive what I take to be a rather inadequate reward for what they have been subjecting themselves to, videcellet, the privilege of kissing the priest's already much kissed hand, and at 5.45 p.m. the performance is over. I take my departure in time to catch the six o'clock boat for Galata, well satisfied with the finest show I ever saw for a cherik. I have already made mention of there being many beautiful seaside places to which Constantinopolitans resort on Sundays and holidays, and among them all there is no lovelier spot than the island of Principo, one of the Prince's Islands group, situated some twelve miles from Constantinople down the Gulf of Ismet. Shelton Bay, Colonel Shelton, an English gentleman who superintends the Sultan's cannon foundry at Tofana, and the well-known author of Shelton's Mechanics Guide, owns the finest steam yacht on the Bosphorus and three Sundays out of the five I remain here, this gentleman and his excellent lady kindly invite me to visit Principo with them for the day. On the way over, we usually race with the regular passenger steamer, and as the bay's yacht is no plaything for size and speed, we generally manage to keep close enough to amuse ourselves with the comments on the beauty and speed of our little craft from the crowded deck of the other boat. Sometimes a very distinguished person or two is aboard the yacht with our little company, personages known to bay, who, having arrived on the passenger-boat, accept invitations for a cruise around the island, or to dine aboard the yacht, as she rides at anchor before the town. 
but the advent of the Americanish velocipedist and his glistening machine, a wonderful thing that Principo never saw the like of before, creates a genuine sensation and becomes the subject of a nine days' wonder. Principo is a delightful gossipy island, occupied during the summer by the families of wealthy Constantinopolitans and leading businessmen, who go to and fro daily between the little island and the city on the passenger boats regularly plying between them, and is visited every Sunday by crowds in search of the health and pleasure afforded by a day's outing. While here at Constantinople I received by mail from America a butcher spoke cyclometer, and on the second visit to Principo I measured the road which has been made around half the island. The distance is four English miles and a fraction. The road was built by refugees employed by the Sultan during the last Russo-Turkish War, and is a very good one. For part of the distance it leads between splendid villas, on the verandas of which are seen groups of the wealth and beauty of the Osmanli capital, Armenians, Greeks, and Turks. The latter ladies sometimes take the privilege of dispensing with the yashmak during their visits to the comparative seclusion of the Prinkipo villas, with quite a sprinkling of English and Europeans. The sort of impression made upon the imaginations of Principo young ladies by the bicycle is apparent from the following comment made by a bevy of them confidentially to Shelton Bay, and kindly written out by him, together with the English interpretation thereof. The Principo ladies' compliment to the first bicycle rider visiting their beautiful island is, O bizdan kaidore, gyurulduzug, em nizalset, sadi bir dakika, ulkum, gyurioros, nazaman, Bir da bakioros obitum gitmush. He glides noiselessly and gracefully past. We see him only for a moment. When we look again, he is quite gone. The men are, of course, less poetical, their ideas running more to the practical side of the possibilities of the new ox rival, and they comment as follows Onum begir hich bir she, yemiori hich bir she, ich miori, inch yorum yori, ma shetan gibi giti ore. His horse, he eats nothing, drinks nothing, never gets tired, and goes like the very devil. It is but fair to add, however, that any bold Occidental, contemplating making a descent on Principo, with a sociable, with a view to delight, moonlight rides with the fair, authors of the above poetic contribution will find himself all at sea upon his arrival unless he brings a three-seated machine, so that the mamma can be accommodated with a seat behind, since the daughters of Principo society never wander forth by moonlight or any other light unless thus accompanied, or by some equally staid and solicitous relative. For the Asiatic tour I have invented a bicycle tent, a handy contrivance by which the bicycle is made to answer the place of tent poles. The material used is fine, strong sheeting that will roll up into a small space, and to make it thoroughly waterproof I have dressed it with boiled linseed oil. My footgear henceforth will be Circassian moccasins, with the pointed toes sticking up like the prow of a Venetian galley. I have had a pair made to order by a native shoemaker in Galata, and for either walking or pedaling they are ahead of any footgear I ever wore. They are as easy as a three-year-old glove, and last indefinitely, and for fancifulness in appearance the shoes of civilization are nowhere. Three days before starting out I received friendly warnings from both the English and American consul that Turkey in Asia is infested with brigands, the former going the length of saying that if he had the power he would refuse me permission to meander forth upon so risky an undertaking. I have every confidence, however, that the bicycle will prove an effectual safeguard against any undue familiarity on the part of these frisky citizens. Since reaching Constantinople, the papers here have published accounts of recent exploits accomplished by brigands near Eskibaba. I have little doubt but that more than one brigand was among my highly interested audiences there on that memorable Sunday. The Turkish authorities seem to have made themselves quite familiar with my intentions, and upon making application for a teskere, Turkish passport, they required me to specify as far as possible the precise route I intend traversing, from Skutari to Ismet, Angora, Erzerum, and beyond to the Persian frontier. An English gentleman who has lately travelled through Persia and the Caucasus tells me that the Persians are quite agreeable people, their only fault being the one common failing of the East, a disposition to charge whatever they think it possible to obtain for anything. The Circassians seem to be the greatest bugbear in Asiatic Turkey. I am told that once I get beyond the country that these people range over, who are regarded as a sort of natural and half-privileged freebooters, I shall be reasonably safe from molestation. It is a common thing in Constantinople when two men are quarrelling for one to threaten to give a Circassian a couple of medjedis to kill the other. 
The Circassian is to Turkey what the mythical bogey is to England. Mothers threaten undutiful daughters, fathers unruly sons, and everybody their enemies generally, with the Circassian, who, however, unlike the bogey of the English household, is a real material presence, popularly understood to be ready for any devilment a person may hire him to do. The bulldog revolver, under the protecting presence of which I have travelled thus far, has to be abandoned here at Constantinople, having proved itself quite a wayward weapon since it came from the gunsmith's hands in Vienna, who seemed to have upset the internal mechanism in some mysterious manner while boring out the chambers a trifle to accommodate European cartridges. My experience thus far is that a revolver has been more ornamental than useful, but I am now about penetrating far different countries to any I have yet traversed. Plenty of excellently finished German imitations of the Smith & Wesson revolver are found in the magazines of Constantinople. But apart from it being the duty of every Englishman or American to discourage, as far as his power goes, the unscrupulousness of German manufacturers in placing upon foreign markets what are, as far as outward appearance goes, the exact counterparts of our own goods, for half the money, a genuine American revolver is a different weapon from its would-be imitators, and I hesitate not to pay the price for the genuine article remembering the narrow escape on several occasions of having the bulldog confiscated by the turkish gendarmerie and having heard moreover in constantinople that the same class of officials in turkey and asia will most assuredly want to confiscate the smith and wesson as a matter of private speculation and enterprise i obtained through the british consul a tascaria giving me special permission to carry a revolver subsequent events however proved this precaution to be unnecessary for a more courteous obliging and gentlemanly set of fellows according to their enlightenment i have never met anywhere than the government officials of asiatic turkey were i to make the simple statement that i am starting into asia with a pair of knee breeches that are worth fourteen english pounds about sixty eight dollars and offer no further explanation i should in all probability be accused of a high order of prevarication nevertheless such is the fact for, among other subterfuges, to outwit possible brigands and kindred citizens, I have made cloth-covered buttons out of Turkish liras, eighteen shillings English, and sewed them on in place of ordinary buttons. Pantaloon buttons at fifty-four dollars a dozen are a luxury that my wildest dreams never soared to before, and I am afraid many a thrifty person will condemn me for extravagance. But the splendor of the Orient demands it, and the extreme handiness of being able to cut off a button, and with it buy provisions enough to load down a mule, would be all the better appreciated if one had just been released from the hands of the Philistines with nothing but his clothes and buttons and the bicycle. With these things left to him, one could afford to regard the whole matter as a joke, expensive perhaps but nevertheless a joke compared with what might have been the constantinople papers have advised me to start on monday august tenth direct from scutari i have received friendly warnings from several constantinople gentlemen that a band of brigands under the leadership of an enterprising chief named mahmoud pelevan operating about thirty miles out of scutari have beyond a doubt received intelligence of this fact from spies here in the city and to avoid running directly into the lion's mouth I decide to make the start from Ismet, about twenty-five miles beyond their rendezvous. A Greek gentleman, who was a British subject, a Mr. J. T. Corpy, whom I have met there, fell into the hands of this same gang, and being known to them as a wealthy gentleman, had to fork over three thousand in ransom, and he says I would be in great danger of molestation in venturing from Scutari to Ismet, after my intention to do so has been published. End of section Section 24 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1, by Thomas Stevens. Chapter 10 The Start Through Asia. In addition to a cycler's ordinary outfit and the before-mentioned small wedge tent, I provide myself with a few extra spokes, a cake of tire cement, and an extra tire for the rear wheel. This latter, together with twenty yards of small stout rope, I wrap snugly around the front axle, the tent and spare underclothing, a box of revolver cartridges, and a small bottle of sewing machine oil are consigned to a luggage carrier behind. While my writing materials, a few medicines, and small sundries find a repository in my White House sole leather case on a Lamson carrier, 
which also accommodates a suit of gossamer rubber. The result of my study of the various routes through Asia is a determination to push on to Teheran, the capital of Persia, and there spend the approaching winter, completing my journey to the Pacific next season. Accordingly, nine o'clock on Monday morning, August 10th, finds me aboard the little Turkish steamer that plies semi-weekly between Izmit and the Ottoman capital, my bicycle as usual, the center of a crowd of wandering Orientals. This Izmit steamer, with its motley crowd of passengers, presents a scene that upholds with more eloquence than words Constantinople's claim of being the most cosmopolitan city in the world and a casual observer, judging only from the evidence aboard the boat, would pronounce it also the most democratic. There appears to be no first, second, or third class. Everybody pays the same fare, and everybody wanders at his own sweet will into every nook and corner of the upper deck, perches himself on top of the paddle boxes, loafs on the pilot's bridge, or reclines among the miscellaneous assortment of freight piled up in a confused heap on the foredeck. In short, everybody seems perfectly free to follow the bent of his inclinations, except to penetrate behind the scenes of the aftmost deck, where, carefully hidden from the rude gaze of the male passengers by a canvas partition, the Moslem ladies have their little world of gossip and coffee and fragrant cigarettes. Every public conveyance in the Orient has this walled-off retreat in which Osmanli fair ones can remove their yashmaks, smoke cigarettes, and comport themselves with as much freedom as though in the seclusion of their apartments at home. Greek and Armenian ladies mingle with the main deck passengers, however the picturesque costumes of the former contributing not a little to the general Oriental effect of the scene. The dress of the Armenian ladies differs but little from Western costumes, and their deportment would wreathe the benign countenance of the Lord Chamberlain with a serene smile of approval. But the minds and inclinations of the gentle Hellenic dames seem to run in rather a contrary channel. Singly, in twos, or in cozy, confidential coteries, arm in arm, they promenade here and there, saying little to each other or to anybody else. By the picturesqueness of their apparel, and their seemingly bold demeanor, they attract to themselves more than their just share of attention. But with well-feigned ignorance of this, they divide most of their time and attention between rolling cigarettes and smoking them. Their heads are bound with jaunty silk handkerchiefs. They wear rakish-looking short jackets, down the back of which their luxuriant black hair dangles in two tresses. But the crowning masterpiece of their costume is that wonderful garment which is neither petticoat nor pantaloons, and which can be most properly described as indescribable, which tends to give the wearer rather an unfeminine appearance, and is not to be compared with the really sensible and not unpicturesque nether garment of a Turkish lady. The male companions of these Greek women are not a bit behind them in the matter of gay colors and startling surprises of the Levantine clothier's art, for they likewise are in all the bravery of holiday attire. There is quite a number of them aboard, and they now appear at their best, for they are going to take part in wedding festivities at one of the little Greek villages that nestle amid the vine-clad slopes along the coast white villages that from the deck of the moving steamer look as though they have been placed here and there by nature's artistic hand for the sole purpose of embellishing the lovely green framework that surrounds the blue waters of the Izmit Gulf. Several of these merrymakers enliven the passing hours with music and dancing, to the delight of a numerous audience, while a second ever-changing but never dispersing audience is gathered around the bicycle. The verbal comments and Solomon-like opinions, given in expressive pantomime of this latter garrulous gathering concerning the machine and myself, I can of course but partly understand, but occasionally some wiseacre suddenly becomes inflated with the idea that he has succeeded in unraveling the knotty problem, and forthwith proceeds to explain, for the edification of his fellow passengers, the modus operandi of writing it supplementing his words by the most extraordinary gestures. 
The audience is usually very attentive and highly interested in these explanations, and may be considerably enlightened by their self-constituted tutors, whose sole advantage over their auditors, so far as bicycles are concerned, consists simply in a belief in the superiority of their own particular powers of penetration. But to the only person aboard the steamer who really does know anything at all about the subject, the chief end of their exposition seems to be gained when they have duly impressed upon the minds of their hearers that the bicycle is to ride on, and that it goes at a rate of speed quite beyond the comprehension of their, the auditor's, minds. Bin, 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 choo, 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 haiti, 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 being repeated with a vehemence that is intended to impress upon them little less than flying Dutchman speed. The deck of a Constantinople steamer affords splendid opportunity for character study, and the Ismit packet is no exception. Nearly every person aboard has some characteristic, peculiar and distinct from any of the others. At intervals of about fifteen minutes, a couple of Armenians, barefooted, bare-legged, and ragged, clamor with much difficulty and scraping of shins over a large pile of empty chicken crates to visit one particular crate. Their collective baggage consists of a thin, half-grown chicken tied by both feet to a small bag of barley, which is to prepare it for the useful but inglorious end of all chickendom. They have imprisoned their unhappy charge in a crate that is most difficult to get at. Why they didn't put it in one of the nearer crates, what their objective is in climbing up to visit it so frequently, and why they always go together, are problems of the naughtiest kind. A far less difficult riddle is the case of a middle-aged man, whose costume and avocation explain nothing save that he is not an Osmanli. He is a passenger homeward bound to one of the coast villages, and he constantly circulates among the crowd with a basket of watermelons, which he has brought aboard on spec to vend among his fellow passengers, hoping thereby to gain sufficient to defray the cost of his passage. Seated on whatever they can find to perch upon, near the canvas partition, all unmoved by the gay and stirring scenes before them, is a group of Mussulman pilgrims from some interior town returning from a pilgrimage to Stamboul, fine-looking Osmanli greybeards, whose haughty reserve not even the bicycle is able to completely overcome, although it proves more efficacious in subduing it and waking them out of their habitual contemplative attitude than anything else aboard. Two of these men are of magnificent physique, their black eyes, rather full lips, and swarthy skins betraying Arab blood. In addition to the long daggers and antiquated pistols so universally worn in the Orient, they are armed with fine, large, pearl-handled revolvers, and they sit cross-legged, smoking cigarette after cigarette in silent meditation, paying no heed even to the merry music and the dancing of the Greeks. At Jalova, the first village the steamer halts at, a couple of Zaptias come aboard with two prisoners whom they are conveying to his mitt. These men are lower-class criminals, and their wretched appearance betrays the utter absence of hygienic considerations on the part of the Turkish prison authorities. They evidently have had no cause to complain of any harsh measures for the enforcement of personal cleanliness. Their footgear consists of pieces of rawhide fastened on with odds and ends of string, and pieces of coarse sacking tacked on to what were once clothes barely sufficed to cover their nakedness. Bareheaded, their bushy hair has not for months felt the smoothing influence of a comb, and their hands and faces look as if they had just endured a seven years' famine of soap and water. This latter feature is a sure sign that they are not Turks, for prisoners are most likely allowed full liberty to keep themselves clean, and a Turk would at least have come out into the world with a clean face. The Zaptias squat down together and smoke cigarettes, and allow their charges full liberty to roam wheresoever they will while on board, and the two prisoners, to all appearance, is perfectly oblivious of their rags, filth, and the degradation of their position, mingle freely with the passengers, and as they move about, asking and answering questions, I look in vain among the latter for any sign of the spirit of social Phariseeism that in a Western crowd would have kept them at a distance. 
Both these men have every appearance of being the lowest of criminals, men capable of any deed in the calendar within their mental and physical capacities. They may even be members of the very gang I am taking this steamer to avoid. But nobody seems to either pity or condemn them. Everybody acts toward them precisely as they act toward each other. Perhaps in no other country in the world does this social and moral apathy obtain among the masses to such a degree as in Turkey. While we lie to for a few minutes to disembark passengers at the village where the before-mentioned wedding festivities are in progress, four of the seven imperturbable Osmanlis actually arise from the one position they have occupied unmoved since coming aboard, and follow me to the foredeck, in order to be present while I explain the workings and mechanism of the bicycle to some Armenian students of Roberts College who can speak a certain amount of English. Having listened to my explanations without understanding a word, and without condescending to question the Armenians, they survey the machine some minutes in silence, and then return to their former positions, their cigarettes and their meditations, paying not the slightest heed to several caique loads of Greek merrymakers who have rowed out to meet the new arrivals and are paddling around the steamer, filling the air with music. Finding that there is someone aboard that can converse with me, the Greeks, desirous of seeing the bicycle in action, and of introducing a novelty into the festivities of the evening, ask me to come ashore and be their guest until the arrival of the next Ismet boat, a matter of three days. Offer declined with thanks, but not without reluctance, for these Greek merrymakings are well worth seeing. The Ismit packet, like everything else in Turkey, moves at a snail's pace, and although we got under way in something less than an hour after the advertised starting time, which for Turkey is quite commendable promptness, and the distance is but fifty-five miles, we call at a number of villages en route, and it is 6 p.m. when we tie up at the Izmit Wharf. Five piasters, Effendi, says the ticket collector, as, after waiting till a crowd has passed the gangplank, I follow with the bicycle and hand him my ticket. What are the five piasters for? I ask. For answer, he points to my wheel. Baggage? I explain. Baggage, yoke, cargo he replies, and I have to pay for it. The fact is that never having seen a bicycle before, he doesn't know whether it is cargo or baggage, but whenever a Turkish official has no precedent to follow, he takes care to be on the right side in case there is any money to be collected. Otherwise he is not apt to be so particular. This is, however, rather a matter of private concern than of zealousness in the performance of his official duties. The possibilities of peculation are ever before him. While satisfying the claim of the ticket collector, a deckhand comes forward, and pointing to the bicycle, blandly asks me for bakshish. He asks not because he has put a finger to the machine, or been asked to do so, but being a thoughtful, far-sighted youth, he is looking out for the future. The bicycle is something he never saw on his boat before but the idea that these things may now become common among the passengers wanders through his mind, and that obtaining bakshish on this particular occasion will establish a precedent that may be very handy hereafter. So he makes a most respectful salam, calls me Bey Effendi, and smilingly requests two piastres bakshish. After him comes the passport officer, who, besides the Tescari for myself, demands a special passport for the machine. He likewise is in a puzzle. It doesn't take much, by the by, to puzzle the brains of a Turkish official, because the bicycle is something he has had no previous dealings with. But as this is a matter in which finances play no legitimate part, though probably his demand for a passport is made for no other purpose than that of getting bakshish, a vigorous protest backed up by the unanimous and most certainly vociferous support of a crowd of wharf loafers and my fellow passengers who having disembarked are waiting patiently for me to come and ride down the street either overrules or overawes the officer and secures my relief 
Impatient at consuming a whole day in reaching Izmit, I have been thinking of taking to the road immediately upon landing, and continuing till dark, taking my chances of reaching some suitable stopping place for the night. But the good people of Izmit raise their voices in protest against what they professedly regard as a rash and dangerous proposition. As I evince a disposition to override their well-meant interference and pull out, they hurriedly send for a Frenchman who can speak sufficient English to make himself intelligible. Speaking for himself, and acting as interpreter and echoing the words and sentiments of the others, the Frenchman straightway warns me not to start into the interior so late in the day, and run the risk of getting benighted in the brush. For much very bad people, very bad people, are between Ismit and Angora. Circassians plenty, he says, adding that the worst characters are near Ismit, and that the nearer I get to Angora, the better I shall find the people. As by this time the sun is already setting behind the hills, I conclude that an early start in the morning will, after all, be the most sensible course. During the last Russo-Turkish War, thousands of Circassian refugees migrated to this part of Asia Minor, having a restless, roving disposition that unfits them for the laborious and uneventful life of a husbandman. Many of them remain, even to the present day, loafers about the villages, maintaining themselves nobody seems to know how. The belief appears to be unanimous, however, that they are capable of any deviltry under the sun and that while their great specialty and favorite occupation is stealing horses, if this becomes slack or unprofitable, or even for the sake of a little pleasant variety, these freebooters from the Caucasus have no hesitation about turning highwaymen whenever a tempting occasion offers. All sorts of advice about the best way to avoid being robbed is volunteered by the people of Izmit. My watch chain... L.A.W. badge, and everything that appears of any value, they tell me, must be kept strictly out of sight, so as not to excite the latent cupidity of such Circassians as I meet on the road or in the villages. Some advocate the plan of adorning my coat with Turkish official buttons, shoulder straps, and trappings to make myself look like a government officer. Others think it would be best to rig myself up as a full-blown Zeptia with whom, of course, neither Circassian nor any other guilty person would attempt to interfere. To these latter suggestions I point out that while they are very good, especially the Saplia's idea, so far as warding off Circassians is concerned, my adoption of a uniform would most certainly get me into hot water with the military authorities of every town and village, owing to my ignorance of the vernacular, and cause me no end of vexatious delay. To this the quick-witted Frenchman replies by at once offering to go with me to the resident Pasha, explain the matter to him, and get a letter permitting me to wear the uniform, which offer I gently but firmly decline, being secretly of the opinion that these excessive precautions are all unnecessary. From the time I left Hungary I have been warned so persistently of danger ahead, and have so far met nothing really dangerous, that I am getting skeptical about there being anything like the risk people seem to think. Without being blind to the fact that there is a certain amount of danger in traveling alone, through a country where it is the universal custom either to travel in company or to take a guard, I feel quite confident that the extreme novelty of my conveyance will make so profound an impression on the Asiatic mind that even did they know that my buttons are gold coins of the realm, they would hesitate seriously to molest me. From past observations among people seeing the bicycle ridden for the first time, I believe that with a hundred yards of smooth road it is quite possible for a cycler to ride his way into the good graces of the worst gang of freebooters in Asia. Having decided to remain here overnight, I seek the accommodation of a rudely comfortable hotel, kept by an Armenian, where at the supper table I am first made acquainted with the Asiatic dish called pilau, that is destined to form no inconsiderable part of my daily bill of fare for several weeks. Pilau is a dish that is met with, in one disguise or another, all over Asia. With a foundation of boiled rice, it receives a variety of other compounds, 
the nature of which will appear as they enter into my daily experiences. In deference to the limited knowledge of each other's language possessed by myself and the proprietor, I am invited into the cookhouse and permitted to take a peep at the contents of several different pots and kettles, simmering over a slow fire in a sort of brick trench, to point out to the waiter such dishes as I think I shall like. Failing to find among the assortment any familiar acquaintances, I try the pilau, and find it quite palatable, preferring it to anything else the house affords. Our friend the Frenchman is quite delighted at the advent of a bicycle in his mitt, for in his younger days he tells me with much enthusiasm he used to be somewhat partial to whirling wheels himself, and when he first came here from France some eighteen years ago he actually brought with him a bone shaker with which for the first summer he was wont to surprise the natives this relic of bygone days has been stowed away among a lot of old traps ever since all but forgotten but the appearance of a mounted wheelman recalls it to memory and this evening in honor of my visit it is brought once more to light its past history explained by its owner and its merits and demerits as a vehicle in comparison with my bicycle duly discussed. The bone shaker has wheels heavy enough for a dog cart. The saddle is nearly all gnawed away by mice, and it presents altogether so antiquated an appearance that it seems a relic rather of a past century than of a past decade. Its owner essays to take a ride on it, but the best he can do is to wobble around a vacant space in front of the hotel the awkward motions of the old bone shaker affording intense amusement to the crowd after supper this chatty and entertaining gentleman brings his wife a rotund motherly looking person to see the bicycle she is a levantine greek and besides her own lingua franca her husband has improved her education to the extent of a smattering of rather misleading english Desiring to be complimentary in return for my riding back and forth a few times for her special benefit, the lady comes forward as I dismount, and smiling complacently upon me, remarks, How very grateful you ride, monsieur! And her husband and tutor, desiring also to say something complimentary, echoes, Much grateful, very! The Greeks seem to be the life and poetry of these seacoast places on the Izmit Gulf. My hotel faces the water, and for hours after dark a half-dozen kayak loads of serenaders are paddling about in front of the town, making quite an entertaining concert in the silence of the night, the pleasing effect being heightened by the well-known softening influence of the water, and not a little enhanced by a display of rockets and Roman candles. Earlier in the evening, while taking a look at his mitt and the surrounding scenery, in company with a few sociable natives, who point out beauty spots in the surrounding landscape with no little enthusiasm, I am impressed with the extreme loveliness of the situation. The town itself, now a place of 13,000 inhabitants, is the Nicomedia of the ancients. It is built in the form of a crescent, facing the sea. The houses, many of them painted white, are terraced upon the slopes of the green hills, whose sides and summits are clothed with verdure and whose bases are laved by the blue waves of the gulf, which here at the upper extremity narrows to about a mile and a half in width. White villages dot the green mountain slopes on the opposite shore, prominent among them being the Armenian town of Bagjadzik, where for a number of years has been established an American missionary school, a branch, I think, of Roberts College. Every mile of visible country, whether gently sloping or more rugged and imposing, is green with luxuriant vegetation, and the waters of the gulf are of that deep blue color, peculiar to mountain-locked inlets. The bright green hills, the dancing blue waters, and the white-painted villages combine to make a scene so lovely in the chastened light of early eventide, that after the Bosporus I think I never saw a place more beautiful. Besides the loveliness of the situation, the little mountain-sheltered inlet makes an excellent anchorage for shipping, and during the late war, at the well-remembered crisis when the Russian armies were bearing down on Constantinople, and the British fleet received the famous order to pass through the Dardanelles, with or without the Sultan's permission, the headwaters of the Izmit Gulf became, for several months, 
The Rendezvous of the Ships Section 25 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1 by Thomas Stevens Chapter 11 On Through Asia Early dawn on Tuesday morning finds me already astir and groping about the hotel in search of some of the slumbering employees to let me out. Pocketing a cold lunch in lieu of eating breakfast, I mount and wheel down the long street leading out of the eastern end of town. On the way out I pass a party of caravan teamsters who have just arrived with a cargo of mohair from Angora. Their pack mules are fairly festooned with strings of bells of all sizes, from a tiny sleigh bell to a solemn-voiced sheet-iron affair the size of a two-gallon jar. These bells make an awful din. The men are unpacking the weary animals, shouting both at the mules and at each other, as if their chief object were to create as much noise as possible. But as I wheel noiselessly past, they cease their unpacking and their shouting, as if by common consent, and greet me with that silent stare of wonder that men might be supposed to accord to an apparition from another world. For some few miles a rough macadam road affords a somewhat choppy but nevertheless rideable surface, and further inland it develops into a fairly good roadway, where a dismount is unnecessary for several miles. The road leads along a depression between a continuation of the mountain chains that enclose the Izmit Gulf, which now run parallel with my road on either hand at the distance of a couple of miles, some of the spurs on the south range rising to quite an imposing height. For four miles out of Izmit the country is flat and swampy. Beyond that it changes to higher ground, and the swampy flat, the higher ground, and the mountain slopes are all covered with timber and a dense growth of underbrush, in which wild fig shrubs and the homely but beautiful ferns of the English commons, the Missouri Valley woods, and the California foothills mingle their respective charms, and hobnob with scrub oak, chestnut, walnut, and scores of others. The whole face of the country is covered with this dense thicket, and the first little hamlet I pass on the road is nearly hidden in it, the roofs of the houses being barely visible above the green sea of vegetation. Orchards and little patches of ground that have been cleared and cultivated are hidden entirely, and one cannot help thinking that if this interminable forest of brushwood were once to get fairly ablaze, nothing could prevent it from destroying everything these villagers possess. A foretaste of what awaits me farther in the interior is obtained even within the first few hours of the morning, when a couple of horsemen canter at my heels for miles. They seem delighted beyond measure, and their solicitude for my health and general welfare is quite affecting. When I halt to pluck some blackberries, they solemnly pat their stomachs and shake their heads in chorus, to make me understand that blackberries are not good things to eat and by gestures they notify me of bad places in the road, which are yet out of sight ahead. Yud Mahanaks, now called Khans, occupy little clearings by the roadside, at intervals of a few miles, and among the habitués congregated there, I notice several of the Circassian refugees on whose account friends at Izmit and Constantinople have shown themselves so concerned for my safety. They are dressed in the long Cossack coats of dark cloth peculiar to the inhabitants of the Caucasus. Two rows of bone or metal cartridge cases adorn their breast, being fitted into flutes or pockets made for them. They wear either top boots or top boot legs, and the counterpart of my own moccasins, and their headdress is a tall black lamb's wool turban, similar to the national headgear of the Persians. They are by far the best-dressed and most respectable-looking men one sees among the groups, 
for while the majority of the natives are both ragged and barefooted, I don't remember ever seeing Circassians either. To all outward appearances, they are the most trustworthy men of them all, but there is really more deviltry concealed beneath the smiling exterior of one of these homeless mountaineers from Circassia than in a whole village of the less likely-looking natives here, whose general cutthroat appearance, an effect produced more than anything else, by the universal custom of wearing all the old swords, knives, anil pistols they can get hold of, really counts for nothing. In picturesqueness of attire, some of these con loafers leave nothing to be desired, and although I am this morning wearing Igali's cerulean scarf as a sash, the tri-colored pencil string of Servia around my neck, and a handsome pair of Circassian moccasins, I ain't absolutely nowhere by the side of many a native here whose entire wardrobe wouldn't fetch half a MacGD in a Galata auction room. The great light of Central Asian hospitality casts a glimmer even up into this out-of-the-way northwestern corner of the continent, though it seems to partake more of the Nevada interpretation of the word than farther in the interior. Thrice during the forenoon I am accosted with the invitation, Mastic, Cognac, Coffee, by roadside kanjis, or their customers who wish me to stop and let them satisfy their consuming curiosity at my novel bagar, horse, as many of them jokingly allude to it. Beyond these three beverages and the inevitable nargile, these wayside khans provide nothing. Vishner syrup a pleasant extract of the Vishner cherry, a spoonful in a tumbler of water, makes a most agreeable and refreshing sherbet, which is my favorite beverage on the road, being an inoffensive, non-intoxicating drink, is not in sufficient demand among the patrons of the cons to justify keeping it in stock. An ancient boulder causeway traverses the route I am following, but the blocks of stone composing it have long since become misplaced and scattered about in confusion, making it impassable for wheeled vehicles, and the natural dirt road alongside it is covered with several inches of dust, which is continually being churned up by mule caravans bringing mohair from Angora and miscellaneous merchandise from Izmit. Camel caravans make smooth tracks, but they seldom venture to Izmit at this time of the year, I am told on account of the bellicose character of the mosquitoes that inhabit this particular region, their special mode of attack being to invade the camel's sensitive nostrils, which drives these patient beasts of burden to the last verge of distraction, sometimes even worrying them to death. Stopping for dinner at the village of Sabanja, the scenes familiar in connection with a halt for refreshments in the Balkan Peninsula are enacted though for bland and childlike assurance there is no comparison between the European Turk and his brother in Asia Minor. More than one villager approaches me during the few minutes I am engaged in eating dinner, and blandly asks me to quit eating and let him see me ride. One of them, with a view of putting it out of my power to refuse, supplements his request with a few green apples which no European could eat without bringing on an attack of cholera morbus, but which Asiatics consume with impunity. After dinner, I request the proprietor to save me from the madding crowd long enough to round up a few notes, which he attempts to do by locking me in a room over the stable. In less than ten minutes, the door is unlocked, and in walks the headman of the village, making a most solemn and profound salaam as he enters. He has searched out a man who fought with the English in the Crimea, according to his, the man's own, explanation, and who knows a few words of frank language and has brought him along to interpret. Without the slightest hesitation, he asks me to leave off writing and come down and ride, in order that he may see the performance, and he continues artfully, that he may judge of the comparative merits of a horse and a bicycle. This peculiar trait of the Asiatic character is further illustrated during the afternoon in the case of a caravan leader whom I meet on an unrideable stretch of road. Bin, bin, says this person, as soon as his mental faculties grasp the idea that the bicycle is something to ride on. 
Mimkin de yil, fena yol, dus yolo lezim. Impossible, bad road, good road necessary, I reply, airing my limited stock of Turkish. Nothing daunted by this answer, the man blandly requests me to turn about and follow his caravan until rideable road is reached, a good mile, in order that he may be enlightened. It is perhaps superfluous to add that, so far as I know, this particular individual's ideas of cycling are as hazy and undefined today as they ever were. The principal occupation of the Sabanjans seems to be killing time, or perhaps waiting for something to turn up. Apple and pear orchards are scattered about among the brush, looking utterly neglected. They are old trees, mostly and were planted by the more enterprising ancestors of the present owners, who would appear to be altogether unworthy of their sires, since they evidently do nothing in the way of trimming and pruning, but merely accept such blessings as unaided nature vouchsafes to bestow upon them. Moss-grown gravestones are visible here and there amid the thickets. The graveyards are neither protected by fence nor shorn of brush. In short, this aggressive undergrowth appears to be altogether too much for the energies of the Sabanjans. It seems to be encroaching upon them from every direction, ruthlessly pursuing them even to their very door sills. Like Banquo's ghost, it will not down, and the people have evidently retired discouraged from the contest. Higher up on the mountain slopes, the underbrush gives place to heavier timber, and small clearings abound around which the unsubdued forest stands like a solid wall of green, the scene reminding one quite forcibly of backwoods clearings in Ohio. And were it not for the ancient appearance of the Sabanja minarets, the old boulder causeway, and other evidences of declining years, one might easily imagine himself in a new country instead of the cradle of our race. At Sabanja the wagon road terminates, and my way becomes execrable beyond anything I ever encountered. It leads over a low mountain pass, following the track of the ancient roadway, that on the acclivity of the mountain has been torn up and washed about, and the stone blocks scattered here and piled up there by the torrents of centuries, until it would seem to have been the sport and plaything of a hundred Kansas cyclones. Bound about and among this disorganized mass, caravans have picked their way over the pass from the first dawn of commercial intercourse. Following the same trail year after year, the stepping places have come to resemble the steps of a rude stairway. From the summit of the pass is obtained a comprehensive view of the verdure-clad valley. Here and there white minarets are seen protruding above the verdant area, like lighthouses from a green sea. Villages dot the lower slopes of the mountains, while a lake covering half the width of the valley for a dozen miles glimmers in the midday sun, making altogether a scene that in some countries would long since have been immortalized on canvas or in verse. The descent is even rougher, if anything, than the western side, but it leads down into a tiny valley that, if situated near a large city, would resound with the voices of merrymakers the whole summer long. The undergrowth of this morning's observations has entirely disappeared. Wide-spreading chestnut and grand old sycamore trees shade a circumscribed area of velvety greensward and isolated rocks. A tiny stream, a tributary of the Sicaria, meanders along its rocky bed, and forest-clad mountains tower almost perpendicularly around the charming little vale, save one narrow outlet to the east. There is not a human in sight, nor a sound to break the silence save the murmuring of the brook, as I fairly clamber down into this little sylvan retreat. But a wreath of smoke curling above the trees some distance from the road betrays the presence of man. The whole scene vividly calls to mind one of those marvelous mountain retreats in which writers of banditti stories are wont to pitch their hero's silken tent. No more appropriate rendezvous for a band of storybook freebooters could well be imagined. Short stretches of rideable mule paths are found along this valley as I follow the course of the little stream eastward. They are by no means continuous by reason of the eccentric wanderings of the rivulet, 
but after climbing the rough pass one feels thankful for even small favors, and I plod along, now riding, now walking, occasionally passing little clusters of mud huts and meeting with pack animals en route to his mitt, with the season's shearing of mohair. Alia Franga is the greeting I am now favored with instead of the Ah l'Anglaise of Europe, as I pass people on the road, and the bicycle is referred to as an Araba, the name the natives give their rude carts, and a name which they seem to think is quite appropriate for anything with wheels. Following the course of the little tributary for several miles, crossing and recrossing it a number of times, I finally emerge with it into the valley of Sicaria. There are some very good roads down this valley, which is narrow, and in places contracts to but little more than a mere neck between the mountains. At one of the narrowest points the mountains present an almost perpendicular face of rock, and here are the remnants of an ancient stone wall reputed to have been built by the Greeks, somewhere about the twelfth century, in anticipation of an invasion of the Turks from the south. The wall stretches across the valley from mountain to river, and is quite a massive affair. An archway has been cut through it for the passage of caravans. Soon after passing through this opening I am favored with the company of a horseman, who follows me for three or four miles, and thoughtfully takes upon himself the office of telling me when to bin and when not to bin, according as he thinks the road suitable for cycling or not until he discovers that his gratuitous advice produces no visible effect on my movements, when he desists and follows along behind in silence like a sensible fellow. About five o'clock in the afternoon I cross the Sicaria on an old stone bridge, and half an hour later roll into Geva, a large village situated in the middle of a triangular valley about seven miles in width. My cyclometer shows a trifle over forty miles from his mitt. It has been a variable forty miles. I shall never forget the pass over the old causeway, the view of the Sabanja Valley from the summit, nor the lovely little retreat on the eastern side. Trundling through the town in quest of a khan, I am soon surrounded by a clamorous crowd, and passing the house or office of the mudir, or headman of the place, that person sallies forth, and after ascertaining the cause of the commotion, begs me to favor the crowd and himself by riding round a vacant piece of ground hard by. After this performance a respectable-looking man beckons me to follow him, and he takes me not to his own house to be his guest, for Geva is too near Europe for this sort of thing, to a khan kept by a Greek with a moat in one eye, where a shakedown on the floor a cup of coffee or a glass of vishner is obtainable, and opposite which another Greek keeps an eating house. There is no separate kitchen in this latter establishment as in the one at Izmit. One room answers for cooking, eating, nargila smoking, coffee sipping, and gossiping, and while I am eating a curious crowd watches my every movement with intense interest. Here, as at Izmit, I am requested to examine for myself the contents of several pots. Most of them contain a greasy mixture of chopped meat and tomatoes stewed together, with no visible difference between them save in the sizes of the pieces of meat. But one vessel contains pilau, and of this and some inferior red wine I make my supper. Prices for eatables are ridiculously low. I hand him a cherok for the supper, he beckons me out of the back door, and there, with none save ourselves to witness the transaction, he counts me out two piastres change, which left him ten centa for the supper. He has probably been guilty of the awful crime of charging me about three farthings over the regular price, and was afraid to venture upon so iniquitous a proceeding in the public room, lest the Turks should perchance detect him in cheating an Englishman and revenge the wrong by making him feed me for nothing. It rains quite heavily during the night, and while waiting for it to dry up a little in the morning, the Gavaites voluntarily tender me much advice concerning the state of the road ahead, being governed in their ideas according to their knowledge of a cycler's mountain-climbing ability. By a round dozen of men who penetrate into my room in a body ere I am fairly dressed, 
and who, after solemnly salaaming in chorus, commence delivering themselves of expressive pantomime and gesticulations, I am led to understand that the road from Geva to Tereklu is something fearful for a bicycle. One fat old Turk, undertaking to explain it more fully, after the others have exhausted their knowledge of sign language, swells himself up like an inflated toad, and imitates the labored respiration of a broken-winded horse, in order to duly impress upon my mind the physical exertion I may expect to put forth in riding. He also paws the air with his right foot over the mountain range that looms up like an impassable barrier three miles east of the town. The Turks as a nation have the reputation of being solemn-visaged, imperturbable people. Yet one occasionally finds them quite animated and frenchy in their behavior. The bicycle may, however, be in a measure responsible for this. The soil around Geva is a red clay that after a shower clings to the rubber tires of the bicycle as though the mere resemblance in color tended to establish a bond of sympathy between them that nothing could overcome. I pass the time until ten o'clock in avoiding the crowd that has swarmed the Khan since early dawn, and has been awaiting with Asiatic patience ever since. At ten o'clock I win the gratitude of a thousand hearts by deciding to start, the happy crowd deserting half-smoked nargilas rapidly swallowing tiny cups of scalding hot coffee in their anxiety lest i vault into the saddle at the door of the khan and whisk out of their sight in a moment an idea that is flitting through the imaginative mind of more than one turk present as a natural result of the stories his wife has heard from his neighbor's wife whose sister from the roof of her house saw me ride around the vacant space at the mudir's request yesterday the oriental imagination of scores of wandering villagers has been drawn upon to magnify that modest performance into a feat that fills the hundreds who didn't see it with the liveliest anticipations, and a murmuring undercurrent of excitement thrills the crowd as the word goes round that I am about to start. A minority of the people learned yesterday that I wouldn't ride across the stones, water ditches, and mud holes of the village streets and these at once lead the way, taking upon themselves the office of conducting me to the road leading to the Kara Sioux Pass, while the less enlightened majority press on behind, the more restless spirits worrying me to ride, those of more patient disposition maintaining a respectful silence, but wondering why on earth I am walking. The road they conduct me to is another of those ancient stone causeways that traverse this section of Asia Minor in all directions. This one and several others I happen to come across are but about three feet wide, and were evidently built for military purposes by the more enterprising people who occupied Constantinople and the adjacent country before the Turks, narrow stone pathways built to facilitate the marching of armies during the rainy season when the natural ground hereabout is all but impassable. These stone roads were probably built during the Byzantine occupation. Fairly smooth mule paths lead alongside this relic of a departed greatness and energy, and the warm sun having dried the surface, I mount and speed away from the wandering crowd, and in four miles reach the foot of the Karasu Pass. From this spot I can observe a small caravan slowly picking its way down the mountain. The animals are sometimes entirely hidden behind rocks, as they follow the windings and twistings of the trail down the rugged slope which the old Turk this morning thought would make me puff to climb. A little stream called the Karasu, or Blackwater, comes dancing out of a rocky avenue nearby, and while I am removing my footgear to ford it, I am joined by several herdsmen who are tending flocks of the celebrated Angora goats, and the peculiar fat-tailed sheep of the east which are grazing on neighboring knolls. These gentle shepherds are not overburdened with clothing, their nakedness being but barely covered, but they wear long sword knives and old flintlock, bell-mouthed horse pistols that give them a ferocious appearance that seems strangely at variance with their peaceful occupation. They gather about me with a familiarity that impresses me anything but favorably toward them. They critically examine my clothing from helmet to moccasins, eyeing my various belongings wistfully. 
tapping my leather case and pinching the rear package to try and ascertain the nature of its contents. I gather from their remarks about para, a term used in a general sense for money, as well as for the small coin of that name, as they regard the leather case with a covetous eye, that they are inclined to the opinion that it contains money. And there is no telling the fabulous wealth their untutored minds are associating with the supposed treasure chest of a Frank who rides a silver araba. Evidently these fellows have never heard of the Tenth Commandment, or having heard of it, they have failed to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest it for the improvement of their moral natures, for covetousness beams forth from every lineament of their faces and every motion of their hands. Seeing this, I endeavor to win them from the moral shackles of their own gloomy minds by pointing out the beautiful mechanism of my machine. I twirl the pedals and show them how perfect are the bearings of the rear wheel. I pinch the rubber tire to show them that it is neither iron nor wood and call their attention to the brake, fully expecting in this usually winsome manner to fill them with gratitude and admiration and make them forget all about my baggage and clothes. But these fellows seem to differ from those of their countrymen I left but a short time ago. My other effects interest them far more than the wheel does and one of them, after wistfully eyeing my moccasins, a handsomer pair, perhaps, than he ever saw before, points ruefully down to his own rude sandals of thong-bound rawhide, and casts a look upon his comrades that says far more eloquently than words, What a shame that such lovely moccasins should grace the feet of a Frank and an unbeliever! Ashes on his head! While a true follower of the prophet like myself should go about almost barefooted! There is no mistaking the natural bent of these gentle shepherd's inclinations, and as in the absence of a rusty sword and a seventeenth-century horse pistol, they doubtless think I am unarmed. My impression from their bearing is that they would, at least, have tried to frighten me into making them a present of my moccasins and perhaps a few other things. In the innocence of their unsophisticated natures they wist not of the compact little weapon reposing beneath my coat that is as superior to their entire armament as is a modern gunboat to the wooden walls of the last century. Whatever their intentions may be, however, they are doomed never to be carried out, for their attention is now attracted by the caravan, whose approach is heralded by the jingle of a thousand bells. The next two hours find me engaged in the laborious task of climbing a mere bridle path up the rugged mountain slope along which no wheeled vehicle has certainly ever been before. There is in some places barely room for pack animals to pass between the masses of the rocks, and at others but a narrow ledge between a perpendicular rock and a sheer precipice. The steepest portions are worn into rude stone stairways by the feet of pack animals that toiled over this pass just as they toiled before America was discovered, and have been toiling ever since and for hundreds of yards at a stretch I am compelled to push the bicycle ahead rear wheel aloft in the well-known manner of going up stairs. While climbing up a rather awkward place I meet a lone Arab youth, leading his horse by the bridle and come near causing a serious accident. It was at the turning of a sharp corner that I met this swarthy-faced youth face to face, and the sudden appearance of what both he and the horse thought was a being from a far more distant sphere than the western half of our own so frightened them both that I expected every minute to see them go toppling over the precipice. Reassuring the boy by speaking a word or two of Turkish, and seeing the impossibility of either passing him or of his horse being able to turn around. I turn about and retreat a short distance, to where there's more room. He is not quite assured of my terrestrial character even yet. He is too frightened to speak, and he trembles visibly as he goes past, greeting me with a leer of mingled fear and suspicion, at the same time making a brave but very sickly effort to ward off any evil designs I might be meditating against him by a pitiful propitiatory smile, which will haunt my memory for weeks though I hope by plenty of exercise to escape an attack of the nightmare. This is the worst mountain climbing I have done with a bicycle, 
all the way across the Rockies there is nothing approaching this pass for steepness, although on foot or horseback it would of course not appear so formidable. When part way up a bank of low-hanging clouds comes rolling down to meet me, enveloping the mountain in fog and bringing on a disagreeable drizzle which scarcely improves the situation. Five miles from the bottom of the pass and three hours from Geva, I reach a small Postaya Khan, occupied by one Zaptia and the station keeper, where I halt for a half hour and get the Zaptia to brew me a cup of coffee, feeling the need of a little refreshment after the stiff tugging of the last two hours. Coffee is the only refreshment obtainable here, and though the weather looks anything but propitious, I push ahead toward a regular roadside Khan which I am told I shall come to at the distance of another hour. The natives of Asia Minor know nothing of miles or kilometers, but reckon the distance from point to point by the number of hours it usually takes to go on horseback. Reaching this Khan at three o'clock, I call for something to satisfy the cravings of hunger, and am forthwith confronted with a loaf of black bread, villainously heavy, and given a preliminary peep into a large jar of a crumbly white substance as villainously odiferous as the bread is heavy, and which I think the proprietor expects me to look upon as cheese. This native product seems to be valued by the people here in proportion as it is rancid, being regarded by them with more than affection when it has reached a degree of rancidness and odiferousness that would drive a European, barring perhaps a Limburger, out of the house. These two delicacies, and the inevitable tiny cups of black bitter coffee, make up all the edibles the Khan affords. So seeing the absence of any alternative, I order bread and coffee, prepared to make the most of circumstances. The proprietor, being a kindly individual, and thinking perhaps that limited means forbid my indulgence in such luxuries as the substance of the earthenware jar, in the kindness of his heart toward a lone stranger, scoops out a small portion with his unwashed hand, puts it in a bowl of water, and stirs it about a little by way of washing it, drains the water off through his fingers, and places it before me. While engaged in the discussion of this delectable meal, a caravan of mules arrives in charge of seven rough-looking Turks, who halt to procure a feed of barley for their animals the supplying of which appears to be the chief business of the kanji. No sooner have these men alighted and ascertained the use of the bicycle than I am assailed with the usual importunities to ride for their further edification. It would be quite as reasonable to ask a man to fly as to ride a bicycle anywhere near the Khan, but in the innocence of their hearts and the dullness of their oriental understandings they think differently. They regard my objections as the result of a perverse and contrary disposition, and my explanation of Mimkin de Yil as but a groundless excuse born of my unwillingness to oblige. One old greybeard, after examining the bicycle, eyes me meditatively for a moment, and then comes forward with a humorous twinkle in his eye, and pokes me playfully in the ribs, and makes a peculiar noise with the mouth quick, in an effort to tickle me into good humor and compliance with their wishes. In addition to which, the artful old dodger, thinking thus to work on my vanity, calls me Pasha Effendi. Finding that toward their entreaties I give but the same reply, one of the younger men coolly advocates the use of force to coerce me into giving them an exhibition of my skill on the Araba. As far as I am able to interpret, this bold visionary's argument is, Behold, we are seven. Effendi is only one. We are good Mussulmans. Peace be with us. He is but a frank ashes on his head. Let us make him bin. End of chapter 11 On Through Asia Recording by Pamela Krantz Section 26 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Section 26 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. Chapter 12 Through the Angora Goat Country. Part 1. The other members of the caravan company, while equally anxious to see the performance, and no doubt thinking me quite an unreasonable person, disapprove of the young man's proposition, and the manji severely reprimands him for talking about resorting to force, and turning to the others, he lays his four fingers together and says something about Franks, Musselmans, Turks, and Angilis meaning that even if we are Franks and Mussulmans, we are not prevented from being, at the same time, allies and brothers. From the Khan the ascent is more gradual, though in places muddy and disagreeable from the drizzling rain, which still falls, and about 4 p.m. I arrive at the summit. The descent is smoother and shorter than the western slope, but is even more abrupt. The composition is a slaty blue clay in which the caravans have worn trails so deep in places that a mule is hidden completely from view. There is no room for animals to pass each other in these deep trench-like trails, and were any to meet, the only possible plan is for the ascending animals to be backed down until a wider place is reached. There is little danger of the larger caravans being thus caught in these traps for the unwary, since each can hear the other's approach and take precautions. But single horsemen and small parties must sometimes find themselves obliged to either give or take in the depths of these queer highways of commerce. It is quite an awkward task to descend with the bicycle, as for much of the way the trail is not even wide enough to admit of trundling in the ordinary manner, and I have to adopt the same tactics in going down as in coming up the mountain with the difference that on the eastern slope I have to pull back quite as stoutly as I had to push forward on the western. In going down, I meet a man with three donkeys, but fortunately I am able to scramble up the bank sufficiently to let him pass. His donkeys are loaded with half-ripe grapes, which he is perhaps taking all the way to Constantinople in this slow and laborious manner and he offers me some as an inducement for me to ride for his benefit. Some wheelmen, being possessed of a sensitive nature, would undoubtedly think they had a right to feel aggrieved or insulted if offered a bunch of unripe grapes as an inducement to go ahead and break their necks. But these people here in Asia Minor are but simple-hearted, overgrown children. They will go straight to heaven when they die, every one of them. At six o'clock I roll into Tereklu, having found a rideable road a mile or so before reaching town. After looking at the cyclometer, I begin figuring up the number of days it is likely to take me to reach Teheran, if yesterday and today have been expository of the country ahead. Forty and one-third miles yesterday and nineteen and a half today. Thirty miles a day. Rather slow progress for a wheelman, I mentally conclude. But although I would rather ride from Land's End to John O'Groats for a task than bicycle over the ground I have traversed between here and his mitt, I find the tough work interlarded with a sufficiency of novel and interesting phases to make the occupation congenial. Upon dismounting at Tereklu I find myself but little fatigued with the day's exertions, and with a view to obtaining a little peace and freedom from importunities to ride after supper. I gratify Asiatic curiosity several times before undertaking to allay the pangs of hunger. A piece of self-denial quite commendable, even if taken in connection with the idea of self-protection, when one reflects that I had spent the day in severe exercise, and had eaten since morning only a piece of bread. Not long after my arrival at Tereklu I am introduced to another peculiar and not unknown phase of the character of these people one that I have sometimes read of, but was scarcely prepared to encounter before being on Asian soil three days. From some of them having received medical favors from the medicine chest of travelers and missionaries, 
the asiatics have come to regard every frank who passes through their country as a skillful physician capable of all sorts of wonderful things in the way of curing their ailments and immediately after supper i am waited upon by my first patient the mulazim of the tereklu zaptias he is a tall pleasant-faced fellow whom i remember as having been wonderfully courteous and considerate while i was riding for the people before supper and he is suffering with neuralgia in his lower jaw he comes and seats himself beside me rolls a cigarette in silence lights it and hands it to me and then with the confident assurance of a child approaching its mother to be soothed and cured of some ailment he requests me to cure his aching jaw seemingly having not the slightest doubt of my ability to afford him instant relief I ask him why he don't apply to the Hakim, doctor, of his native town. He rolls another cigarette, makes me throw the half-consumed one away, and having thus ingratiated himself a trifle deeper into my affections, he tells me that the Tereklu Hakim is Fena, in other words, no good, adding that there is a Duz Hakim at Geva, but Geva is over the Karasu Dag. At this juncture he seems to arrive at the conclusion that perhaps I require a good deal of coaxing and good treatment, and taking me by the hand he leads me in that affectionate brotherly manner down the street and into a coffee maw, and spends the next hour in pressing upon me coffee and cigarettes, and referring occasionally to his aching jaw. The poor fellow tries so hard to make himself agreeable and awaken my sympathies that I really begin to feel myself quite an ingrate in not being able to afford him any relief, and slightly embarrassed by my inability to convince him that my failure to cure him is not the result of indifference to his sufferings. Casting about for some way of escape, without sacrificing his good will, and having in mind a box of pills I have brought along, I give him to understand that I am at the top of the medical profession as a stomach-ache, Hakim, but as for the jaw-ache, I am unfortunately even worse than his compatriot over the way. Had I attempted to persuade him that I was not a doctor at all, he would not have believed me, his mind being unable to grasp the idea of a frank totally unacquainted with the noble Esculapian art but he seems quite aware of the existence of specialists in the profession, and notwithstanding my inability to deal with this particular affliction, my modest confession of being unexcelled in another branch of medicine seems to satisfy him. My profound knowledge of stomachic disorders and their treatment excuses my ignorance of neuralgic remedies. There seems to be a larger proportion of superior dwelling houses in Tereklu than in Geva, although to the misguided mind of an unbeliever from the West, they have cast a sort of funereal shadow over this otherwise desirable feature of their town, by building their principal residences around a populous cemetery, which plays the part of a large central square. The houses are mostly two-story frame buildings, and the omnipresent balconies and all the windows are faced with close latticework so that the Osmanli ladies can enjoy the luxury of gazing contemplatively out on the area of disorderly gravestones, without being subjected to the prying eyes of passers-by. In the matter of veiling their faces, the women of these interior towns place no such liberal, not to say coquettish, interpretation upon the office of the Ashmak, as do their sisters of the same religion in and about Constantinople. The ladies of Tereklu seemingly have a holy horror of displaying any of their facial charms. The only possible opportunity offered of seeing anything is to obtain an occasional glimpse of the one black eye with which they timidly survey you through a small opening in the folds of their shroud-like outer garment that encases them from head to foot. And even this peeping window of their souls is frequently hidden behind the impenetrable yashmak. Musselman women are the most gossipy and inquisitive creatures imaginable, a very natural result, I suppose, of having had their feminine rights divine under constant restraint, and suppression by the peculiar social position women occupy in Mohammedan countries. When I have arrived in town and am surrounded and hidden from outside view by a solid wall of men, 
it is really quite painful to see the women standing in small groups at a distance trying to make out what all the excitement is about nobody seems to have a particle of sympathy for their very natural inquisitiveness or even to take any notice of their presence it is quite surprising to see how rapidly the arrival of the frank with the wonderful araba becomes known among these women from one end of town to another in an incredibly short space of time groups of shrouded forms begin to appear on the housetops and other vantage points craning their necks to obtain a glimpse of whatever is going on in the innocence of an unsophisticated nature and a feeling of genuine sympathy for their position i propose collecting these scattered groups of neglected females together and giving an exhibition for their especial benefit but the men evidently regard the idea of going to any trouble out of consideration for them as quite ridiculous indeed i am inclined to think they regard it as evidence that i am nothing less than a gay lothario who is betraying altogether too much interest in their women for the old school asmanli encompasses those hapless mortals about with a green wall of jealousy and regards with disapproval even so much as a glance in their direction while riding on one occasion this evening i noticed one over inquisitive female become so absorbed in the proceedings as to quite forget herself and approach nearer to the crowd than the tereclo idea of propriety would seem to justify in her absent-mindedness while watching me ride slowly up and dismount she allowed her yashmak to become disarranged and reveal her features this awful indiscretion is instantly detected by an old bluebeard standing by who eyes the offender severely but says nothing if she is one of his own wives or the wife of an intimate friend the poor lady has perhaps earned for herself a chastisement with a stick later in the evening human nature is pretty much the same in the orient as anywhere else the degradation of women to a position beneath her proper level has borne its legitimate fruits the average turkish woman is said to be as coarse and unchaste in her conversation as the lowest outcasts of occidental society and is given to assailing her lord and master when angry with language anything but choice it is hardly six o'clock when i issue forth next morning but there are at least fifty women congregated in the cemetery alongside which my route leads during the night they seem to have made up their minds to grasp the only opportunity of seeing the elephant by witnessing my departure and as when a woman will she will etc applies to turkish ladies as well as to any others in their laudable determination not to be disappointed they have been patiently squatting among the gray tombstones since early dawn the roadway is anything but smooth nevertheless one could scarce be so dead to all feelings of commiseration as to remain unmoved by the sight of that patiently waiting crowd of shrouded females accordingly i mount and pick my way along the street and out of town modest as is this performance it is the most marvellous thing they have seen for many a day not a sound escapes them as i wheel by they remain as silent as though they were the ghostly population of the graveyard they occupy for i which indeed shrouded as they are in white from head to foot they might easily be mistaken by the superstitious my road leads over an undulating depression between the higher hills a region of small streams wheat fields and irrigating ditches among which several trails leading from tereclu to numerous villages scattered among the mountains and neighboring small valleys make it quite difficult to keep the proper road once i wander off my proper course for several miles finding out my mistake i determine upon regaining the torbali trail by a short cut across the stubble fields and uncultivated knolls of scrub oak this brings me into an acquaintanceship with the shepherds and husbandmen and the ways of their savage dogs that proves more lively than agreeable here and there i find primitive threshing floors they are simply spots of level ground selected in a central position and made smooth and hard by the combined labors of the several owners of the adjoining fields who use them in common rain and harvest is very unusual therefore the trouble and expense of covering them is considered unnecessary at each of these threshing centers i find a merry gathering of villagers 
some threshing out the grain, others winnowing it by tossing it aloft with wooden flat-pronged forks. The wind blows the lighter chaff aside, while the grain falls back into the heap. When the soil is sandy, the grain is washed in a neighboring stream to take out most of the grit, and then spread out on sheets in the sun to dry before finally being stored away in the granaries. The threshing is done chiefly by the boys and women who ride on the same kind of broad, sleigh-runner-shaped boards described in European Turkey. The sight of my approaching figure is, of course, the signal for a general suspension of operations, and a wondering as to what sort of being I am. If I am riding along some well-worn by-trail, the women and younger people invariably betray their apprehensions of my unusual appearance, and seldom fail to exhibit a disposition to flee at my approach but the conduct of their dogs causes me not a little annoyance. They have a noble breed of canines throughout the Angora goat country, fine animals as large as Newfoundlands, with a good deal the appearance of the Mastiff, and they display their hostility to my intrusion by making straight at me, evidently considering me fair game. These dogs are invaluable friends, but as enemies and assailants they are not exactly calculated to win a cycler's esteem. In my unusual appearance they see a strange, undefinable enemy, bearing down toward their friends and owners, arid like good, faithful dogs, they hesitate not to commence the attack. Sometimes there is a man among the threshers and winnowers who retains presence of mind enough to notice the dogs sallying forth to attack me, and to think of calling them back. But oftener I have to defend myself as best I can, while the gaping crowd, too dumbfounded and overcome at my unaccountable appearance to think of anything else, simply stare as though expecting to see me sail up into space out of harm's way, or perform some other miraculous feat. My general tactics are to dismount if riding, and maneuver the machine, so as to keep it between myself and my savage assailant, if there be but one, and if more than one, make feints with it at them alternately, not forgetting to caress them with a handy stone whenever occasion offers. There is a certain amount of cowardice about these animals, notwithstanding their size and fierceness. They are afraid and suspicious as a bicycle, as of some dreaded supernatural object. And although I am sometimes fairly at my wit's end to keep them at bay, I manage to avoid the necessity of shooting any of them. I have learned that to kill one of these dogs, no matter how great the provocation, would certainly get me into serious trouble with the natives, who value them very highly and consider the willful killing of one little short of murder. Hence my forbearance. When I arrive at a threshing floor, and it is discovered that I am actually a human being, and do not immediately encompass the destruction of those whose courage has been equal to awaiting my arrival, the women and children who have edged off to some distance now approach, quite timidly though, as if not quite certain of the prudence of trusting their eyesight as to the peaceful nature of my mission, and the men vie with each other in their eagerness to give me all desired information about my course sometimes accompanying me a considerable distance to make sure of guiding me aright. But their contumacious canine friends seem anything but reassured of my character, or willing to suspend hostilities. In spite of the friendly attitude of their masters and the peacefulness of the occasion generally, they make furtive dashes through the ranks of the spectators at me as I wheel round the small circular threshing floor and savagely snap at the revolving wheels. Sometimes, after being held in check until I am out of sight beyond a knoll, these vindictive and determined assailants will sneak around through the fields, and overtaking me unseen, make stealthy onslaughts upon me from the brush. My only safety is in unremitting vigilance. Like the dogs of most semi-civilized peoples, they are but imperfectly trained to obey, and the natives dislike checking them in their attacks upon anybody, arguing that doing so interferes with the courage and ferocity of their attack when called upon for a legitimate occasion. It is very questionable, to say the least, if inoffensive wayfarers should be expected to quietly submit to the unprovoked attack of ferocious animals large enough to tear down a man, 
merely in view of possibly checking their ferocity at some other time, when capering wildly about in an unequal contest with three or four of these animals, while conscious of having the means at hand to give them all their quietus, one feels as though he were at that particular moment doing as the Romans do, with a vengeance. Nevertheless, it has to be borne, and I manage to come through with nothing worse than a rent in the leg of my riding trousers. Finally, after fording several small streams, giving half a dozen threshing-floor exhibitions, and running the gauntlet of no end of warlike canines, I reach the lost Torbali Trail, and find it running parallel with a range of hills, intersecting numberless small streams, across which are sometimes found precarious foot-bridges, consisting of a tree-trunk felled across it from bank to bank, the work of some enterprising peasant for his own particular benefit rather than the outcome of public spirit. Occasionally I bowl merrily along stretches of road which nature and the caravans together have made smooth enough even to justify a spurt, but like a fleeting dream this favorable locality passes to the rearward, and is followed by another mountain slope, whose steep grade and rough surface reads trundle only. They seem the most timid people hereabout I ever saw. Few of them but show unmistakable signs of being frightened at my approach. Even when I am trundling, the nickel plate glistening in the sunlight, I think inspires them with awe, even at a distance. And while climbing this hill, I am the innocent cause of the ignominious flight of a youth riding a donkey. While yet two hundred yards away, he reins up and remains transfixed for one transitory moment, as if making sure that his eyes are not deceiving him, or that he is really awake, and then hastily turns tail and bolts across the country, belaboring his long-eared charger into quite a lively gallop in his wild anxiety to escape from my awe-inspiring presence. And as he vanishes across a field, he looks back anxiously to reassure himself that I am not giving chase. Ere kind friends and thoughtful well-wishers, with all their warnings of danger, are three days' journey behind, I find myself among people who run away at my approach. Shortly afterward I observe this bold donkey-rider half a mile to the left, trying to pass me and gain my rear unobserved. Others whom I meet this forenoon are more courageous. Instead of resorting to flight, they keep boldly on their general course, simply edging off to a respectful distance from my road. Some even venture to keep the road, taking care to give me a sufficiently large margin, over and above my share of the way, to ensure against any possibility of giving offense. While others will even greet me with a feeble effort to smile, and a timid, hesitating look, as if undecided whether they are not venturing too far. Sometimes I stop and ask these lion-hearted specimens whether I am on the right road, when they give a hurried reply and immediately take themselves off, as if startled at their own temerity. These, of course, are lone individuals, with no companions to bolster up their courage, or witness their cowardice. The conduct of a party is often quite the reverse. Sometimes they seem determined not to let me proceed without riding for them. Whether rocky ridge, sandy depression, or mountain slope characterizes our meeting place, and it requires no small stock of forbearance and tact to get away from them, without bringing on a serious quarrel. They take hold of the machine whenever I attempt to leave them, and give me to understand that nothing but a compliance with their wishes will secure my release. I have known them even try the effect of a little warlike demonstration, having vague ideas of gaining their object by intimidation. And this sort of thing is kept up until our own stock of patience is exhausted, or until some more reasonable member of the company becomes at last convinced that it really must be Mimkin de Yil after all. Whereupon they let me go ending the whole annoying and yet really amusing performance by giving me the most minute particulars of the route ahead, and parting in the best of humor. To lose one's temper on these occasions, or to attempt to forcibly break away, is quickly discovered to be the height of folly. They themselves are brimful of good humor, and from beginning to end their countenances are wreathed in smiles, although they fairly detain me prisoner the while 
they would never think of attempting any real injury to either myself or the bicycle. Some of the more enterprising even express their determination of trying to ride the machine themselves. But I always make a firm stand against any such liberties as this. And rough, half-civilized fellows, though they often are, armed, and fully understanding the advantage of numbers, they invariably yield this point when they find me seriously determined not to allow it. Descending into a narrow valley, I reach a roadside con, adjoining a thrifty-looking melon garden, this latter a welcome sight, since the day is warm and sultry, and a few minutes' quiet, soulful communion with a good ripe watermelon, I think to myself, will be just about the proper caper to indulge in, after being worried with dogs, people, small streams, and unrideable hills, since six o'clock. Carpus, I inquire, addressing the proprietor of the con, who issues forth from the stable. Peepsy, Effendi, he answers, and goes off to the garden for the melon. Smiling sweetly at vacancy, in joyous anticipation of the coming feast and the soothing influence, I feel sure of its exerting upon my feelings. Somewhat ruffled by the many annoyances of the morning, I seek a quiet, shady corner. Thoughtfully loosening my revolver belt a couple of notches ere sitting down, in a minute the kanji returns and hands me a cucumber about the size of a man's forearm. That isn't a carpoose. I want a carpoose. A su carpoose, I explain. Su carpoose, yoke, he replies, and as I have not yet reached that reckless disregard of possible consequences to which I afterward attain, I shrink from tempting providence by trying conclusions with the overgrown and untrustworthy cucumber. So bidding the kanji adieu, I wheel off down the valley. I find a fair proportion of good road along this valley. The land is rich, and though but rudely tilled, it produces wonderfully heavy crops of grain when irrigated. Small villages, surrounded by neglected-looking orchards and vineyards, abound at frequent intervals. Wherever one finds an orchard, vineyard, or melon patch, there is also almost certain to be a human being evidently doing nothing but sauntering about, or perhaps eating an unripe melon. This naturally creates an unfavorable impression upon a traveler's mind. It means either that the kleptomaniac tendencies of the people necessitate standing guard over all portable property, or that the Asiatic follows the practice of hovering around all summer, watching and waiting for nature to bestow her blessings upon his undeserving head. Along this valley I meet a Turk and his wife, bestriding the same diminutive donkey, the woman riding in front and steering their long-eared craft by the terror of her tongue in lieu of a bridle. The fearless lady halts her steed as I approach, trundling my wheel, the ground being such that riding is possible but undesirable. "'What is that for, Effendi?' inquires the man, who seems to be the more inquisitive of the two. "'Why, to bin, of course. Don't you see the saddle?' says the woman, without a moment's hesitation. And she bestows a glance of reproach upon her worse half for thus betraying his ignorance, twisting her neck round in order to send the glance straight at his unoffending head." This woman, I mentally conclude, is an extraordinary specimen of her race. I never saw a quicker witted person anywhere, and I am not at all surprised to find her proving herself a phenomenon in other things. When a Turkish female meets a stranger on the road, and more especially a Frank, her first thought and most natural impulse is to make sure that no part of her features is visible. About other parts of her person she is less particular. This remarkable woman, however, flings custom to the winds, and instead of drawing the ample folds of her abbas about her, uncovers her face entirely in order to obtain a better view. And being unaware of my limited understanding, she begins discussing bicycle in quite a chatty manner. I fancy her poor husband looks a trifle shocked at this outrageous conduct of the partner of his joys and sorrows but he remains quietly and discreetly in the background, whereupon I register a silent vow never more to be surprised at anything, 
for that long-suffering and submissive being, the hen-pecked husband, is evidently not unknown even in Asiatic Turkey. Another mountain pass now has to be climbed. It is only a short distance, perhaps two miles, but all the way up I am subjected to the disagreeable experience of having my footsteps dogged by two armed villagers. There is nothing significant or exceptional about their being armed, it is true, but what their object is in stepping almost on my heels for the whole distance up the acclivity is beyond my comprehension. Uncertain whether their intentions are honest or not, it is anything but reassuring to have them following within sword's reach of one's back, especially when trundling a bicycle up a lonely mountain trail. I have no right to order them back or forward, neither do I care to have them think I entertain suspicions of their intentions, for in all probability they are but honest villagers, satisfying the curiosity in their own peculiar manner and doubtless deriving additional pleasure from seeing one of their fellow mortals laboriously engaged while they leisurely follow. We all know how soul-satisfying it is for some people to sit around and watch their fellow man saw wood. Whenever I halt for a breathing spell, they do likewise. When I continue on, they promptly take up their line of march, following as before in silence, and when the summit is reached, they seat themselves on a rock and watch my progress down the opposite slope. A couple of miles down grade brings me to Torbali, a place of several thousand inhabitants with a small covered bazaar, and every appearance of a thriving interior town as thrift goes in Asia Minor. It is high noon, and I immediately set about finding the wherewithal to make a substantial meal. I find that upon arriving at one of these towns, the best possible disposition to make of the bicycle is to deliver it into the hands of some respectable Turk, request him to preserve it from the meddlesome crowd, and then pay no further attention to it until ready to start. Attempting to keep watch over it oneself is sure to result in a dismal failure, whereas an Osmanli greybeard becomes an ever-willing custodian regards its safekeeping as appealing to his honor, and will stand guard over it for hours if necessary, keeping the noisy and curious crowds of his townspeople at a respectful distance, by brandishing a thick stick at any one who ventures to approach too near. These men will never accept payment for this highly appreciated service. It seems to appeal to the Osmanli spirit of hospitality. They seem happy as clams at high tide while gratuitously protecting my property, and I have known them to unhesitatingly incur the displeasure of their own neighbors by officiously carrying the bicycle off into an inner room, not even granting the assembled people the harmless privilege of looking at it from a distance, for there might be some among the crowd possessed of the fenagous, evil eye and rather than have them fix their baleful gaze upon the important piece of property left under his charge by a stranger, he chivalrously braves the displeasure of his own people. Smiling complacently at their shouts of disapproval, he triumphantly bears it out of their sight and from the fell influence of the possible fenagous. Another strange and seemingly paradoxical phase of these occasions is that when the crowd is shouting out its noisiest protests against the withdrawal of the machine from popular inspection, any of the protesters will eagerly volunteer to help carry the machine inside, should the self-important personage having it in custody condescend to make the slightest intimation that such service would be acceptable. Handing over the bicycle, then, to the safe-keeping of a respectable Kaveji, coffee con employ, I sally forth in quest of eatables. The Kaveji has it immediately carried inside and set up on one of the divans, in which elevated position he graciously permits it to be gazed upon by the people, who swarm into his con in such numbers as to make it impossible for him to transact any business. Under the guidance of another volunteer, who, besides acting the part of guide, takes particular care that I get lumping weight, etc., I proceed to the et G's and procure some very good mutton chops, and from there to the ekmek G's for bread. This latter person straightway volunteers to cook my chops, 
sending to his residence for a tin dish some chopped onions and butter he puts them in his oven and in a few minutes sets them before me browned and buttered meanwhile he has dispatched a youth somewhere on another errand who now returns and supplements the savory chops with a small dish of honey in the comb and some green figs seated on the generous hearted ekmek g's dough board i make a dinner good enough for anybody end of chapter 12 through the angora goat country part 1 recording by pamela krantz Section 27 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Section 27 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. Chapter 12. Through the Angora Goat Country, Part 2. While discussing these acceptable viands, I am somewhat startled at hearing one of the worst cuss-words in the English language repeated several times by one of the two Turks, engaged in the self-imposing duty of keeping people out of the place while I am eating, a kindly piece of courtesy that wins for them my warmest esteem. The old fellow proves to be a Crimean veteran, and besides a much-prized medal he brought back with him, he somehow managed to acquire this discreditable, perhaps, but nevertheless unmistakable, memento of having at some time or other campaigned it with Tommy Atkins. I try to engage him in conversation, but find that he doesn't know another solitary word of English. He simply repeats the profane expression alluded to in a parrot-like manner, without knowing anything of its meaning has in fact forgotten whether it is english french or italian he only knows it as a frank expression and in that he is perfectly right it is a frank expression a very frank expression indeed as if determined to do something agreeable in return for the gratifying interest i seem to be taking in him on account of his profanity he now disappears and shortly returns with a young man who turns out to be a greek and the only representative of Christendom in Torbali. The old Turk introduces him as a Karistian, Christian, and then, in reply to questioners, explains to the interested onlookers that although an Englishman, and unlike the Greeks, friendly to the Turks, I am also a Karistian, one of those queer specimens of humanity whose perverse nature prevents them from embracing the religion of the prophet and thereby gaining an entrance into the promised land of the kara guz keys black-eyed houris during this profound exposition of my merits and demerits the wondering people stare at me with an expression on their faces that plainly betrays their inability to comprehend so queer an individual they look as if they think me the oddest specimen they have ever met and taking into due consideration my novel mode of conveyance, and that many Trabali people never before saw an Englishman, this is probably not far from a correct interpretation of their thoughts. Unfortunately, the streets and environments of Trabali are in a most wretched condition. To escape sprained ankles, it is necessary to walk with a great deal of caution, and the idea of bicycling through them is simply absurd. Nevertheless, the populace turns out in high glee, and their expectations run riot as I relieve the Cave G of his faithful vigil and bring forth my wheel. They want me to bin in their stuffy little bazaar, crowded with people and donkeys, mere alleyways with scarcely a twenty-yard stretch from one angle to another. The surface is a disorganized mass of holes and stones over which the wary and hesitative donkey picks his way with the greatest care, and yet the popular clamor is bin, bin, bazaar, bazaar. The people who have been showing me how courteously and considerately it is possible for Turks to treat a stranger 
now seem to have become filled with a determination not to be convinced by anything I say to the contrary. And one of the most importunate and headstrong among them sticks his bearded face almost up against my own placid countenance. I have already learned to wear an unruffled, martyr-like expression on these howling occasions, and fairly shrieks out, Bin! Bin! as though determined to hoist me into the saddle, whether or no, by sheer force of his own desire to see me there. This person ought to know better, for he wears the green turban of holiness, proving him to have made a pilgrimage to Mecca. But the universal desire to see the bicycle ridden seems to level all distinctions. All this tumult, it must not be forgotten, is carried on in perfect good humor, but it is nevertheless very annoying to have it seem that I am too boorish to repay their kindness by letting them see me ride, even walking out of town to avoid gratifying them, as some of them doubtless think. These little embarrassments are some of the penalties of not knowing enough of the language to be able to enter into explanations. Learning that there is a piece of wagon road immediately outside the town, I succeed in silencing the clamor to some extent by promising to ride when the Araba Yol is reached, whereupon hundreds come flocking out of town, following expectantly at my heels, consoling myself with the thought that perhaps I will be able to mount and shake the clamorous multitude off by a spurt. The promised Araba Yol is announced, but the fates are plainly against me today, for I find this road leading up a mountain slope from the very beginning. The people cluster expectantly around while I endeavor to explain that they are doomed to disappointment, that to be disappointed in their expectations to see the Araba ridden is plainly their kismet, for the hill is too steep to be ridden. They laugh knowingly and give me to understand that they are not quite such simpletons as to think that an Araba cannot be ridden along an Araba yol. This is an Araba yol, they argue. You are riding an Araba. We have seen even our own clumsily made Arabas go up here time and again. Therefore it is evident that you are not sincere. And they gather closer around and spend another ten minutes in coaxing. It is a ridiculous position to be in. These people use the most endearing terms imaginable. Some of them kiss the bicycle and would get down and kiss my dust-begrimed moccasins if I would permit it. At coaxing they are the most persevering people I ever saw. To convince them of the impossibility of riding up the hill, I allow a muscular young Turk to climb into the saddle and try to propel himself forward while I hold him up. This has the desired effect, and they accompany me farther up the slope to where they fancy it to be somewhat less steep, a score of all too willing hands being extended to assist in trundling the machine. Here again I am subjected to another interval of coaxing and this same annoying program is carried out several times before I obtain my release. They are the most headstrong, persistent people I have yet encountered. The natural, pig-headed disposition of the unspeakable Turk seems to fairly run riot in this little valley, which at the point where Tarbali is situated contracts to a mere ravine between rugged heights. For a full mile up the mountain road, and with a patient insistence quite commendable in itself, they persist in their aggravating attentions, aggravating notwithstanding that they remain in the best of humor, and treat me with the greatest consideration in every other respect. Promptly and severely checking any unruly conduct among the youngsters, which once or twice reveals itself in the shape of a stone pitched into the wheel or some other pleasantry peculiar to the immature Turkish mind. At length one of the enterprising young men, with wild visions of a flying wheelman descending the mountain road with lightning-like velocity, comes prominently to the fore, and unblushingly announces that they have been bringing me along the wrong road, and with something akin to exultation in his gestures, motions for me to turn about and ride back. Had the others seconded this brilliant idea, there was nothing to prevent me from being misled by the statement. But his conduct is at once condemned, for though pig-headed, they are honest of heart, and have no idea of resorting to trickery to gain their object. 
It now occurs to me that perhaps, if I turn around and ride downhill a short distance, they will see that my trundling uphill is really a matter of necessity instead of choice, and thus rid me of their undesirable presence. Hitherto the slope has been too abrupt to admit of any such thought, but now it becomes more gradual. As I expected, the proposition is heralded with unanimous shouts of approval, and I take particular care to stipulate that after this they are to follow me no farther. Any condition is acceptable to them as long as it includes seeing how the thing is ridden. It is not without certain misgivings that I mount and start cautiously down the declivity between two rows of turbaned and fezbedecked heads, for I have not yet forgotten the disagreeable actions of the mob at Adrianople in running up behind and giving the bicycle vigorous forward pushes, a proceeding that would be not altogether devoid of danger here, for besides the gradient one side of the road is a yawning chasm. These people, however, confine themselves solely to howling with delight, proving themselves to be well-meaning and comparatively well-behaved after all. Having performed my part of the compact, a few of the leading men shake hands and express their gratitude and well-wishes, and after calling back several youngsters who seem unwilling to abide by the agreement, forbidding them to follow any farther, the whole noisy company proceed along footpaths leading down the cliffs to town which is in plain view almost immediately below. The entire distance between Tarbali and Keshtebek, where tomorrow forenoon I cross over into the Vilayet of Angora, is through a rough country for bicycling. Forest-clad mountains, rocky gorges, and rolling hills characterize the landscape. Rocky passes lead over mountains where the caravans engaged in the exportation of mohair ever since that valuable commodity first began to be exported, have worn ditch-like trails through ridges of solid rock three feet in depth, over the less rocky and precipitous hills beyond a comprehensive view is obtained of the country ahead, and these time-honored trails are seen leading in many directions, ramifying the country like veins of one common system, which are necessarily drawn together wherever there is but one pass. Parts of these commercial byways are frequently found to be roughly hedged with wild pear and other hardy shrubs indigenous to the country, the relics of bygone days, planted when these now barren hills were cultivated to protect the growing crops from depredation. Old millstones with depressions in the center, formerly used for pounding corn in, and pieces of hewn masonry are occasionally seen as one traverses these ancient trails marking the site of a village in days long past, when cultivation and centers of industry were more conspicuous features of Asia Minor than they are today. Lone graves and graves in clusters, marked by rude unchiseled headstones or oblong mounds of boulders, are frequently observed, completing the scene of general decay. While riding along these tortuous ways, the smooth-worn camel paths sometimes affording excellent wheeling, the view ahead is often obstructed by the untrimmed hedges on either side, and one sometimes almost comes into collision in turning a bend with horsemen, wild-looking, armed formidably in the manner peculiar to the country, as though they were assassins stealing forth under cover. Occasionally a female bestriding a donkey suddenly appears, but twenty or thirty yards ahead, the narrowness and the crookedness of the hedged-in trail favoring these abrupt meetings. Shrouded, perhaps, in a white abbas, and not infrequently riding a white donkey, they seldom fail to inspire thoughts of ghostly equestrians gliding silently along these now half-deserted pathways. Many a hasty but sincere appeal is made to Allah by these frightened ladies as they fancy themselves brought suddenly face to face with the evil one. More than once this afternoon I overhear that agonizing appeal for providential aid and protection of which I am the innocent cause. The second thought of the lady, as if it occurred to her that with any portion of her features visible she would be adjudged unworthy of divine interference in her behalf, is to make sure that her yashmak is not disarranged, and then comes a mute appeal to her attendant, if she has one, for some explanation of the strange apparition so suddenly and unexpectedly confronting them. 
In view of the nature of the country and the distance of Keshtebek, I have no idea of being able to reach that place tonight, and when I arrive at the ruins of an old mud-built khan at dusk, I conclude to sup off the memories of my excellent dinner and a piece of bread I have in my pocket, and avail myself of its shelter for the night. While eating my frugal repast, up ride three mule tears who, after consulting among themselves some minutes, finally picket their animals and prepare to join my company. Whether for all night or only to give their animals a feed of grass, I am unable to say. Anyhow, not liking the idea of spending the whole night, or any part of it, in these unfrequented hills with three ruffianly-looking natives, I again take up my line of march along mountain mule paths for some three miles farther, when I descend into a small valley and it being too dark to undertake the task of pitching my tent, I roll myself up in it instead. Soothed by the music of a babbling brook, I am almost asleep, when a glorious meteor shoots athwart the sky, lighting up the valley with startling vividness for one brief moment, and then the dusky pall of night descends, and I am gathered into the arms of Morpheus. Toward morning it grows chilly, but I am fitfully dozing in the early gray, when I am awakened by the bleeding and the pattering feet of a small sea of Angora goats. Starting up, I discover that I am at that moment the mysterious and interesting subject of conversation between four goat herds, who have apparently been quietly surveying my sleeping form for some minutes. Like our covetous friends beyond the Karasu Pass, these early morning acquaintances are unlovely representatives of their profession. Their sword blades are half naked, the scabbards being rudely fashioned out of two sections of wood, roughly shaped to the blade, and bound together at top and bottom with twine, in addition to which are bell-mouthed pistols half the size of a Queen Bess blunderbuss. This villainous-looking quartet does not make a very reassuring picture in the foreground of one's waking moments, but they are probably the most harmless mortals imaginable. Anyhow, after seeing me astir, they pass on with their flocks and herds, without even submitting me to the customary catechizing. The morning light reveals in my surroundings a most charming little valley, about a half-mile wide, walled in on the south by towering mountains covered with a forest of pine and cedar, and on the north by low brush-covered hills. A small brook dances along the middle, and thin pasturage and scattered clumps of willow fringe the stream. Three miles down the valley I arrive at a roadside con, where I obtain some hard bread that requires soaking in water to make it eatable, and some wormy raisins, and from this choice assortment I attempt to fill the aching void of a ravenous appetite, with what success I leave to the reader's imagination. Here the kanji and another man deliver themselves of one of those strange requests peculiar to the Asiatic Turk. They pull the contents of their respective treasuries, making in all perhaps three majidis, and with the simplicity of children whose minds have not yet dawned upon the crooked ways of a wicked world, they offer me the money in exchange for my White House leather case with its contents. They have not the remotest idea of what the case contains but their inquisitiveness apparently overcomes all other considerations. Perhaps, however, their seemingly innocent way of offering me the money may be their own peculiar deep scheme of inducing me to reveal the nature of its contents. For a short distance down the valley I find a road that is generally rideable, when it contracts to a mere ravine, and the only road is the boulder-strewn bed of the stream, which is now nearly dry, but in the spring is evidently a raging torrent. An hour of this delectable exercise, and I emerge into a region of undulating hills, among which are scattered wheat fields and clusters of mud hovels, which it would be a stretch of courtesy to term villages. Here the poverty of the soil, or of the water supply, is heralded to every observant eye by the poverty-stricken appearance of the villagers. As I wheel along, I observe that these poor, half-naked wretches, are gathering their scant harvest by the laborious process of pulling it up by the roots and carrying it to their common threshing floor on donkeys' backs. Here also I come to a camp of Turkish gypsies. They are dark-skinned with an abundance of long black hair dangling about their shoulders like our Indians. 
The women and larger girls are radiant in scarlet calico and other high-colored fabrics, and they wear a profusion of bead necklaces, armlets, anklets, and other ornaments dear to the semi-savage mind. The younger children are as wild and as innocent of clothing as their boon companions, the dogs. The men affect the fez and general Turkish style of dress. With many unorthodox trappings and embellishments, however, and with their own wild appearance, their high-colored females, naked youngsters, wolfish-looking dogs, picketed horses, and smoke-brown tents, they make a scene that for picturesqueness can give odds even to the wigwam villages of Uncle Sam's Crow Scouts on the Little Bighorn River, Montana Territory, which is saying a good deal. Twelve miles from my last night's rendezvous, I passed through Keshtebek, a village that has evidently seen better days. The ruins of a large stone khan take up all the central portion of the place. Massive gateways of hewn stone, ornamented by the sculptor's chisel, are still standing, eloquent monuments of a more prosperous era. The enterprising descendants of the men who erected this substantial and commodious retreat for passing caravans and travelers are now content to house themselves and their families in tumble-down hovels and to drift aimlessly and unambitiously along on wretched fare and worse clothes from the cradle to the grave. The Keshtebek people seem principally interested to know why I am traveling without any Zaptia escort. A stranger traveling through these wooded mountains without guard or guide, and not being able to converse with the natives seems almost beyond their belief. When they ask me why I have no Zaptia, I tell them I have one, and show them the Smith and Wesson. They seem to regard this as a very witty remark, and say to each other, He is right, an English Effendi and an American revolver don't require any Zaptias to take care of them. They are quite able to look out for themselves. From Keshtebek my road leads down another small valley, and before long I find myself in the Angora Villa yet bowling briskly eastward over a most excellent road, not the mule paths of an hour ago, but a broad, well-graded highway, as good, clear into Nali Khan as the roads of any New England state. This sudden transition is not unnaturally productive of some astonishment on my part, and inquiries at Nali Khan result in the information that my supposed graded wagon road is nothing less than the bed of a proposed railway. The preliminary grading for which has been finished between Keshtebek and Angora for some time. This valley seems to be the gateway into a country entirely different from what I have hitherto traversed. Unlike the forest-crowned mountains and shrubbery hills of this morning, the mountains towering aloft on every hand are now entirely destitute of vegetation, but they are in no wise objectionable to look upon on that account, for they have their own peculiar features of loveliness. Various colored rocks and clays enter into their composition. Their giant sides are fantastically streaked and seamed, with blue, yellow, green, and red. These variegated masses, encompassing one round about on every side, are a glorious sight. They are more interesting, more imposing, more grand and impressive, even than the piney heights of Kojali. Many of these mountains bear evidence of mineral formation and anywhere in the Occident would be the scene of busy operations. In Constantinople I heard an English mineralist, who has lived many years in the country, express the belief that there is more mineral buried in these Asia Minor hills than in a corresponding area in any other part of the world, that he knew people who for years have had their eye on certain localities of unusual promise, waiting patiently for the advantages of mineral development to dawn upon the sluggish mind of Osmanli statesmen. At present it is useless to attempt prospecting, for there is no guarantee of security. No sooner is anything of value discovered than the finder is embarrassed by imperial taxes, local taxes, bakshish, and all manner of demands on his resources, often ending in having everything coolly confiscated by the government, which, like the dog in the manger, will do nothing with it and is perfectly contented and apathetic so long as no one else is reaping any benefit from it. The general rideableness of this shaman d'affaire, as the natives have been taught to call it, proves not to be without certain disadvantages. 
for during the afternoon I unwittingly managed to do considerable mischief. Suddenly meeting two horsemen, when bowling at a moderate pace around a bend, the horse of one takes violent exception to my intrusion, and in spite of the excellent horsemanship of his rider, backs down into a small ravine, both horse and rider coming to grief in some water at the bottom. Fortunately, neither man nor horse sustained any more serious injury than a few scratches and bruises, though it might easily have resulted in broken bones. Soon after this affair, another donkey rider takes to his heels, or rather to his donkey's heels across country, and his long-eared and generally sure-footed charger ingloriously comes to earth. But I feel quite certain that no damage is sustained in this case, for both steed and rider are instantly on their feet. The bold steeplechaser looks wildly and apprehensively towards me, but observing that I am giving chase, it dawns upon his mind that I am perhaps after all a human being, whereupon he refrains from further flight. Wheeling down the gentle declivity of a broad, smooth road that almost deserves the title of boulevard, leading through the vineyards and gardens of Nalikan's environments, at quite a rattling pace, I startle a quarry of four deers, robed in white mantles, who, the moment they observe the strange apparition approaching them at so vengeful a speed, bolt across a neighboring vineyard like the all-possessed. The rapidity of their movements, notwithstanding the impedimenta of their flowing shrouds, readily suggests the idea of a quarry of deers, but whether they are pretty deers or not, of course, their yashmaks fail to reveal but in return for the beaming smile that lights up our usually solemn-looking countenance at their ridiculously hasty flight, as a reciprocation pure and simple, I suppose we ought to give them the benefit of the doubt. The evening at Nali Khan is a comparatively happy occasion. It is Friday, the Mussulman Sabbath. Everybody seems fairly well dressed for a Turkish interior town. And more important than all, there is a good smooth road on which to satisfy the popular curiosity. On this latter fact depends all the difference between an agreeable and a disagreeable time. And at Nali Khan everything passes off pleasantly for all concerned. Apart from the novelty of my conveyance, few Europeans have ever visited these interior places under the same conditions as myself. They have usually provided themselves beforehand with letters of introduction to the pashas and mudirs of the villages, who have entertained them as their guests during the stay. On the contrary, I have seen fit to provide myself with none of these way-smoothing missives, and in consequence of my linguistic shortcomings, immediately upon reaching a town, I have to surrender myself, as it were, to the intelligence and good will of the common people. To their credit be it recorded, I can invariably count on their not lacking at least the latter qualification. The little con I stop at is, of course, besieged by the usual crowd. But they are a happy-hearted, contented people, bent on lionizing me the best they know how. For have they not witnessed my marvelous performance of riding an araba? A beautiful web-like araba, more beautiful than any machina they ever saw before, and in a manner that upsets all their previous ideas of equilibrium. Have I not proved how much I esteem them by riding over and over again for fresh batches of new arrivals? until the whole population has seen the performance? And am I not hobnobbing and making myself accessible to the people, instead of being exclusive and going straightway to the pashas, shutting myself up and permitting none but a few privileged persons to intrude upon my privacy? All these things appeal strongly to the better nature of the imaginative Turks, and not a moment during the whole evening am I suffered to be unconscious of their great appreciation of it all. A bountiful supper of scrambled eggs fried in butter, and then the Milazim of Zeptias takes me under his special protection and shows me around the town. He shows me where but a few days ago the Nalikan Bazaar, with all its multifarious merchandise, was destroyed by fire, and points out the temporary stalls among the black ruins that have been erected by the Pasha for the poor merchants, who with heavy hearts and doleful countenance are trying to recuperate their shattered fortunes. He calls my attention to two-story wooden houses and other modest structures, which in the simplicity of his Asiatic soul 
he imagines are objects of interest, and then takes me to the headquarters of his men, and sends out for coffee in order to make me literally his guest. Here in his office he calls my attention to a chromo hanging on the wall, which he says came from Stamboul. Stamboul, where the Asiatic Turk fondly imagines all wonderful things originate. This chromo is certainly a wonderful thing in its way. It represents an English trooper in the late Sudan expedition, kneeling behind the shelter of a dead camel, and with a revolver in each hand, keeping at bay a crowd of Arab spearmen. The soldier is badly wounded, but with smoking revolvers and an evident determination to die hard, he has checked and is still checking the advance of somewhere about 10,000 Arab troops. No wonder the people of Keshtebek thought an Englishman and a revolver quite safe in traveling without Zaptias. Some of them had probably been to Nalikan and seen this same chromo. When it grows dark, the mulazim takes me to a public coffee garden, near the burned bazaar, a place which is really no garden at all, only some broad, rude benches encircling a round water tank or fountain, and which is fenced in with a low, wobbly picket fence. Seated cross-legged on the benches are a score of sober-sided Turks, smoking narguilas and cigarettes and sipping coffee. The feeble light dispensed by a lantern on top of a pole in the center of the tank makes the darkness of the garden barely visible. A continuous splashing of water, the result of the overflow from a pipe, projecting three feet above the surface, furnishes the only music. The sole auricular indication of the presence of patrons is when some customer orders cave or nargila in a scarcely audible tone of voice, and this is the Turk's idea of an evening's enjoyment. Returning to the Khan, I find it full of happy people looking at the bicycle, commenting on the wonderful marifet, skill, apparent in its mechanism, and the no less marvelous marifet required in riding it. They ask me if I made it myself, and hotch lira? How many liras? And then requesting the privilege of looking at my tascari, they find rare amusement in comparing my personal charms with the description of my form and features as interpreted by the passport officer in Galata. Two men among them have in some manner picked up a sand from the seashore of the English language. One of them is a very small sand indeed, the solitary negative phrase, no, nevertheless. During the evening he inspires the attentive auditors with respect for his linguistic accomplishments by asking me numerous questions, and then anticipating a negative reply, forestalls it himself by querying, no? The other linguist has, in some unaccountable manner, added the ability to say good morning to his other accomplishments. And when, about time to retire, and the crowd reluctantly bestirs itself to depart from the magnetic presence of the bicycle, I notice an extraordinary degree of mysterious whispering and suppressed amusement going on among them, and then they commence filing slowly out of the door with the linguistic person at their head. As that learned individual reaches the threshold, he turns toward me, makes a salam, and says, Good morning, and every one of the company, even down to the irrepressible youngster, who was cuffed a minute ago for venturing to twirl a pedal, and who now forms the rear guard of the column, likewise makes a salam and says, Good morning. Quilts are provided for me, and I spend the night on the divan of the Khan. A few roving mosquitoes wander in at the open window, and sing their siren songs around my couch. A few entomological specimens sally forth from their permanent abode in the lining of the quilts, to attack me and disturb my slumbers but later experience teaches me to regard my slumbers to-night as comparatively peaceful and undisturbed. In the early morning I am awakened by the murmuring voices of visitors gathering to see me off. Coffee is handed to me ere my eyes are fairly open, and the savory odor of eggs already sizzling in the pan assail my olfactory nerves. The kanji is an Osmanli and a good Mussulman, and when ready to depart, I carelessly toss him my purse and motion for him to help himself, a thing I would not care to do with the keeper of a small tavern in any other country, or of any other nation. 
Were he entertaining me in a private capacity, he would feel injured at any hint of payment. But being a kanji, he opens the purse and extracts a cherik. Twenty cents. End of chapter 12 Through the Angora Goat Country Part 2 Recording by Pamela Krantz Section 28 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1, by Thomas Stevens. 13. Key Bazaar, Angora, and Eastward. Chapter 13. Bay Bazaar, Angora, and Eastward. A trundle of half an hour up the steep slopes leading out of another of those narrow valleys in which all these towns are situated, and then comes a gentle declivity, extending with but little interruption for several miles, winding in and out among the inequalities of an elevated tableland. The mountain breezes blow cool and exhilarating, and just before descending into the little Sharkhan Valley, I pass some interesting cliffs of castellated rocks, the sight of which immediately wafts my memory back across the thousands of miles of land and water to what they are almost a counterpart of the famous castellated rocks of Green River, Wyoming territory. Another scary youth takes to his heels as I descend into the valley and halt at the village of Sharkhan a mere shapeless cluster of mud hovels. Before one of these ragged agriculturists solemnly presides over a small heap of what I unfortunately mistake at the time for pumpkins. I say unfortunately because after knowledge makes it highly probable that they were the celebrated Sharkhan musk melons, famous far and wide for their exquisite flavor. The variety can be grown elsewhere, but strange to say, the peculiar, delicate flavor which makes them so celebrated is absent when they vegetate anywhere outside this particular locality. It is supposed to be owing to some peculiar mineral properties of the soil. The Sharkhan Valley is a wild, weird-looking region, looking as if it were habitually subjected to destructive downpourings of rain that have washed the grand old mountains out of all resemblance to neighboring ranges round about. They are a soft, shaly composition, and are worn by the elements into all manner of queer, fantastic shapes. This, together with the same variegated colors, observed yesterday afternoon, gives them a distinctive appearance not easily forgotten. They are grand, gloomy, and peculiar, especially are they peculiar. The soil of the valley itself seems to be drift mud from the surrounding hills. A stream furnishes water sufficient to irrigate a number of rice fields, whose brilliant emerald hue loses none of its brightness from being surrounded by a framework of barren hills. Ascending from this interesting locality, my road now traverses a dreary, monotonous district of whitish, sun-blistered hills, waterless and verdureless for fourteen miles. The cool, refreshing breezes of early morning have been dissipated by the growing heat of the sun. The road continues fairly good, and while riding I am unconscious of oppressive heat but the fierce rays of the sun blisters my neck and the backs of my hands, turning them red and causing the skin to peel off a few days afterward, besides ruining a section of my gossamer coat exposed on top of the Lamson carrier. The air is dry and thirst-creating. There is considerable hill-climbing to be done, and long ere the fourteen miles are covered, I become sufficiently warm and thirsty to have little thought of anything else but reaching the means of quenching thirst. Away off in the distance ahead is observed a dark object, whose character is indistinct through the shimmering radiation from the heated hills, but which, upon a nearer approach, proves to be a jujube tree a welcome sentinel in those arid regions, beckoning the thirsty traveler to a never-failing supply of water. At the jujube tree I find a most magnificent fountain, pouring forth at least twenty gallons of delicious cold water to the minute. 
The spring has been walled up, and a marble spout inserted, which gushes forth a round, crystal column, as though endeavoring to compensate for the prevailing aridness, and to apologize to the thirsty wayfarer for the inhospitableness of its surroundings. Miles away, to the northward, perched high up among the ravines of a sun-baked mountain spur, one can see a circumscribed area of luxuriant foliage. This conspicuous oasis in the desert marks the source of the beautiful roadside fountain, which traverses a natural subterranean passageway between these two distant points. These little isolated clumps of waving trees, rearing their green heads conspicuously above the surrounding barrenness, are an unerring indication of both water and human habitations. Often one sees them suddenly, when least expected, nestling in a little depression high up some mountain slope far away. The little dark green area looking almost black in contrast with the whitish color of the hills. These are literally oases in the desert, on a small scale, and although from a distance no sign of human habitations appeal, since they are but mud hovels corresponding in color to the hills themselves, a closer examination invariably reveals well-worn donkey trails leading from different directions to the spot, and perchance a white-turbaned donkey rider slowly wending his way along the trail. The heat becomes almost unbearable. The region of treeless, shelterless hills continues to characterize my way, and when, at two o'clock p.m., I reach the town of Bay Bazaar, I conclude that the thirty-nine miles already covered is a limit of discretion today, considering the oppressive heat, and seek the friendly accommodation of a khan. There I find that, while shelter from the fierce heat of the sun is obtainable, peace and quiet are altogether out of the question. Bay Bazaar is a place of 8,000 inhabitants, and the Khan at once becomes the objective point of, it seems to me, half the population. I put the machine up on a barricaded Yatak divan and climb up after it. Here I am out of the meddlesome reach of the matting crowd, but there is no escaping from the bedlam-like clamor of their voices, and not a few, yielding to their uncontrollable curiosity, undertake to invade my retreat. These invariably skedaddle respectfully at my request, but newcomers are continually intruding. The tumult is quite deafening, and I should certainly not be surprised to have the Kanji request me to leave the place, on the reasonable ground that my presence is, under the circumstances, detrimental to his interests, since the crush is so great that transacting business is out of the question. The Khan G, however, proves to be a speculative individual, and quite contrary thoughts are occupying his mind. His subordinate, the Kaveh G, presents himself with mournful countenance and humble attitude, points with a perplexed air to the surging mass of fezes, turbans, and upturned Turkish faces, and explains, what needs no explanation other than the evidence of one's own eyes, that he cannot transact his business of making coffee. This is your Khan, I reply. Why not turn them out? Mashallah Effendi, I would, but for every one I turned out, two others would come in, the sons of burnt fathers, he says, casting a reproachful look down at the straggling crowd of his fellow countrymen. What do you suppose doing then? I inquire. Catch para, Effendi, he answers, smiling approvingly at his own suggestion. The enterprising Kaveh advocates charging them an admission fee of five paras, half a cent, each as a measure of protection, both for himself and me, proposing to make a divvy of the proceeds. Naturally enough, the idea of making a farthing show of either myself or the bicycle is anything but an agreeable proposition, but it is plainly the only way of protecting the Kaveh G and his Khan from being mobbed all the afternoon and far into the night by a surging mass of inquisitive people. So I reluctantly give him permission to do whatever he pleases to protect himself. I have no idea of the financial outcome of the speculative Khan G's expedient, but the arrangement secures me to some extent from the rabble, though not to any appreciable extent from being worried. The people nearly drive me out of my seven senses with their peculiar ideas of making themselves agreeable and honoring me. They offer me cigarettes, coffee, mastic, cognac, fruit, 
raw cucumbers, melons, everything, in fact, but the one thing I would really appreciate, a few minutes' quiet, undisturbed enjoyment of my own company. This is not to be secured by locking oneself in a room, nor by any other expedient I have yet tried in Asia. After examining the bicycle, they want to see my a la franga watch and my revolver. Then they want to know how much each thing costs, and scores of other things that appeal strongly to their excessively inquisitive natures. One old fellow, yearning for a closer acquaintance, asks me if I ever saw the wonderful Chu 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 Chemin de Fer at Stambol, adding that he has seen it and intends some day to ride on it. Another hands me a Crimean medal, and says he fought against the Muscovs with the Ingilis, while a third one solemnly introduces himself as a machinist, machinist, fancying, I suppose, that there is some fraternal connection between himself and me on account of the bicycle being a machina. I begin to feel uncomfortably like a curiosity in a dime museum, a position not exactly congenial to my nature. So, after enduring this sort of thing for an hour, I appoint the Kaveji custodian of the bicycle and sally forth to meander about the bazaar a while, where I can at least have the advantage of being able to move about. Upon returning to the Khan an hour later, I find there a man whom I remember passing on the road. He was riding a donkey. The road was all that could be desired and I swept past him at racing speed, purely on the impulse of the moment, in order to treat him to the abstract sensation of blank amazement. This impromptu action of mine is now bearing its legitimate fruit, for, surrounded by a most attentive audience, the wonderstruck donkey-rider is endeavoring, by word and gesture, to impress upon them some idea of the speed at which I swept past him and vanished around a bend. The Cave G now approaches me, puffing his cheeks out like a penny balloon, and jerking his thumb in the direction of the street door. Seeing that I don't quite comprehend the meaning of this mysterious facial contortion, he whispers confidentially aside, Pasha, and again goes through the highly interesting performance of puffing out his cheeks and winking in a knowing manner. He then says, also confidentially and aside, Lira winking even more significantly than before. By all this theatrical by-play, the Kaveji means that the Pasha, a man of extraordinary social, political, and, above all, financial importance, has expressed a wish to see the bicycle, and is now outside. And the Kaveji, with many significant winks and mysterious hints of lira, advises me to take the machine outside and ride it for the Pasha's special benefit. A portion of the street nearby is rideable under difficulties, so I conclude to act on the Kavaji's suggestion, simply to see what comes of it. Nothing particular comes of it, whereupon the Kavaji and his patrons all express themselves as disgusted beyond measure because the Pasha failed to give me a present. Shortly after this, I find myself hobnobbing with a small company of ex-Mecca pilgrims, holy personages with huge green turbans and flowing gowns. One of them is evidently very holy indeed, almost too holy for human associations, one would imagine, for in addition to his green turban, he wears a broad green cammerbund and a green undergarment. He is, in fact, very green indeed. Then a crazy person pushes his way forward and wants me to cure him of his mental infirmity. At all events, I cannot imagine what else he wants. The man is crazy as a loon. He cannot even give utterance to his own mother tongue, but tries to express himself in a series of disjointed grunts beside which the soul-harrowing efforts of a broken-winded donkey are quite melodious. Someone has probably told him that I am a Hakim, or a wonderful person on general principles, and the fellow is sufficiently conscious of his own condition to come forward and endeavor to grunt himself into my favorable consideration. Later in the evening, a couple of young Turkish dandies come round to the Khan and favor me with a serenade. One of them twangs a doleful melody on a small stringed instrument, something like the Slavonian tamborica, and the other one sings a doleful, melancholy song, Nearly all songs and tunes in Mohammedan countries seem doleful and melancholy. 
Afterwards, an Arab camel driver joins in with a dance and furnishes some genuine amusement with his hip play and bodily contortions. This would scarcely be considered dancing from our point of view, but it is according to the ideas of the East. The dandies are distinguishable from the common run of Turkish bipeds, like the same species in other countries, by the fearful and wonderful cut of their garments. The Turkish dandy wears a tassel to his fez about three times larger than the regulation size, and he binds it carefully down to the fez with a red and yellow silk handkerchief. He wears a jaunty-looking short jacket of bright blue cloth, cut behind so that it reaches but little below his shoulder blades. The object of this is apparently to display the whole of the multi-fold cammerbund, a wonderful colored waist scarf that is wound round and round the waist many times, and which is held at one end by an assistant while the wearer spins around like a dancing dervish, the assistant advancing gradually as the human bobbin takes up the length. The dandy wears knee breeches corresponding in color to his jacket, woolen stockings of mingled red and black and low slipper-like shoes he allows his hair to fall about his eyes a la negligee and affects a reckless lovelorn air the last party of sightseers for the day call around near midnight some time after i have retired to sleep they awaken me with their garrulous observations concerning the bicycle which they are critically examining close to my head with a classic lamp but I readily forgive them their nocturnal intrusion, since they awaken me to the first opportunity of hearing women wailing for the dead. A dozen or so of women are wailing forth their lamentations in the silent night, but a short distance from the Khan. I can look out of a small opening in the wall near my shakedown and see them moving about the house and premises by the flickering glare of torches. I could never have believed the female form divine capable of producing such doleful, unearthly music, but there is no telling what these shrouded forms are really capable of doing, since the opportunity of passing one's judgment upon their accomplishments is confined solely to an occasional glimpse of a languishing eye. The Kavaji, who is acting the part of explanatory lecturer to these nocturnal visitors, explains the meaning of the wailing by pantomimically describing a corpse and then goes on to explain that the smallest imaginable proportion of the lamentations that are making night hideous is genuine grief for the departed, most of the uproar being made by a body of professional mourners hired for the occasion. When I awake in the morning, the unearthly wailing is still going vigorously forward, from which I infer they have been keeping it up all night. Though gradually becoming inured to all sorts of strange scenes and customs, the united wailing and lamentations of a houseful of women, awakening the echoes of the silent night, savor too much of things supernatural and unearthly not to jar unpleasantly on the senses. The custom is, however, on the eve of being relegated to the musty past by the Ottoman government. In the larger cities, where there are corpses to be wailed over every night, it has been found so objectionable to the expanding intellects of the more enlightened Turks that it has been prohibited as a public nuisance. And these days, it is only in such conservative interior towns as Bay Bazaar that the custom still obtains. When about starting early on the following morning, the kanji begs me to be seated and then several men who have been waiting around since before daybreak vanish hastily through the doorway in a few minutes i am favored with a small company of leading citizens who having for various reasons failed to swell yesterday's throng have taken the precaution to post these messengers to watch my movements and report when i am ready to depart our grunting patient the crazy man likewise reappears upon the scene of my departure from the khan and in company with a small but eminently respectable following accompanies me to the brow of a bluffy hill leading out of the depression in which bay bazaar snugly nestles on the way up he constantly gives utterance to his feelings in guttural gruntings that make last night's lamentations seem quite earthly after all in comparison and when the summit is reached and i mount and glide noiselessly away down a gentle declivity he uses his vocal organs in a manner that simply defies chirographical description or any known comparison 
It is the despairing howl of a semi-lunatic at witnessing my departure without having exercised my supposed extraordinary powers in some miraculous manner in his behalf. The road continues as an artificial highway, but is not continuously rideable, owing to the rocky nature of the material used in its construction and the absence of vehicular traffic to wear it smooth, but it is highly acceptable in the main. From Bay Bazaar, eastward, it leads for several miles along a stony valley, and then through a region that differs little from yesterday's barren hills in general appearance but which has the redeeming feature of being traversed here and there by deep canons or gorges, along which meander tiny streams, and whose wider spaces are areas of remarkably fertile soil. While wheeling merrily along the valley road, I am favored with a peace offering of a splendid bunch of grapes from a bold vintager en route to Bay Bazaar with a grape-laden donkey. When within a few hundred yards, the man evinces unmistakable signs of uneasiness concerning my character, and would probably follow the bent of his inclinations and ingloriously flee the field, but his donkey is too heavily laden to accompany him. He looks apprehensively at my rapidly approaching figure, and then, as if a happy thought suddenly occurs to him, he quickly takes the finest bunch of grapes ready to hand and holds them out towards me while I am yet a good fifty yards away. The grapes are luscious, and the bunch weighs fully an oak, but I should feel uncomfortably like a highwayman, guilty of intimidating the man out of his property, were I to accept them in the spirit in which they are offered. As it is, the honest fellow will hardly fall to trembling in his tracks should he at any future time again descry the centaur-like form of a mounted wheelman approaching him in the distance. Later in the forenoon, I descend into a canyon-like valley where, among a few scattering vineyards and jujube trees, nestles Ayash, a place which disputes with the neighboring village of Istanos the honor of being the theater of Alexander the Great's celebrated exploit of cutting the Gordian knot that disentangled the harness of the Phrygian king. Ayash is to be congratulated upon having its historical reminiscence to recommend it to the notice of the outer world, since it has little to attract attention nowadays. It is merely the shapeless jumble of inferior dwellings that characterize the average Turkish village. As I trundle through the crooked, ill-paved alleyway that, out of respect to the historical association referred to, may be called its business thoroughfare, with forethought of the near approach of noon, I obtain some pears and hand an ekmek a coin, for some bread. He passes over a tough flat cake, abundantly sufficient for my purpose, together with the change. A Zaptia, looking on, observes that the man has retained a whole half-penny for the bread, and orders him to fork over another cake. I refuse to take it up, whereupon the Zaptia fulfills his ideas of justice by ordering the Ekmek J to give it to a ragged youth among the spectators. Continuing on my way, I am next halted by a young man of the better class, who, together with the Zaptia, endeavors to prevail upon me to stop, going through the pantomime of writing and reading, to express some idea that our mutual ignorance of each other's language prevents being expressed in words. The result is a rather curious intermezzo. Thinking they want to examine my Tescari merely to gratify their idle curiosity, I refuse to be thus bothered, and, dismissing them quite brusquely, hurry along over the rough cobblestones in hopes of reaching rideable ground and escaping from the place ere the inevitable madding crowd becomes generally aware of my arrival. The young man disappears, while the Zaptia trots smilingly but determinedly by my side several times endeavoring to coax me into making a halt, which is, however, promptly interpreted by myself into a paternal plea on behalf of the villagers, a desire to have me stop until they could be generally notified and collected, the very thing I am hurrying along to avoid. I am already clear of the village, and trundling up the inevitable acclivity, the Zaptia and a small gathering, still doggedly hanging on, when the young man reappears, hurriedly approaching from the rear, followed by half the village. The Zaptia pats me on the shoulder, and points back with a triumphant smile. 
Thinking he is referring to the rabble, I am rather inclined to be angry with him and chide him for dogging my footsteps, when I observe the young man waving aloft a letter, and at once understand that I have been guilty of an ungenerous misinterpretation of their determined attentions. The letter is from Mr. Binns, an English gentleman at Angora, engaged in the exportation of mohair, and contains an invitation to become his guest while at Angora a well-deserved backsheesh to the good-natured zaptia and a penitential shake of the young man's hand silenced the self-accusations of the guilty conscience and after riding a short distance down the hill for the satisfaction of the people i continue on my way trundling up the varying gradations of a general acclivity for two miles away up the road ahead i now observe a number of queer shapeless objects moving about on the roadway apparently descending the hill, and resembling nothing so much as animated clumps of brushwood. Upon a closer approach, they turn out to be not so very far removed from this conception. They are a company of poor Ayash peasant women, each carrying a bundle of camel-thorn shrubs several times larger than herself, which they have been scouring the neighboring hills all morning to obtain for fuel. This camel-thorn is a light, spriggy shrub, so that the size of their burthens is large in proportion to its weight. Instead of being borne on the head, they are carried in a way that forms a complete bushy background, against which the shrouded form of the woman is undistinguishable a few hundred yards away. Instead of keeping a straightforward course, the women seem to be doing an unnecessary amount of erratic wandering about over the road, which, until quite near, gives them the queer appearance of animated clumps of brush dodging about among each other. I ask them whether there is water ahead. They look frightened and hurry along faster, but one brave soul turns partly round and points mutely in the direction I am going. Two miles of good, rideable road now brings me to the spring, which is situated near a two-acre swamp of rank sword-grass and bulrushes six feet high and of almost impenetrable thickness, which looks decidedly refreshing in its setting of barren, gray hills. And I eat my noontide meal of bread and pears to the cheery music of a thousand swamp frog bands which commence croaking at my approach and never cease for a moment to twang their tuneful lyre until I depart. The torturous windings of the Chemin de Fer finally bring me to a cul-de-sac in the hills, terminating on the summit of a ridge overlooking a broad plain, and a horseman I meet informs me that I am now midway between Bay Bazaar and Angora. While ascending this ridge, I become thoroughly convinced of what has frequently occurred to me between here and Nalakan that if the road i am traversing is as the people keep calling it a chemin de fer then the engineer who graded it must have been a youth of tender age and inexperienced in railway matters to imagine that trains can ever round his curve or climb his grades there is something about this broad artificial highway and the tremendous amount of labor that has been expended upon it when compared with the glaring poverty of the country it traverses together with the well-nigh total absence of wheeled vehicles that seem to preclude the possibility of its having been made for a wagon road. And yet, notwithstanding the belief of the natives, it is evident that it can never be the roadbed of a railway. We must inquire about it at Angora. End of section 28 Recording by William Tomko Section 29 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1, by Thomas Stevens. 13. Part 2. Bay Bazaar, Angora, and Eastward. Descending into the Angora Plain, I enjoy the luxury of a continuous coast for nearly a mile, over a road that is simply perfect for the occasion, after which comes the less desirable performance of plowing through a stretch of loose sand and gravel. While engaged in this latter occupation, I overtake a Zaptia, 
also en route to Angora, who is letting his horse crawl leisurely along while he concentrates his energies upon a watermelon, evidently the spoils of a recent visitation to a melon garden somewhere not far off. He hands me a portion of the booty, and then requests me to bin, and keeps on requesting me to bin at regular three-minute intervals for the next half hour. At the end of that time, the loose gravel terminates, and I find myself on a level and reasonably smooth dirt road, making a shorter cut across the plain to Angora than the Chemin de Fer. The Zaptia is, of course, delighted at seeing me thus mount, and, not doubting but that I will appreciate his company, gives me to understand that he will ride alongside to Angora. For nearly two miles, that sanguine but unsuspecting minion of the Turkish government spurs his noble steed alongside the bicycle in spite of my determined pedaling to shake him off. But the road improves. Faster spins the whirling wheels. The Zaptia begins to lag behind a little, though still spurring his panting horse into keeping reasonably close behind. A bend now occurs in the road, and an intervening knoll hides us from each other. I put on more steam, and at the same time the Zaptia evidently gives it up and relapses into his normal crawling pace, for when three miles or thereabout are covered, I look back and perceive him leisurely heaving in sight from behind the knoll. Part way across the plain I arrive at a fountain and make a short halt, for the day is unpleasantly warm, and the dirt road is covered with dust. The government Postaya Araba is also halting here to rest and refresh the horses. I have not failed to notice the proneness of Asiatics to base their conclusions entirely on a person's apparel and general outward appearance, for the seeming incongruity of my Ingilis helmet and the Circassian moccasins has puzzled them not a little on more than one occasion. And now, one wiseacre among this party at the roadside fountain stubbornly asserts that I cannot possibly be an Englishman because of my wearing a mustache without side whiskers, a feature that seems to have impressed upon his enlightened mind the unalterable conviction that I am an Austrian. Why an Austrian any more than a Frenchman or an inhabitant of the moon, I wonder? And wondering, wonder in vain. 5 p.m., August 16, 1885, finds me seated on a rude stone slab, one of those ancient tombstones whose serried ranks constitute the suburban scenery of Angora, ruefully disburdening my nether garments of mud and water, the results of a slight miscalculation of my abilities at leaping irrigating ditches with a bicycle for a vaulting pole. While engaged in this absorbing occupation, several inquisitives mysteriously collect from somewhere, as they invariably do whenever I happen to halt for a minute, and following the instructions of the Ayash letter, I inquired the way to the Inglison Adam, Englishman's man. They pilot me through a number of narrow, ill-paved streets leading up the sloping hill which Angora occupies a situation that gives the supposed ancient capital of Galicia a striking appearance from a distance, and into the premises of an Armenian whom I find able to make himself intelligible in English, if allowed several minutes undisturbed possession of his own faculties of recollection between each word. The gentleman is slow, but not quite sure. From him I learn that Mr. Binns and family reside during the summer months at a vineyard five miles out, and that Mr. Binns will not be in town before tomorrow morning. Also that you are welcome to the humble hospitality of our poor family. This latter way of expressing it is a revelation to me, and the leaden heeled and labored utterance, together with the general bearing of my volunteer host, is not less striking if meekness, lowliness, and humbleness, permeating a person's every look, word, and action, constitute worthiness, then is our Armenian friend beyond a doubt the worthiest of men. Laboring under the impression that he is Mr. Binns, English and Adam, I have no hesitation about accepting his proffered hospitality for the night, and, storing the bicycle away, I proceed to make myself quite at home, in that easy manner peculiar to one accustomed to constant change. 
later in the evening, imagine my astonishment at learning that I have thus nonchalantly quartered myself, so to speak, not on Mr. Bin's man, but on an Armenian pastor who has acquired his slight acquaintance with my own language from being connected with the American mission, having headquarters at Kazaria. All the evening long, noisy crowds have been besieging the pastorate worrying the poor man nearly out of his senses on my account. And what makes matters more annoying and lamentable, I learn afterward that his wife has departed this life but a short time ago, and the bereaved pastor is still bowed down with sorrow at the affliction. I feel like kicking myself unceremoniously out of his house. Following the Asiatic custom of welcoming a stranger, and influenced, we may reasonably suppose, as much by their eagerness to satisfy their consuming curiosity as anything else, the people come flocking in swarms to the pastorate again next morning, filling the house and grounds to overflowing, and endeavoring to find out all about me and my unheard-of mode of traveling, by questioning the poor pastor nearly to distraction. That excellent man's thoughts seem to run entirely on missionaries and mission enterprises, so much so, in fact, that several negative assertions from me fail to entirely disabuse his mind of an idea that I am in some way connected with the work of spreading the gospel in Asia Minor, and coming into the room where I am engaged in the interesting occupation of returning the salams and inquisitive gaze of fifty ceremonious visitors in slow, measured words, he asks, have you any words for these people as if quite expecting to see me rise up and solemnly call upon the assembled mussulmans greeks and armenians to forsake the religion of the false prophet in the one case and mend the error of their ways in the other i know well enough what they all want though and dismiss them in a highly satisfactory manner by promising them that they shall all have an opportunity of seeing the bicycle ridden before i leave angora about ten o'clock Mr. Binns arrives, and is highly amused at the ludicrous mistake that brought me to the Armenian pastors instead of to his man, with whom he had left instructions concerning me, should I arrive after his departure in the evening for the vineyard. In return, he has an amusing story to tell of the people waylaying him on his way to his office, telling him that an Englishman had arrived with a wonderful araba, which he had immediately locked up in a dark room, and would allow nobody to look at it, and begging him to ask me if they might come and see it. We spend the remainder of the forenoon looking over the town and the bazaar, Mr. Binns kindly announcing himself as at my service for the day, and seemingly bent on pointing out everything of interest. One of the most curious sights, and one that is peculiar to Angora, owing to its situation on a hill where little or no water is obtainable, is the bewildering swarms of Sukhathers, water donkeys, engaged in the transportation of that important necessary up into the city from a stream that flows near the base of the hill. These unhappy animals do nothing from one end of their working lives to the other, but toil with almost machine-like regularity and uneventfulness up the crooked, stony streets with a dozen large earthenware jars of water, and down again with the empty jars. The donkey is sandwiched between two long wooden troughs suspended to a rude pack saddle, and each trough accommodates six jars, each holding about two gallons of water. One can readily imagine the swarms of these novel and primitive conveyances required to supply a population of 35,000 people. Upon inquiring what they do in case of a fire, I learn that they don't even think of fighting the devouring element with its natural enemy, but, collecting on the adjoining roofs, they smother the flames by pelting the burning building with the soft, crumbly bricks of which Angora is chiefly built a house on fire, with a swarm of half-naked natives on the neighboring housetops, bombarding the leaping flames with bricks, would certainly be an interesting sight. Other pity exciting scenes besides the patient little water-carrying donkeys are not likely to be wanting on the streets of an Asiatic city. One case I notice merits particular mention. A youth, with both arms amputated at the shoulder, having not so much as the stump of an arm, is riding a donkey and persuading the unwilling animal along quite briskly, with a stick. All Christendom could never guess how a person thus afflicted could possibly wield a stick so as to make an impression upon a donkey, 
But this ingenious person holds it quite handily between his chin and right shoulder, and from constant practice has acquired the ability to visit his long-eared steed with quite vigorous thwacks. Near noon, we repair to the government house to pay a visit to Sira Pasha, the valet or governor of the Vilayet, who, having heard of my arrival, has expressed a wish to have us call on him. We happen to arrive while he is busily engaged with an important legal decision, but upon our being announced, he begs us to wait a few minutes, promising to hurry through with the business. We are then requested to enter an adjoining apartment, where we find the mayor, the Cadi, the Secretary of State, the Chief of the Angora Zaptias, and several other functionaries, signing documents, affixing seals, and otherwise variously occupied. At our entrance, documents, pens, seals, and everything are relegated to temporary oblivion. Coffee and cigarettes are produced, and the journey Dunyanin Athrafana, around the world, I am making with the wonderful Araba, becomes the all-absorbing subject. These wise men of state entertain queer, Asiatic notions concerning the probable object of my journey. They cannot bring themselves to believe it possible that I am performing so great a journey merely as the outing correspondent. They think it more probable, they say, that my real incentive is to spite an enemy, that, having quarreled with another wheelman about our comparative skill as riders, I am wheeling entirely around the globe in order to prove my superiority and, at the same time, leave no opportunity for my hated rival to perform a greater feat. Asiatic reasoning, sure enough. Reasoning thus, and commenting in this wise among themselves, their curiosity becomes worked up to the highest possible pitch, and they commence plying Mr. Binns with questions concerning the mechanism and general appearance of the bicycle. To facilitate Mr. Binns in his task of elucidation, I produced from my inner coat pocket a set of the earlier sketches illustrating the tour across America, and for the next few minutes the set of sketches are of more importance than all the state documents in the room. Curiously enough, the sketch entitled A Fair Young Mormon attracts more attention than any of the others. The mayor is Suleiman Effendi, the same gentleman mentioned at some length by Colonel Burnaby in his On Horseback Through Asia Minor, and one of his first questions is whether I am acquainted with my friend Burnaby, whose tragic death in the Sudan will never cease to make me feel unhappy. Suleiman Effendi appears to be remarkably intelligent, compared with many Asiatics, and, moreover, of quite a practical turn of mind. He inquires what I should do in case of a serious breakdown somewhere in the far interior, and his curiosity to see the bicycle is not a little increased by hearing that, notwithstanding the extreme airiness of my strange vehicle, I have had no serious mishap on the whole journey across two continents. Alluding to the bicycle as the latest product of that western ingenuity that appears so marvelous to the Asiatic mind, he then remarks, with some animation, the next thing we shall see will be Englishmen crossing over to India in balloons and dropping down at Angora for refreshments. A uniformed servant now announces that the valet is at liberty and waiting to receive us in private audience. Following the attendant into another room, we find Sirah Pasha seated on a richly cushioned divan, and upon our entrance he rises smilingly to receive us, shaking us both cordially by the hand. As the distinguished visitor of the occasion, I am appointed to the place of honor next to the governor, while Mr. Binns, with whom, of course, as a resident of Angora, His Excellency is already quite well acquainted, graciously fills the office of interpreter and enlightener of the valley's understanding concerning bicycles in general, and my own wheel and wheel journey in particular. Sirah Pasha is a full-faced man of medium height, black-eyed, black-haired, and, like nearly all Turkish pashas, is rather inclined to corpulency. Like many prominent Turkish officials, he has discarded the Turkish costume, retaining only the national fez, a headdress which, by the by, is without one single merit to recommend it save its picturesqueness. In sunny weather it affords no protection to the eyes and in rainy weather its contour conducts the water in a trickling stream down one's spinal column. 
it is too thin to protect the scalp from the fierce sun rays and too close fitting and close in texture to afford any ventilation yet with all this formidable array of disadvantages it is universally worn I have learned during the morning that I have to thank Sirrah Pasha's energetic administration for the artificial highway from Keshtobek, and that he has constructed in the Vilayet no less than 250 miles of this highway, broad and reasonably well made, and actually macadamized in localities where the necessary material is to be obtained. The amount of work done in constructing this road through so mountainous a country is, as before mentioned, plainly out of all proportion to the wealth and population of a second-grade vilayet like Angora, and its accomplishment has been possible only by the employment of forced labor. Every man in the whole vilayet is ordered out to work at the road-making a certain number of days every year or provide a substitute. Thus, during the present summer, there have been as many as 20,000 men, besides donkeys, working on the roads at one time. Unaccustomed to public improvements of this nature, and, no doubt, failing to see their advantages in a country practically without vehicles, the people have sometimes ventured to grumble at the rather arbitrary proceeding of making them work for nothing, and board themselves and it has been found expedient to make them believe that they were doing the preliminary grading for a railway that was shortly coming to make them all prosperous and happy. Beyond being credulous enough to swallow the latter part of the bait, few of them have the least idea of what sort of a looking thing a railroad would be. When the valley hears that the people all along the road have been telling me it was a chemin d'affaire, he fairly shakes in his boots with laughter. Of course, I point out that no one can possibly appreciate the road improvements any more than a wheelman, and explain the great difference I have found between the mule paths of Kojali and the broad highways he has made through Angora, and I promise him the universal good opinion of the whole world of cyclers. In reply, His Excellency hopes this favorable opinion will not be jeopardized by the journey to Yozgat but expresses the fear that I shall find heavier wheeling in that direction, as the road is newly made, and there has been no vehicular traffic to pack it down. The governor invites me to remain over until Thursday, and witness the ceremony of laying the cornerstone of a new school, of the founding of which he has good reason to feel proud, and which ought to secure him the esteem of right-thinking people everywhere. He has determined it to be a common school in which no question of Mohammedan, Jew, or Christian will be allowed to enter, but where the young ideas of Turkish, Christian, and Jewish youths shall be taught to shoot peacefully and harmoniously together. Begging to be excused from this, he then invites me to take dinner with him tomorrow evening. By this I also decline, excusing myself for having determined to remain over no longer than a day on account of the approaching rainy season and my anxiety to reach Tehran before it sets in. Yet a third time the Pasha rallies to the charge, as though determined not to let me off without honoring me in some way, and this time he offers to furnish me a Zaptia escort but i tell him of the zaptia's inability to keep up yesterday at which he is immensely amused his excellency then promises to be present at the starting point to-morrow morning asking me to name the time and place after which we finish the cigarettes and coffee and take our leave we next take a survey of the mohair caravansary where buyers and sellers and exporters congregate to transact business and i watch with some interest the corps of half-naked sorters seated before large heaps of mohair assorting it into the several classes ready for exportation here mr bin's office is situated and we are waited upon by several of his business acquaintances among them a member of the celebrated celebrated in asia minor tiftik geoglu family whose ancestors have been prominently engaged in the mohair business for so long that their very name is significatory of their profession. Tif Tikji Oglu, literally mohair dealer's son, the smiths, bakers, and hunters of Occidental society are not a whit more significative than are many prominent names of the Orient. Prominent among the Angorians is a certain Mr. Altentopoglu, the literal interpretation of which is son of the golden ball, 
and the origin of whose family name Eastern tradition has surrounded by the following little interesting anecdote. Ages ago, it pleased one of the sultans to issue a proclamation throughout the empire, promising to present a golden ball to whichever among all his subjects should prove himself the biggest liar, giving it to be understood beforehand that no merely improbable story would stand the ghost of a chance of winning, since he himself was to be the judge, and nothing short of a story that was simply impossible would secure the prize. The proclamation naturally made quite a stir among the great prevaricators of the realm, and hundreds of stories came pouring in from competitors everywhere, some even surreptitiously borrowing whoppers from the Persians, who are well known as the greatest economizers of the truth in all Asia. But they were one and all adjusted by the astute monarch, who was himself a most experienced prevaricator, probably the noblest Roman of them all, as containing incidents that might under extraordinary circumstances have been true. The coveted golden ball still remained unawarded, when one day there appeared before the gate of the Sultan's palace, requesting an audience, an old man with travel-worn appearance, as though from a long pilgrimage, and bearing on his stooping shoulders an immense earthenware jar. The sultan received the aged pilgrim kindly, and asked him what he could do for him. "'O oh, sultan, may you live forever!' exclaimed the old man. "'For your imperial highness is loved and celebrated throughout all the empire for your many virtues, but most of all for your well-known love of justice.' "'Inshallah!' replied the monarch reverently. "'May it please your imperial majesty,' continued the old man, calling the monarch's attention to the jar." Your Highness's most excellent father, may his bones rest in peace, borrowed from my father this jar full of gold coins, the conditions being that Your Majesty was to pay the same amount back to me. Absurd! Impossible! exclaimed the astonished Sultan, eyeing the huge vessel in question. If the story be true, gravely continued the pilgrim, pay your father's debt. If it is, as you say, impossible, I have fairly won the golden ball and the sultan immediately awarded him the prize. In the cool of the evening, we ride out on horseback through vineyards and yellow berry gardens to Mr. Bin's country residence, a place that formerly belonged to an old pasha, a veritable bluebeard who built the house and placed the window of his harem, even closely latticed, as they always are, in a position that would not command so much as a glimpse of passers-by on the road hundreds of yards away. He planted trees and gardens, and erected marble fountains at great cost, surrounding the whole with a wall, and purchasing three beautiful young wives, the old Turk fondly fancied he had created for himself an earthly paradise. But as love laughs at locksmiths, so did these three frisky damia laugh at latticed windows, and lay their heads together against being prevented from watching passers-by through the windows of the harem. With nothing else to do, they would scheme and plot all day long against their misguided husband's tranquillity and peace of mind. One day, while sunning himself in the garden, he discovered that they had managed to detach a section of the lattice-work from a window, and were in the habit of sticking out their heads. Awful discovery! Flying into a righteous rage at this act of flagrant disobedience, he seized a thick stick and sought their apartments only to find the lattice-work skillfully replaced, and to be confronted with a general denial of what he had witnessed with his own eyes. This did not prevent them from all three getting a severe chastisement, but as time wore on he found the life these three caged-up young women managed to lead him anything but the earthly paradise he thought he was creating, and, financial troubles overtaking him at the same time, the old fellow fairly died of a broken heart in less than twelve months after he had so hopefully installed himself in his self-created heaven. There is a moral in the story somewhere, I think, for anybody caring to analyze it. Mr. Binns says the old Mussulman was also an inveterate hater of unbelievers, and that the old fellow's bones would fairly rattle in his coffin were he conscious that a family of Christians are now actually occupying the house he built with such careful regard for the Mussulman's ideas of a material heaven, with trees and fountains and black-eyed houris. End of section 29 Recording by William Tomko
Section 30 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1, by Thomas Stevens. 13, Part 3, Bay Bazaar, Angora, and Eastward. Near ten o'clock on Tuesday morning finds Angora the scene of more excitement than it has seen for some time. I am trundling through the narrow streets toward the appointed starting place, which is at the commencement of a half-mile stretch of excellent level macadam, just beyond the tombstone-planted suburbs of the city. Mr. Binns is with me, and a squad of Zaptias are engaged in the lively occupation of protecting us from the crush of people following us out. They are armed, especially for the occasion, with long switches, with which they unsparingly lay about them seemingly only too delighted at the chance of making the dust fly from the shoulders of such unfortunate whites as the pressure of the throng forces anywhere near the magic cause of the commotion. The time and place of starting have been proclaimed by the valley, and have become generally noised abroad, and near three thousand people are already assembled when we arrive. Among them is seen the genial face of Suleiman Effendi, who, in his capacity of mayor, is early on the ground with a force of Zaptias to maintain order, and, with a little knot of friends, behold, is also our humble friend, the Armenian pastor, the irresistible attractions of the wicked bicycle having temporarily overcome his contempt of the pomps and vanities of secular displays. "'Englishmen are always punctual,' says Suleiman Effendi, looking at his watch, and upon consulting our own, sure enough, we have happened to arrive precisely to the minute. An individual named Mustafa, a blacksmith, who has acquired an enviable reputation for skill on account of the beautiful horseshoes he turns out, now presents himself and begs leave to examine the mechanism of the bicycle. And the question arises among the officers standing by as to whether Mustafa would be able to make one. Mustafa himself thinks he could, providing he had mine always at hand to copy from. Yes, suggests the practical-minded Suleiman Effendi. Yes, Mustafa, you may have marifet enough to make one, but when you have finished it, who among all of us will have marifet enough to ride it? True, Effendi, solemnly assents another. We would have to send for an Englishman to ride it for us, after Mustafa had turned it out. The mayor now requests me to ride along the road once or twice to appease the clamor of the multitude until the valley arrives. The crowd along the road is tremendous, and on a neighboring knoll, commanding a view of the proceedings, are several carriage loads of ladies, the wives and female relatives of the officials. The mayor is indulgent to his people, allowing them to throng the roadway, simply ordering the Zaptias to keep my road through the surging mass open. While on the home stretch from the second spin, up dashes the valley in the state equipage with quite an imposing bodyguard of mounted Zaptias, their chief being a fine military-looking Circassian in the picturesque military costume of the Caucasus. These horsemen the governor at once orders to clear the people entirely off the roadway, an order no sooner given than executed and after the customary interchange of salutations i mount and wheel briskly up the broad smooth macadam between two compact masses of delighted natives excitement runs high and the people clap their hands and howl approvingly at the performance while the horsemen gallop briskly to and fro to keep them from intruding on the road after i have wheeled past and obstructing the governor's view after riding back and forth a couple of times, I dismount at the valley's carriage, a mutual interchange of adieus and well wishes all around, and I take my departure, wheeling along at a ten-mile pace amid the vociferous plaudits of at least four thousand people, who watch my retreating figure until I disappear over the brow of a hill. At the upper end of the main crowd are stationed the irregular cavalry on horses, mules, and donkeys and among the latter i notice our ingenious friend 
the armless youth of yesterday, whom I now make happy by a nod of recognition, having scraped up a backsheesh acquaintance with him yesterday. For some miles the way continues fairly smooth and hard, leading through a region of low vineyard-covered hills, but ere long I arrive at the newly made road mentioned by the valley, after which, like the course of true love, my forward career seldom runs smooth for any length of time, though rideable donkey trails occasionally run parallel with the bogus chemin de fer. For mile after mile I now alternately ride and trundle along donkey paths, by the side of an artificial highway that would be an enterprise worthy of a European state. The surface of the road is either graveled or of broken rock, and well rounded for self-drain age, it is graded over the mountains and wooden bridges with substantial rock supports, are built across the streams. Nothing is lacking except the vehicles to utilize it. In the absence of these, it would almost seem to have been an unnecessary and superfluous expenditure of the people's labor to make such a road through a country, most of which is fit for little else but grazing goats and buffaloes. Aside from half-dozen carriages at Angora, and a few light government postaya arabas, an innovation from horses for carrying the mail, recently introduced as a result of the improved roads, and which make weekly trips between such points as Angora, Yuzgat, and Tokat, the only vehicles in the country are the buffalo carts of the larger farmers, rude homemade arabas with solid wooden wheels, whose infernal creaking can be heard for a mile, and which they seldom take any distance from home, preferring their pack donkeys and cross-country trails when going to town with produce. Perhaps in time vehicular traffic may appear as a result of suitable roads, but the natives are slow to adopt new improvements. About two hours from Angora I pass through a swampy upland basin, containing several small lakes, and then emerge into a much less mountainous country, passing several mud villages, the inhabitants of which are dark-skinned people, Turkoman refugees, I think, who look several degrees less particular about their personal cleanliness than the villagers west of Angora. Their wretched mud hovels would seem to indicate the last degree of poverty, but numerous flocks of goats and herds of buffalo grazing near apparently tell a somewhat different story. The women and children seem most engaged in manufacturing cakes of tezek, large flat cakes of buffalo manure mixed with chopped straw which are daubed on the outer walls to dry. It makes very good fuel, like the buffalo chips of the far west, and stacking it up on the housetops with provident forethought for the approaching winter. Just as darkness is beginning to settle down over the landscape, I arrive at one of these unpromising-looking clusters which, it seems, are now peculiar to the country, and not characteristic of any particular race, for the one I arrive at is a purely Turkish village. After the usual preliminaries of pantomime and binning, I am conducted to a capacious flat roof, the common covering of several dwellings and stables bunched up together. This roof is as smooth and hard as a native threshing floor, and well knowing, from recent experiences, the modus operandi of capturing the hearts of these bland and childlike villagers, I mount and straightway secure their universal admiration and applause by riding a few times around the roof. I obtain a supper of fried eggs and yeort, milk soured with rennet, eating it on the housetop, surrounded by the whole population of the village on this and adjoining roofs, who watch my every movement with the most intense curiosity. It is the raggedest audience I have yet been favored with. There are not over half a dozen decently clad people among them all, and two of these are horsemen, simply remaining overnight, like myself. Everybody has a fearfully flea-bitten appearance, which augurs ill for a refreshing night's repose. Here, likewise, I am first introduced to a peculiar kind of bread that I straightway condemn as the most execrable of the many varieties my ever-changing experiences bring me in contact with, and which I find myself mentally and half unconsciously naming Blotting Paper Ekmek, a not inappropriate title to convey its appearance to the civilized mind. But the sheets of blotting paper must be of a wheaten color and in circular sheets about two feet in diameter, 
This peculiar kind of bread is, we may suppose, the natural result of a great scarcity of fuel, a handful of tezek, beneath the large, thin sheet iron griddle, being sufficient to bake many cakes of this bread. At first I start eating it, something like a shanty town goat would set about consuming a political poster. If it, not the political poster, but the shanty town goat, had a pair of hands, this outlandish performance creates no small merriment among the watchful onlookers who forthwith initiate me into the mode of eating it a la turk which is to roll it up like a scroll of paper and bite mouthfuls off the end i afterwards find this particular variety of ekmek quite handy when seated around a communal bowl of yeort with a dozen natives instead of taking my turn with the one wooden spoon in common use i would form pieces of the thin bread into small handleless scoops and dipping up the yeort eat scoop and all besides sparing me from using the same greasy spoon in common with a dozen natives none of them overly squeamish as regards personal cleanliness this gave me the appreciable advantage of dipping into the dish as often as i choose instead of waiting for my regular turn at the wooden spoon Though they are Osmanli Turks, the women of these small villages appear to make little pretense of covering their faces. Among themselves they constitute, as it were, one large family gathering, and a stranger is but seldom seen. They are apparently simple-minded females, just a trifle shamefaced in their demeanor before a stranger, sitting apart by themselves while listening to the conversation between myself and the men. This, of course, is very edifying even apart from its pantomimic and monosyllabic character for i am now among a queer people a people through the unoccupied chambers of whose unsophisticated minds wander strange fantastic thoughts one of the transient horsemen a contemplative young man the promising appearance of whose upper lip proclaims him something over twenty announces that he likewise is on the way to yuzgat and after listening attentively to my explanations of how a wheelman climbs mountains and overcomes stretches of bad road he solemnly inquires whether a cycler could scurry up a mountain slope all right if someone were to follow behind and touch him up occasionally with a whip in the persuasive manner required in driving a horse he then produces a rawhide persuader and ventures the opinion that if he followed close behind me to yuzgat and touched me up smartly with it whenever we came to a mountain or a sandy road there would be no necessity of trundling any of the way he then asks with the innocent simplicity of a child whether in case he made the experiment i would get angry and shoot him the other transient appears of a more speculative turn of mind and draws largely upon his own pantomimic powers and my limited knowledge of turkish to ascertain the difference between the hatch lira of a bicycle at retail and the hatch lira of its manufacture from the amount of mental labor he voluntarily inflicts upon himself to acquire this particular item of information i apprehend that nothing less than a wild visions of acquiring a rapid fortune by starting a bicycle factory at angora are flitting through his imaginative mind the villagers themselves seem to consider me chiefly from the standpoint of their own peculiar ideas concerning the nature of an englishman's feelings toward a russian my performance on the roof has put them in the best of humor and has evidently whetted their appetites for further amusement pointing to a stolid-looking individual of an apparently taciturn disposition and who is one of the respectably dressed few they accuse him of being a usiao and then all eyes are turned towards me as though they quite expect to see me rise up wrathfully and make some warlike demonstration against him my undemonstrative disposition forbids so theatrical a proceeding however and i confine myself to making a pretence of falling into the trap casting furtive glances of suspicion towards the supposed hated subject of the czar and making whispered inquiries of my immediate neighbors concerning the nature of his mission in turkish territory during this interesting comedy the audience are fairly shaking in their rags with suppressed merriment 
and when the taciturn individual himself, who has thus far retained his habitual self-composure, growing restive under the hateful imputation of being a Moscow, and my supposed bellicose sentiments toward him in consequence, finally repudiates the part thus summarily assigned him, the whole company bursts out into a boisterous roar of laughter. At this happy turn of sentiment, I assume an air of intense relief, shake the taciturn man's hand, and, borrowing the speculative transient's fez, proclaim myself a Turk, an act that fairly brings down the house. Thus the evening passes merrily away until about ten o'clock, when the people begin to slowly disperse to the roofs of their respective habitations, the whole population sleeping on the housetops, with no roof over them save the star-spangled vault the arched dome of the great mosque of the universe, so often adorned with the pale yellow, crescent-shaped emblem of their religion. Several families occupy the roof which has been the theater of the evening social gathering, and the men now consign me to a comfortable couch made up of several quilts, one of the transients thoughtfully cautioning me to put my moccasins under my pillow, as these articles were the object of almost universal covetousness during the evening. No sooner am I comfortably settled down than a wordy warfare breaks out in my immediate vicinity, and an ancient female makes a determined dash at my coverlet with the object of taking forcible possession, but she is seized and unceremoniously hustled away by the men who assigned me my quarters. It appears that, with an eye singly and disinterestedly to my own comfort, and regardless of anybody else's, they have without taking the trouble to obtain her consent, appropriated to my use the old lady's bed, leaving her to shift for herself any way she can, a high-handed proceeding that naturally enough arouses her virtuous indignation to the pitch of resentment. Upon this fact occurring to me, I, of course, immediately vacate the property in dispute, and, with true western gallantry, arraign myself on the rightful owner's side by carrying my wheel and other effects to another position, whereupon a satisfactory compromise is soon arranged between the disputants, by which another bed is prepared for me, and the ancient dame takes triumphant possession of her own. Peace and tranquillity being thus established on a firm basis, the several families tenanting our roof settle themselves snugly down. The night is still and calm, and naught is heard save my nearer neighbors scratching, scratching, scratching. This, not the scratching, but the quietness, doesn't last long, however, for it's customary to collect all the four-footed possessions of the village together every night and permit them to occupy the interspaces between the houses, while the humans are occupying the roofs the horde of watchdogs being depended upon to keep watch and ward over everything. The hovels are more underground than above the surface, and often, when the village occupies sloping ground, the upper edge of the roof is practically but a continuation of the solid ground, or, at the most, there is but a single step up between them. The goats are, of course, permitted to wander whithersoever they will and equally, of course, they abuse their privilege by preferring the roofs to the ground and wandering incessantly about among the sleepers. Where the roof comes too near the ground, some temporary obstruction is erected to guard against the intrusion of venturesome buffaloes. No sooner have the humans quieted down than several goats promptly invade the roof and commence their usual nocturnal promenade among the prostrate forms of their owners and further indulge their well-known goatish propensities by nibbling away the edges of the roof. They would, of course, prefer a square meal off a patchwork quilt, but from their earliest infancy they are taught that meddling with the bedclothes will bring severe punishment. A buffalo occasionally gives utterance to a solemn prolonged moo. Now and then a baby wails its infantile disapproval of the fleas, and frequent noisy squabbles occur among the dogs. Under these conditions, it is not surprising that one should woo in vain the drowsy goddess, and near midnight some person within a few yards of my couch begins groaning fearfully, as if in great pain, probably a case of the stomach ache. I mentally conclude, 
though this hasty conclusion may not unnaturally result from an inner consciousness of being better equipped for curing that particular affliction than any other. From the position of the sufferer, I am inclined to think it is the same ancient party that ousted me out of her possessions two hours ago, and I lay here as far removed from the realms of unconsciousness as the moment I retired, expecting every minute to see her appear before me in a penitential mood, asking me to cure her for the inevitable Hakim question had been raised during the evening. She doesn't present herself, however. Perhaps the self-accusations of her conscience, for having in the moment of her wrath attempted to appropriate my coverlet in so rude a manner, prevent her appealing to me now in the hour of distress. These people are early risers. The women are up milking the goats and buffaloes before daybreak and the men hieing them away to the harvest fields and threshing floors. I, likewise, bestir myself at daylight, intending to reach the next village before breakfast. End of Section 30 Recording by William Tomko Section 31 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1, by Thomas Stevens. Chapter 14, Across the Kieselurmak River to Yuzgat, Part 2. The country continues much the same as yesterday with the road indifferent for wheeling. Reaching the expected village about eight o'clock, I breakfast off ekmek and new buffalo milk, and at once continue on my way, meeting nothing particularly interesting, save a lively bout occasionally with goat herds' dogs, the reminiscences of which are doubtless more vividly interesting to myself than they would be to the reader until high noon when I arrive at another village, larger but equally wretched-looking on the Kieselurmak River, called Jaschikan. On the west bank of the stream are some ancient ruins of quite massive architecture, and standing on the opposite side of the road, evidently having some time been removed from the ruins, with a view to being transported elsewhere, is a couchant lion of heroic proportions, carved out of a solid block of white marble. The head is gone, as though its would-be possessors, having found it beyond their power to transport the whole animal, have made off with what they could. An old and curiously arched bridge of massive rock spans the river near its entrance to a wild, rocky gorge in the mountains. A primitive grist mill occupies a position to the left, near the entrance to the gorge, and a herd of camels are slaking their thirst or grazing near the water's edge to the right. A genuine eastern picture, surely, and one not to be seen every day, even in the land where to see it occasionally, is quite possible. Riding into Jas Chikan, I dismount at a building which from the presence of several do-nothings I take to be a khan for the accommodation of travellers. In a partially open shed-like apartment are a number of demure-looking maidens, industriously employed in weaving carpets by hand on a rude upright frame, while two others, equally demure-looking, are seated on the ground cracking wheat for pilau wheat being substituted for rice where the latter is not easily obtainable, or is too expensive. Waiving all considerations of whether I am welcome or not, I at once enter this abode of female industry, and after watching the interesting process of carpet weaving for some minutes, turn my attention to the preparers of cracked wheat. The process is the same primitive one that has been employed among these people from time immemorial, 
and the same that is referred to in the passage of scripture which says two women were grinding corn in the field it consists of a small upper and nether millstone the upper one being turned round by two women sitting facing each other they both take hold of a perpendicular wooden handle with one hand employing the other to feed the mill and rake away the cracked grain these two young women have evidently been very industrious this morning they have half buried themselves in the product of their labours and are still grinding away as though for their very lives while the constant click-clack of the carpet weavers prove them likewise the embodiment of industry they seem rather disconcerted by the abrupt intrusion and scrutinizing attentions of a frank and a stranger however the fascinating search for bits of interesting experience forbids my retirement on that account but rather urges me to make the most of fleeting opportunities picking up a handful of the cracked wheat i inquire of one of the maidens if it is for pillau the maiden blushes at being thus directly addressed and with downcast eyes vouchsafes an affirmative nod in reply at the same time an observant eye happens to discover a little brown big toe peeping out of the heap of wheat and belonging to the same demure maiden with the downcast eyes i know full well that i am stretching a point of mohammedan etiquette even by coming amongst these industrious damsels in the manner i am doing but the attention of the men is fully concentrated on the bicycle outside and the temptation of trying the experiment of a little jocularity just to see what comes of it is under the circumstances irresistible conscious of venturing where angels fear to tread i stoop down and take hold of the peeping little brown big toe and addressing the demure maiden with the downcast eyes inquire is this also for pillau this proves entirely too much for the risibilities of the industrious pillau grinders and letting go the handle of the mill they both give themselves up to uncontrollable laughter the carpet weavers have been watching me out of the corners of their bright black eyes and catching the infection the click clack of the carpet weaving machines instantly ceases and several of the weavers hurriedly retreat into an adjoining room to avoid the awful and well-nigh unheard of indiscretion of laughing in the presence of a stranger having thus yielded to the temptation and witnessed the results i discreetly retire meeting at the entrance a grey-bearded turk coming to see what the merriment and unaccountable stopping of the carpet-weaving frames is all about a sheep has been slaughtered in just chican this morning and i obtain a nice piece of mutton which i hand to a bystander asking him to go somewhere and cook it in five minutes he returns with the meat burnt black outside and perfectly raw within seeing my evident disapproval of its condition the same ancient person who recently appeared on the scene of my jocular experiment and who has now squatted himself down close beside me probably to make sure against any further indiscretions takes the meat slashes it across in several directions with his dagger orders the aforementioned bystander to try it over again and then coolly wipes his blackened and greasy fingers on my sheet of ekmek as though it were a table napkin i obtain a few mouthfuls of eatable meat from the bystander's second culinary effort and then buy a watermelon from a man happening along with a laden donkey cutting into the melon i find it perfectly green all through and toss it away the men look surprised and some youngsters straightway pick it up eat the inside out until they can scoop out no more and then breaking the rind in pieces they scrape it out with their teeth until it is of egg 
shell thinness. They seem to do these things with impunity in Asia. The grade and the wind are united against me on leaving Jazchikan, but it is rideable, and having made such a dismal failure about getting dinner, I push on toward a green area at the base of a rocky mountain spur, which I observed an hour ago from a point some distance west of the Kieselermat and concluded to be a cluster of vineyards. This conjecture turns out quite correct, and what is more, my experience upon arriving there would seem to indicate that the good genii, detailed to arrange the daily program of my journey, had determined to recompense me today for having seen nothing of the feminine world of late but yashmaks and shrouds, and momentary monocular evidence, for here again am I thrown into the society of a bevy of maidens, more interesting, if anything, than the nymphs of industry at Jazchikan. There is apparently some festive occasion at the little vineyard environed village, which stands back a hundred yards or more from the road and which is approached by a narrow footway between thrifty-looking vineyards. Three blooming damsels, in all the bravery of holiday attire, with necklaces and pendants of jingling coins to distinguish them from the matrons, come hurrying down the pathway toward the road at my approach. Seeing me dismount upon arriving opposite the village, the handsomest and gayest dressed of the three goes into one of the vineyards and with charming grace of manner presents herself before me with both hands overflowing with bunches of luscious black grapes. Their abundant black tresses are gathered in one long plait behind. They wear bracelets, necklaces, pendants, brow bands, head ornaments and all sorts of wonderful articles of jewellery made out of the common silver and metallic coins of the country. They are small of stature and possess oval faces, large black eyes and warm dark complexions. Their manner and dress prove rather a puzzle in determining their nationality. They are not Turkish nor Greek nor Armenian nor Circassian. They may possibly be sedentary Turkomans, but they possess rather a Jewish cast of countenance, and my first impression of them is that they are Bible people, the original inhabitants of the country, who have somehow managed to cling to their little possessions here in spite of Greeks, Turks and Persians, and other conquering races who have at times overrun the country. Perhaps they have softened the hearts of everybody undertaking to oust them by their graceful manners. Other villagers soon collect, making a picturesque and interesting group around the bicycle. But the maiden with the grapes makes too pretty and complete a picture for any of the others to attract more than passing notice. One of her two companions whisperingly calls her attention to the plainly evident fact that she is being regarded with admiration by the stranger. She blushes perceptibly through her nut-brown cheeks at hearing this, but she is also quite conscious of her claims to admiration and likes to be admired, so she neither changes her attitude of respectful grace nor raises her long, drooping eyelashes, while I eat and eat grapes, taking them bunch after bunch from her overflowing hands, until ashamed to eat any more. I confess to almost falling in love with that maiden. Her manners were so easy and graceful, and when, with ever downcast eyes and a bewitching manner that leaves not the slightest room for considering the doing so a bold or forward action, she puts the remainder of the grapes in my coat pockets, a peculiarly fluttering sensation. But I draw a veil over my feelings, 
they are too sacred for the garish pages of a book. I do not inquire about their nationality. I would rather it remain a mystery, and a matter for future conjecture. But before leaving, I add something to her already conspicuous array of coins that have been increasing since her birth, and which will form her modest dowry at marriage. The road continues of excellent surface, but rather hilly for a few miles, when it descends into the valley of the Delije Irmak, where the artificial highway again deteriorates into the unpacked condition of yesterday. The donkey trails are shallow trenches of dust, and are no longer to be depended upon as keeping my general course, but are rather cross-country trails leading from one mountain village to another. The well-defined caravan trail leading from Izmit to Angora comes no further eastward than the latter city, which is the central point where the one exportable commodity of the Vilayet is collected for barter and transportation to the seaboard. The Delije Irmak valley is under partial cultivation, and occasionally one passes through small areas of melon gardens far away from any permanent habitations temporary huts or dugouts are however an invariable adjunct to these isolated possessions of the villagers in which some one resides day and night during the melon season guarding their property with gun and dog from unscrupulous wayfarers who otherwise would not hesitate to make their visit to town profitable as well as pleasurable by surreptitiously confiscating a donkey load of saleable melons from their neighbor's roadside garden. Sometimes I essay to purchase a musk melon from these lone sentinels, but it is impossible to obtain one fit to eat. These wretched prayers on nature's bounty evidently pluck and devour them from the bitterness of their earliest growth. No villages are passed on the road after leaving the vintagers' cluster at noon, but bunches of mud hovels are at intervals descried a few miles to the right, perched among the hills that form the southern boundary of the valley, being of the same colour as the general surface about them, they are not easily distinguishable at a distance. There seems to be a decided propensity among the natives for choosing the hills as an habitation, even when their arable lands are miles away in the valley. The salubrity of the more elevated location may be the chief consideration, but a swiftly flowing mountain rivulet near his habitation is to the Mohammedan a source of perpetual satisfaction. I travel along for some time after nightfall in hopes of reaching a village, but none appearing I finally decide to camp out. Choosing a position behind a convenient knoll, I pitch the tent where it will be invisible from the road, using stones in lieu of tent pegs, and inhabiting for the first time this unique contrivance, I sup off the grapes remaining over from the bountiful feast at noon and being without any covering, stretch myself without undressing beside the upturned bicycle. Notwithstanding the gentle reminders of unsatisfied hunger, I am enjoying the legitimate reward of constant exercise in the open air ten minutes after pitching the tent. Soon after midnight I am awakened by the chilly influence of the wee sma hours, and recognizing the likelihood of the tent proving more beneficial as a coverlet than a roof in the absence of rain, I take it down and roll myself up in it. The thin oiled cambric is far from being a blanket, however, and at daybreak the bicycle and everything is drenched with one of the heavy dews of the country. Ten miles over an indifferent road is traversed next morning, the comfortless reflection that anything like a square meal seems out of the question anywhere between the larger towns scarcely tends to exert a soothing influence on the ravenous attacks of a most awful appetite, 
and I am beginning to think seriously of making a detour of several miles to reach a mountain village when I meet a party of three horsemen, a Turkish bay, with an escort of two Zaptes. I am trundling at the time, and without a moment's hesitancy, I make a dead set at the bay, with the single object of satisfying to some extent my gastronomic requirements. Bay Effendi, have you any ekmek? I ask, pointing inquiringly to his saddlebags on a Zapte's horse, and at the same time giving him to understand by impressive pantomime the uncontrollable condition of my appetite. With what seems to me under the circumstances, simply cold-blooded indifference to human suffering, the bay ignores my inquiry altogether, and concentrating his whole attention on the bicycle, asks, What is that? An Americanish Araba, Effendi, have you any ekmek, toying suggestively with the tell-tale slack of my revolver belt? Where have you come from? Stamboul, have you ekmek in the saddlebags, Effendi? This time boldly beckoning the zaple with the bay's effects to approach nearer. Where are you going? Yuzgat, ekmek, ekmek, tapping the saddlebags in quite an imperative manner. This does not make any outward impression upon the bay's aggravating imperturbability. However, he is not so indifferent to my side of the question as he pretends. Aware of his inability to supply my want, and afraid that a negative answer would hasten my departure before he has fully satisfied his curiosity concerning me, he is playing a little game of diplomacy in his own interests. What is it for, he now asks, with soul-harrowing indifference to all my counter-inquiries? To bin, I reply, desperately curt and indifferent, beginning to see through his game. Bin, bin, bakalem, he says, supplementing the request with a coaxing smile. At the same time, my long-suffering digestive apparatus favours me with an unusually savage reminder, and nettled beyond the point where forbearance ceases to be any longer a virtue, I return an answer not exactly complimentary to the bay's ancestors, and continue my hungry way down the valley. A couple of miles after leaving the bay, I intercept a party of peasants traversing a cross-country trail, with a number of pack donkeys loaded with rock salt, from whom I am fortunately able to obtain several thin sheets of ekmek, which I sit down and devour immediately, without even water to moisten the repast. It seems one of the most tasteful and soul-satisfying breakfasts I ever ate. Like misfortunes, blessings never seem to come singly, for an hour after thus breaking my fast, I happen upon a party of villagers working on an unfinished portion of the new road. Some of them are eating their morning meal of ekmek and yaourt, and no sooner do I appear upon the scene than I am straightway invited to partake. A seat in the ragged circle congregated around the large bowl of clabbered milk, being especially prepared with a bunch of pulled grass for my benefit. The eager hospitality of these poor villagers is really touching. They are working without so much as a thank you for payment. There is not a garment amongst the gang fit for a human covering. Their unvarying daily fare is the blotting paper ekmek and yaourt, with a melon or a cucumber occasionally as a luxury. Yet the moment I approach, they assign me a place at their table, and two of them immediately bestir themselves to make me a comfortable seat. Neither is there so much as a mercenary thought among them, in connection with the invitation. These poor fellows whose scant rags it would be a farce to call clothing, actually betray embarrassment at the barest mention of compensation. They fill my pockets with bread, apologize for the absence of coffee, and compare the quality of their respective pouches of native tobacco in order to make me a decent cigarette. Never, 
surely was the reputation of Dame Fortune for fickleness so completely proved as in her treatment of me this morning. Ten o'clock finds me seated on a pile of rugs in a capacious black tent, wrestling with a huge bowl of savoury mutton pilau, flavoured with green herbs, as the guest of a cordish shake. Shortly afterwards I meet a man taking a donkey load of musk melons to the Cordish camp, who insists on presenting me with the finest melon I have tasted since leaving Constantinople, and high noon finds me the guest of another Cordish sheikh. Thus does a morning which commenced with a fair prospect of no breakfast, following after yesterday's scant supply of unsuitable food, end in more hospitality than I know what to do with. These nomad tribes of the famous black tents wander up toward Angora every summer with their flocks, in order to be near a market at shearing time. They are famed far and wide for their hospitality. Upon approaching the great open-faced tent of the sheikh, there is a hurrying movement among the attendants to prepare a suitable raised seat, for they know at a glance that I am an Englishman and likewise are aware that an Englishman cannot sit cross-legged like an Asiatic. At first, I am rather surprised at their evident ready recognition of my nationality, but I soon afterwards discover the reason. A huge bowl of pelau and another of excellent yaourt is placed before me without asking any questions while the dignified old sheikh fulfils one's idea of a grey-bearded nomad patriarch to perfection, as he sits cross-legged on a rug, solemnly smoking a nargile, and watching to see that no letter of his generous code of hospitality toward strangers is overlooked by the attendants. These latter seem to be the picked young men of the tribe, fine strapping fellows, well-dressed six-footers and of athletic proportions, perfect specimens of semi-civilized manhood that would seem better employed in a grenadier regiment than in hovering about the old sheikh's tent, attending to the filling and lighting of his nargile, the arranging of his cushions by day and his bed at night, the serving of his food and the proper reception of his guests and yet it is an interesting sight to see these splendid young fellows waiting upon their beloved old chieftain, fairly bounding like great affectionate mastiffs at his merest look or suggestion. Most of the boys and young men are out with the flocks, but the older men, the women and children, gather in a curious crowd before the open tent. They maintain a respectful silence so long as I am their sheikh's guest, but they gather about me without reserve when I leave the hospitable shelter of that respected person's quarters. After examining my helmet and sizing up my general appearance, they pronounce me an English zapte, a distinction for which I am indebted to the circumstance of Colonel N., an English officer having recently been engaged in Kurdistan organizing a force of native Zaptes. The women of this particular camp seem, on the whole, rather unprepossessing specimens. Some of them are hook-nosed old hags, with piercing black eyes, and hair dyed to a flaming carroty hue with henna. This latter is supposed to render them beautiful and enhance their personal appearance in the eyes of the men. They need something to enhance their personal appearance, certainly, but to the untutored and inartistic eye of the writer it produces a horrid, unnatural effect. According to our ideas, flaming red hair looks uncanny and of vulgar, uneducated taste when associated with coal-black eyes and a complexion like gathering darkness. These vain mortals seem inclined to think that in me they have discovered something to be petted and made much of, treating me pretty much as a troop of affectionate little girls 
would treat a wandering kitten that might unexpectedly appear in their midst. Giddy young things of about fifty summers cluster around me in a compact body, examining my clothes from helmet to moccasins, and critically feeling the texture of my coat and shirt. They take off my helmet, reach over each other's shoulders to stroke my hair, and pat my cheeks in the most affectionate manner, meanwhile expressing themselves in soft, purring comments that require no linguistic abilities to interpret into such endearing remarks as, Ain't he a darling, though? What nice soft hair and pretty blue eyes! Don't you wish the dear old shake would let us keep him? Considering the source whence it comes, it requires very little of this to satisfy one, and as soon as I can prevail upon them to let me escape, I mount and wheel away, several huge dogs escorting me for some minutes, in the peculiar manner Kurdish dogs have of escorting stray cyclers. End of section 31